Audio going live. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 36 hour straight hangout a thon. Um, this is a little bit weird because we're used to talking to other people in Windows, but we're here next to each other. Yay! <laughs> and, and so we're here instead talking to you out there and we're really hoping that you'll talk back. So among the different things that we have going on, um, you can ask us questions via the Q&A app. Uh, we are following Twitter with the hashtag Hangoutathon. Um, and heck, if you at tweet us, we'll notice. Um, and I'm going to be turning on a comment tracker, which sort of kind of maybe works when it feels like it. So if you want to leave us messages, really the best thing for you to do is to use the Q&A app. I can already see, uh, Hi, Nancy. yes, our dear friend Nancy Graziano is saying good morning, everyone, and good morning and thank you for joining us. So for those of you who don't know what you just turned, tuned into, uh, Nicole and I are two of the very huge group of people that makes CosmoQuest.org happen. CosmoQuest isn't a company, it's not a nonprofit, it's an idea that has been drawn together into a partnership of many different organizations. The lead organization is Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, which is where the two of us work. And I need to look at the camera, not at the center of this window. Um, and the, the money that we're working to raise um, during this 36-hour period and then during the 36 days to follow that we're kicking off in our 3636 fundraiser, um, is going to go to support the team at Southern Illinois University. We're the ones who, Joe is hanging just off campus. Joe, can you, camera, just off camera. It's 10 a.m. <laughs> You're saying hi. Yep, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe is our HTML5 ninja. He's the one that makes sure that uh, anything that's supposed to change, move, do something when you click on it actually does that. He's the reason that we have a citizen science interface. Um, it should be into the site. You want to check? I just did. I got a stock video that you made. Change the URL and index. So Joe is actually going to be programming on the live site live. Um, take. I'm going to get my laptop. Okay. Um, we're going to work to make sure that this Hangout is on the homepage of CosmoQuest for the entirety of the weekend. So if you go to CosmoQuest.org, you can do science, you can watch videos, preferably in two different windows, because we don't have it set so you can do both at once. The chaos that you're witnessing right now is um, we have behind us this monitor that is currently advertising things. Um, <laughs> This is, I stole the Apple TV from downstairs, carried it up to allow us to do things like, while they're working, I'm going to go ahead, connect to the Apple TV, and I can send over to it um, our website. So this is what Lindsay's trying to do with my computer over on this side, and it's not failing. <laughs> so... Um, the idea that it would be hard to send something to an Apple TV hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> so this is what you deal with occasionally when you deal with me, is, is technology it just seems laptop. easy. So, yeah, this laptop uh, 2009. Okay, so we may be marking craters on my laptop. Do you want mine? Oh, just plug into the lower one yeah, with the cable. I have a dumb, the dumb one where I have so we have two monitors set up behind us, and the reason that we're doing this um, is last year, this is our second year of, of doing a Hangout-a-thon, and I promise I'll go to normal programming in a moment. First, I'm just going to explain the chaos that is here. Um, last year, we were in the exact same physical space in my house. Um, but we got a lot of comments that the show looked rather like we were filming Wayne's World. Uh, we were filming on a blue futon that is up here in my attic. Um, we had stuffed animals and pillows all around us. We were happy, we were comfortable, we were slouchy. Uh, rather than cha channeling Wayne and Garth, we decided um, 
that we would pillage other furniture from the rest of my house. So the Chinese screens that you see behind us. This is cut yes. Um, the the Chinese screens that you see behind us. Um, those get used when I have guests spending the night and they get stuck over the dormer so that I can turn what is otherwise a completely open attic into smaller rooms for privacy because I like my friends. That happens here. Um, one of the ways that we work to try and save money as a collaboration is my husband and I have been lucky enough to be able to afford a house, mostly because my husband's a computer scientist. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so when we have collaborators visit from all around the world, they actually stay at my house. Uh, we're doing everything we can to be able to produce science at a low cost, and that means slumber parties in Pamela's attic. Um, we stole a bookcase from behind my desk, and my favorite bit of set design is I sent Tiny Intern, who's currently hiding behind Nicole. <laughs> Um, and told her to find whatever she wanted in our house that she thought would look cool on set. She was born in 1994 and does not realize she found the worst science fiction movie TV show ever made, Battlestar Galactica 1980, which forever holds a soft place in my heart. She found Battlestar Galactica 1980 and used it in the set design. Don't you love me? Yes, we do love you. Um, so, so that's a little bit of a story about how we ended up with a set. I stole my microphone from Astronomy Cast. And you put your hand on it. Yeah. Go, ah. Sorry. <laughs> this is my bedroom television set. This is the monitor for my computer. Uh, we basically raided my house and turned it into a set. Where can I find a fork in this set? We need VGA. Is there one already? Oh, Joe it? had it yesterday. Joe. The TV? Yeah. It should be plugged in. I need it plugged into Nicole's computer. Is there a VGA cord coming out? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to 10, 11 in the morning. Um, so, so I'm going to look at the comments while they look at the chaos. So we have from Paul Hutchinson, good afternoon and good luck from the UK. From Paul Stewart, good morning from New Zealand. From Rachel Fry, whoa, the set looks great, yay! That's all tiny intern. Um, <laughs> Red Five standing by from Chris Miller. Uh, <laughs> Richard's pointing out, Joe, you'll need a new URL every four hours, and we need to update the C CQ page then, too. It's eight hours now. Yeah, so, so we're actually, one of the things to let all of you in is if you choose to stay with us for the entirety of the Hangout, which we hope you'll do as we kill stuffed animals. Sorry, that's loud. All right, I'm going to wear seatbelts, apparently, made of a VGA. <laughs> um, so we have a, we we have achieved illumination. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see that, <laughs> but I uh, yeah I like my little pony. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna switch cameras so that they can see that oh, okay. better. So so in designing our set, I'm gonna continue to gloat about our set for a moment because I'm stupidly proud of it. <laughs> We have multiple cameras, so I'm going to switch to this is our only two of us are on set at once set up. So um, only one of us is on set at once, rather. So this is setup number two for one person because I like irony. Um, and then we also have we also have a camera I turned off. Let me turn it back on. That is our wireless camera. Apparently, it needs to attach itself to the network before it will work. So let me switch back to the regular one. Um, anyways, we're wired a lot. And during the next 36 hours, we're going to take advantage of all of these different cameras, all of the different people in our community to bring you all sorts of awesome. Um, personifying all of this is Tiny Intern's t-shirt, which I'm going to ask her to come share. Where do I stand? Right in the middle. <laughs> I 
That Yay. that is what we're going for this weekend. Okay, you you can thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> so so your donations are literally what's going to fund Tiny Intern. Yay. So. No, I'm saying you need to Yeah, I'm I'm looking to see what's on the screen. Okay, so now now to go back into our regular programming while things are looking to settle out. Um this this first 45 minute block we have set aside to try and explain to you a little bit about what CosmoQuest is. Um for those of you who are new, for those of you who don't know, we are the crazy creation of Fraser Kane and myself sitting in the Marriott Marquis in Atlanta, Georgia after Dragon Con in 2011. Um, Fraser and I had been having this argument for several years. I, I was at the time working with the Zooniverse collaboration and Fraser kept asking me why is it that you're not giving the public all the different things that you researchers have? Why aren't you providing the public with seminars? You're asking us to do science. Why aren't you providing us star parties? Why aren't you? Why aren't you? And it all boiled down to citizen science often asks the public to do all the same tasks that we ask our students to do, that we ask our grad students, our postdocs, our colleagues to do. So if we're asking them to do the work, why aren't we giving them the privileges? Why aren't we giving them the content and the information? And up until then, my argument had always been, we're trying. It just takes time and it takes money and it's hard because grant timelines and everything else. But this particular 2011 Dragon Con was after Google Hangouts on Air had begun to exist. And Fraser came back at me with the, so uh, yeah, this Hangouts thing, use that. And I sort of went, yeah. And we called over our waitress and we got beer because beer. And we, we also asked her for one of her waitress slips. So CosmoQuest was not conceived on the back of a napkin. It was conceived on the back of a uh, waitress's order book. And we started figuring out, OK, so we have WordPress. We know how to write citizen science software. Um, we have Google Hangouts on air. What are all the things that a professional research facility would have if it was an ideal research facility? And this is the other thing. Nicole and I are at a small state university, and this is by choice. We both have the type of pedigrees. She went to the University of Virginia, which completely rejected me. <laughs> I went to the University of Texas. These are both top universities. And I, I was working at Harvard before I came to SIUE. And the reason I came to SIUE is because I wanted to work with students like Joe, who can do amazing creative things, but due to family, due to just not thinking about applying, due to a whole variety of different reasons, it sometimes even boils down to um, doesn't have teachers that know how to write recommendations for top universities. There are a lot of really amazing students at small universities that you wouldn't think of. Well, I went to a very small liberal arts college for my undergrad and that had uh, quite an experience on me because <clears throat> even though it wasn't a top university, even though, it wasn't, even though we weren't doing stellar research, I got experiences that I would not have gotten at a large research university. I was designing uh, courses and, and degree programs as a senior undergrad and that kind of thing, um, and publishing in a space encyclopedia. I don't know if I told you that. No! <laughs> <laughs> because my professor was one of the editors. And That's awesome. I was able to submit. So, yeah, so you get a different set of experiences in a school like this. So, so I reached the point one day where, where I kid you not, I, I was working with students at both Harvard and MIT, and while I was at MIT, I, I, I heard students talking about, I can't date him, he uses Windows. Um, uh. <laughs> Joe's <laughs> providing commentary in the corner. And I was like, this, this is such a weird environment. I love it. I love MIT. But it's a weird environment. And, and then I heard one girl saying to another at Harvard, oh my god, can you believe she wasn't even wearing real Prada? And, and I realized that the priorities that I grew up with at a public high school, at a public college, um, 
the worries about how am I going to pay my tuition next month, they're all still there, but they're completely different. And I wanted to go find some place with the students like Nicole was when she was an undergrad, like Joe, like I was when I was an undergrad. And when I was offered a chance to come to SIUE, I came. Now, we're here, and we're trying to provide other students, other high school students, interns, people who are still trying to figure out who they want to be when they're finished incubating in college. Um, tiny intern who just ran that way. She's a 19-year-old who, working with CosmoQuest, is getting the chance to play on a global perspective while helping you have access to science. So when you donate money, um, the money from this Hangout-a-thon is getting earmarked to pay tiny intern to do graphics and things like that for our website, to pay Joe's salary, to pay Corey's salary, to pay a small amount of my salary. And once that's taken care of, Nicole, who's on a grant and is safe until December, then we're going to start working on Nicole so that she can have a job past December <laughs> um, and funding all of our educational activities and later today I'm going to be posting all of our reach goals on the website. So right now we're working on 36 hours of intensive fundraising and then we're going into a 32 day, 36 day, a 36 day um, extended fundraising. Um, we'd love to use Indiegogo, we'd love to use Kickstarter, we know you're going to say why aren't you using Indiegogo and Kickstarter, and here's where the bad side about working in a public university comes from. We're in the state of Illinois, and for those of you who aren't aware, five of our last seven governors are currently in jail. Records! <laughs> and one of the side effects of this is, uh, we're held under extra accountability for the type for the fundraising and for money usage, and so things are scrutinized very carefully, which is a good thing, but it also restricts some of what we can do using a lot of new technologies and new media. And the the restrictions that you face can be some things as simple as Patreon, for instance, says if there's any legal issues, they have to be tried in the court of law in California and we have to try them in the state of Illinois since we work for the state of Illinois. So, so we hit all sorts of crazy, weird, why we can't use modern tools. But we can use PayPal. And you can make donations that are completely tax deductible. And so we'd ask you to give. Now, let's tell you a little bit about what we have to give to. So for instance, we were able to hire Nicole because of our guerrilla science grant, because stormtroopers need to learn science too. Thank you, NASA. <laughs> you want to tell them about guerrilla science? Sure. So, so guerrilla science, it's not guerrilla as the ape, it's, it's guerrilla as in the surprise. Um, we go to different uh, public conventions, um, sci fi conventions, uh, pu maker fairs, uh, community events. We, I mean, community events in town are free. I go to as many of those as possible. Uh, and hit people with science where they maybe weren't expecting it. And so we take the CosmoQuest Citizen Science booth, experience, website, materials, freebies, anything that we can bring to these events, things like Dragon Con. Um, go, we're going to Balticon in a month. We have, uh, I'll be in Convergence, at Convergence this year. Uh, sadly, we are not at the DC Science Festival right now. We are watching everyone else tweet from it, so I hope you're having a good time. Um, and uh, and anything as small as uh, we had like a little family science expo here in Edwardsville at the library, and so I, I brought our stuff there. Um, so we can <clears throat> bring science to where people are, where they may not necessarily be expecting it, and get them involved in the process of doing real research with massive data. So we have a question coming in from Nancy. She's asking, um, is there a spot where we can monitor the amount raised so far? Yes. yes. If you go to CosmoQuest.org slash Hangoutathon, which should be the URL appearing beneath our video. You got oh. oh, I made the, the link too long. Let me make that. This is what Joe was trying to I thought he was pointing at something else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the lower third. Um, I should send you a better logo, too. Okay. <laughs> um, there you go. So if you go to that URL... <laughs> 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 
<laughs> We're going to be squinting a lot trying to read the monitor. <laughs> so if you go to that URL, you can monitor how much has given, been given so far. And you can also see the companies that have pledged to give, but their numbers aren't yet showing up in the totals because they're sending us checks. Thank you, companies. Or in one case, uh, they're sending us coffee. So, so we, we have been lucky enough um, to, to have a coffee sponsor. Um, and they were last year's coffee sponsor as well. Yes. So making sure I get the name entirely right. And Hank, um, there we go. <laughs> Okay. Scary looking error. Yeah, so you have to spell Hangoutathon with a uh, lowercase h, or it borks in fascinating and terrifying ways. Um, so, so we have uh, Weevil's Evil Bean Brew from Pennsylvania, USA, is providing us our coffee this weekend. Um, and we have several different companies, including Empty Set Entertainment, which is home of Scott Sigler and uh, A. Kovacs. Uh, they have made a pledge uh, later on in this weekend. We are going to be uh, having $1,000 in donations matched by them. Um, Fancy Farms um, has pledged a donation. Revolution EHR has pledged a donation. Fancy Farms is where she rides her horse. And yes. I rode a horse for the first time really badly. <laughs> 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 Um, and where tiny intern rides horses on a regular basis. Um, so, so you now know how we work out our stress. Um, we, our new office is in the fitness center. That's where I go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I don't. <laughs> Can I send you the logo file? That's the easiest way to get you. Uh, just drop it to me across Skype. Okay. Um, actually, it needs to land on that computer. Yes. Uh, Hi, Internet. Um, drop it. Yeah, drop it to me across Skype, and I'll drop box it up there. Um, so, so all train of thought has been lost. Sorry, so we do. I'm going to fix the logo. We we do we do Carilla Citizen Science, um, and and then in designing CosmoQuest. Um, I'm going to take you on a brief tour of all the different things that we have to offer and I'm going to switch cameras while I do this so that hopefully you can get a better view of the monitor screen. I have no clue how well this is going to work. We got very high tech and one of our cameras I can actually adjust. It makes me very happy. Um, so to go along with you, we have, first of all, you go to our home page and the first thing you hit is this nice big button that says do science. Let me see if I can zoom in more on this. Nope. Okay. So we have a big yellow button that says do science. Play along at home. Go to cosmoquest.org. <laughs> yes. Um, we currently have three different citizen science projects that we're going to go visit in a few more minutes and show you how they work. Um, but, but research centers aren't just about the doing the science. There's also, um, well, we provide through our Hangouts everything from uh, a chance to learn about, well, in this case, how to do interesting science demos. We provide educational opportunities for educators, which includes professors, includes teachers, includes anyone who works with other humans and wants to inflict science on other humans. Um, so we have Learning Space, which Nicole hosts every week. And Georgia. And Georgia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's the, um, we have some trailers up for our Hangouts, uh, and that is uh, an unfortunate screen share, screenshot of the trailer of the Learning Space Hangout. But that was a particularly fun one because we did lots of hands-on science demos in the STEM Resource Center, which is the department where we live at SIUE. Um, but on that page there for Hangouts, uh, whenever we have a live Hangout running, that's the place where you can see it uh, playing. Um, so... 
Besides that, we also have, um, so that's the one that we have hosted up here. Um, so we also do every Friday a weekly space hangout, which um, is our version of a journal club, except it's put together for you. So with the weekly space hangout, the way it works is, let me see if I can get both of us in this zoomed in monitor. Okay, so if you lean in. I'm doing things. Okay, <laughs> when you lean in. Um, so so uh, with our weekly space hangout, this is our version of a journal club. It is produced by our collaborator, Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, which has been a huge friend of CosmoQuest. Um, and it's organized by Susie Murph, who we couldn't function without because she helps us out with astronomy cast and so many other things. And what they do is bring together as many journalists and science communicators as they can every Friday to talk about what's new in the world of astronomy, to talk about the latest journal articles, to talk about the latest press releases. And so this plays that role of the weekly journal club that you'd often see in, in a research center where you talk about what is the coolest paper that everyone needs to read in ArchiveX. We're just recontextualizing everything um, so that it, it is more consumable for you. So beyond the weekly space hangout, we also every Sunday night do the virtual star party. That's again hosted by Fraser Kane. Um, Mondays, Fraser and I do uh, astronomy cast where we're working really hard to try and provide you an audio encyclopedia of everything um, that we find interesting about astronomy. And this is actually part of how Nicole and I met. Yes, yeah, so they started astronomy cast around the time I was a first year grad student. And I was uh, studying for qualifying exams, which was an experience. Um, and I would listen to astronomy cast in my off time because I felt like it was kind of like studying light. Because <laughs> they were talking about the topics that were going to be covered in the exam, because it covered all of all of undergrad astronomy, everything you should know for your master's level test that I was taking. Um, so I would listen to that, and that's how I became a fan of Pamela's, and eventually got to meet her at DragonCon of all places, and was all like, oh, I want to be here. Right <laughs> and I said, no, you really don't want to, because there's too many sleepless nights involved, <laughs> such as tonight. tonight. Um, your bedtime scheduled before mine, so I don't want to hear it. Yeah, but you get a longer chunk of consecutive sleep. Um, so, so this year we're not both going to try and stay awake for 36 hours. We learned our lesson last year. Apparently I fell asleep on camera. I totally forgot about that part. I did not. <laughs> Uh, so, so with Astronomy Cast, we're trying to provide that chance for anyone who wants to learn astronomy to learn astronomy while they're folding their laundry. Um, there's so many things that we do every day that don't really use up that much of our brain, that free us to listen. And I, I'm a huge fan of audiobooks, patio books. Um, I know that the reason I'm able to regularly consume new ideas is because other people have taken the time to read them out loud, to speak them out loud. And so with Astronomy Cast and all the other things we do, we strip out the audio and we put it out in podcast form. So the Weekly Space Hangout has its own podcast, Astronomy Cast does, and all the rest of the audio goes out in our 365 Days of Astronomy podcast. Uh, the virtual star party, that loses something. That one doesn't. <laughs> that one does not. Um, but all of the video, because we record all of this live, um, all of the video goes out on our YouTube channel, which is hosted by our partner, Astrosphere Vids. Um, so you're going to hear the word partner a lot. You can also catch all of our audio on one of our dear collaborators, dear friends, astronomy.fm. So we work with a whole network of different people to, to try and, and get you science in all the different ways so that you can learn the science. So, so we have you doing science through our citizen science projects. We have you learning science through all of our media. Um, but it's not just about the media, finding mouse. There are certain phrases you're going to hear a lot. Other computer. <laughs> Other computer is one of them. <laughs> Finding mouse is one of them. Which camera are we using is one of them. And I apologize in advance 
for the various chaos that will occur as we get progressively more and more sleep deprived. But you guys during astronomy cast making the sausage. Yeah, you guys get to watch us making the sausage. Um, so in addition to all of our regular star parties, all of our regular astronomy casts, all of our regular weekly space hangouts, some of the other things that we do is we partner with other organizations because we've built up the skills on how to use the, the Google Hangouts on air. Thank you, Google. We love you, Google. I'll switch to a better camera now. Um, so, so we partner with the Google Lunar X Prize program to um, help them share what all of their wonderful teams are doing. So we've been producing, we've I think done two or three at this point, Google Lunar X Prize Hangouts. Three. three. Okay, we are working with the Astronomers Without Borders Astro Art Program to, well, do things like help them bounce images off the moon to take your photographs and turn them into art that the cosmos is deciding how to design and that's just kind of awesome. Um, we are uh, also hosting special events. I've um, been told I'm being too quiet! <laughs> we're sorry for whatever we just did to your eardrums. <laughs> is that better? Let me, let me know. <laughs> sorry, I just pulled up the comments. <laughs> let me know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I should bring Q&A back up. Um, yeah, so it's not so much that we need to turn our levels up, we just need to change We're the mic. We're using the same mic. <laughs> yeah, no, so it's, it's, we both have a side that's active. If you're listening in stereo, and this is actually going out in stereo, I'm on one side of your head. I'm on the other side of your head. So we're... What? In, can oh. you say in stereo with me? In with, stereo! Okay, that wasn't really... <laughs> Okay, moving on. Don't take direction very well. Moving on. So, so in in addition to all of the media that we're putting out that you can consume on YouTube, that you can consume on uh, iTunes, we are also working to put together a repository of planetarium shows. We're going to have the Youngstown State University team on uh, tomorrow morning, and we've produced. Uh, Cosmic Castaways, which is the first one we hope will be many different planetarium shows, and that will be a, an additional one of our reach goals this weekend. One of the things about planetariums is there are some of these centers, the Rose Center in New York City, the Charles Hayden Planetarium, the Boston Museum of Science, where I grew up, um, the Adler Planetarium, all of these extremely large museums with large endowments with very wealthy planetariums that have shows that cost tens of thousands, millions, huge sums of money. And they sell them to other shows and they charge admission. And then there's places like us that have blow up planetariums. Nicole is our queen of the blow up planetarium. Yes, we got an inflatable planetarium last year, which is so much fun. Uh, it's it's uh, we got the large version, of course, so you really have to have like a school gym for us to bring it. <laughs> and uh, we're bringing it out for an event next Wednesday, actually, to a local high school, um, where we will have uh, bring the night sky inside, do a planetarium show during the day. Uh, we can bring it wherever we want. And and we can't exactly afford to buy multi-million dollar shows. But what we can do is we can partner with Youngstown State University and the Ward Beecher Planetarium. And we can find funding, uh, in some cases it feels like we're looking under rocks, to produce shows that we then give away for free. And this is what we did with Cosmic Castaways, is there, there was a grant that uh, John Feldmeyer was part of to study a variety of different things, including the stars that get torn out of galaxies during galaxy encounters. Galaxy on galaxy violence occurs, and the stars are the, the victims. And he had a grant to study those stars, and we used part of that grant to do public education in the form of creating a planetarium show that we are now giving away for free. And we want to do additional shows. We want to do a show on how citizen scientists have played such a huge role in asteroid science. And you're going to hear us talking about asteroid science over and over and over this weekend from when rocks hit Earth with meteorite man uh, Jeff Notkin. Uh, we're going to be talking about citizen science with Osiris Rex, with Hannah Tackery. We're going to be talking about mining uh, asteroids with some of the folks from Planetary Resources tomorrow afternoon. 
we want to do a planetarium show that tells the story of how these rocks go from getting discovered by amateurs to, well, mined by million, billion companies, companies with huge caches of money that are out to, well, push the mining industry off the surface of the planet to go mine somewhere else, which personally I'm a fan of. So we want to do new planetarium shows. That's part of what we do, and we're building an image repository. And then there's Educator Zone, and and this is where Nicole reigns queen. So you want to tell us about Educator Zone? I'm queen of a lot of things I didn't realize before. Yeah, my level is kind of low. Do you see the little green bit? What I know. Okay, so Educator Zone is the place you want to go if you are an educator of any kind. If you do formal education, if you're a teacher in the classroom, if you do informal education. Uh, with museums, with school groups, after school clubs, any of those, any any kind of education that you want to do. Uh, we pull in, really, we pull in the expertise from the teachers on our team. So Georgia Bracey, who's been a fifth grade teacher, fifth grade? Yeah. Yeah, she was fifth grade teacher before. Uh, Kathy Costello and Ellen Riley, who between the two of them have like 8,000 years of teaching experience because they're just amazing. Um, <clears throat> and we are able to build and create uh, lesson plans that go along with the different citizen science projects so that you can bring these into the classroom and still hit the science standards that you need to hit for your classroom. We also do uh, lots of hands-on activities. This is something that I did a lot as a grad student at University of Virginia. We did hands-on activities with a group called Dark Skies Bright Kids. And so uh, I try and throw a few hands-on activities into our weekly learning space and have been uh, starting to blog about some of the different activities that we do. Hands-on activities are great for informal education, great for kids, great for adults. Uh, you can really bring the science of astronomy, which is something that is up to there and out of reach and out of, all, out of our range and bring it down to Earth and to people's individual experiences. I'm slightly distracted by the microphone. Yeah, if, if I can get a grip, I'm going to... Ah. One moment, please. Technical difficulties. Yeah. Okay, I think that this will be much better. Say, tell us what you had for breakfast. The standard microphone check. I had your frosted mini wheats. <laughs> Actually, you ate my husband's. Or your husband's right? roasted mini wheats. <laughs> so, so if if folks could tell us if we fixed the microphone difficulties and if we both sound better. I'll tell you. <laughs> Joe's over in the corner. Um, it's on a minute delay in our release. That's so. fine. Okay. Yeah. So in a minute, you can tell us if we sound okay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. So educator zone, place you want to go for our lesson plans, for the lesson plans we've developed with our partners, like the Cosmic Castaways crew. Um, and for blogs about fun activities that you can do. Uh, one of the my favorite ones, because I got fed, was the cupcake geology that we did on Learning Space with Jess Krim. Um, that I think uh, we're going to have to, oh gosh, it was so wonderful. Uh, she made these cupcakes, but made them with uh, different layers of colored cake, such that you could um, do a core sample of the cupcake. So you give the student the cupcake with the frosting and the wrapper, and they're not allowed to open it, and they don't know what's inside. And they do core samples with clear straws and actually can pull out the cake. Okay. What, what happened? So, so, hi, Victor. We're so happy to see you. Who's Victor? Hi, Victor. Victor is a two-year-old who keeps trying to introduce himself. <gasps> hi, Victor. <laughs> so glad you're with us, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, Alan Vers Versfeld. I'm, if you want us to pronounce your name correctly, please include pronunciation. If you want to cause me to look with like the wrinkly forehead at you and apologize, don't. And I'll amuse you with how I destroy the pronunciation of your name. She's still working on mine. It's fine. <sighs> <laughs> Phil, this is your cue. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, I'm monitoring all the places. Um, Yes, yeah, so we're, we're trying to keep an eye on the Q&A app, which, of course, rearranges comments uh, <laughs> in real time. Um, and uh, we have Twitter open. We have all the things. Um, so, yeah, Educator Zone. Check it out. And we have some more interesting educational materials coming in later in the broadcast. What? Okay, so, so we're being told our microphone is just terrible. I'm going to switch microphones. Hold on. Let's, okay. Let's see if we can make this better. Um, Dancing interlude. Okay, I can't click buttons and do a dancing interlude. That's why I'm doing time. it. Okay. <laughs> um, we're going to go to the conference cam microphone. Which one is it? 
Oh. It's in the base, yeah. So right. testing, testing, testing. Say something. I was going to say something not appropriate. <laughs> That's not doing, because we're live. We have a two-year-old watching. His name is Victor. Um, I don't know how you can say Victor without doing that. Victor, Victor. Um, okay. So let's mark some craters. Okay. I think we can do that. All right. I don't know. I assume you guys are. Can you um, zoom in on that screen? Excuse me, squirrel. Yeah. Let's. <laughs> so this may be an over zoom in initially, for which I apologize. We're just fine. Okay, so what I'm going to be showing is the, the basic <laughs> function of oh my god, god squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> the basic function of the CosmoQuest Citizen Science projects, which is marking craters. This is not all that you well <laughs> working on it. Not all that goes on, but this is a very important part of it, which is the uh, mapping of craters on the moon, on the asteroid Vesta, and on Mercury. And so I'm going to pick the moon to start. Um, we just had a paper published uh, with the lead author, Stuart Robbins. In, in Icarus, which is an awesome journal. I'm stupidly proud. <laughs> so the Planetary Science Journal Icarus, which actually uh, shows, demonstrates statistically that you guys' results with the citizen science uh, is as good as the experts who have been doing it for decades and years and decades, uh, but also gets the job done a lot faster. And <coughs> so I'm going to go ahead and show how that works. Um, when you go to CosmoQuest, uh, any place on the website, if you go to the menu that says Do Science, don't know if you guys can read that, um, you can choose from planet mappers, moon mappers, or asteroid mappers. I opened up moon mappers, and over on the side, simply craters and get started. Click button. All right, so it will have you log in if you are a user or register if you're not already a user because I use one of those fancy password saving programs. I already have that loaded. <clears throat> of course, I'm, I'm a bit terrified that my results aren't accurate because sometimes I'm just doing this in demo mode and making it up as I go along, which is always a fun time. Okay, so here you're presented with an image of, this, of the moon, of the surface of the moon, taken with a lunar reconnaissance orbiter. Equal now, so people just turn up the volumes. Okay. All right, so we're, we're at equal volume, so yay. <laughs> okay, um, and you have uh, a landscape covered in craters for the most part, but some other geological features as well. So what you're going to do, you're going to look at this image and say, okay, I see a crater here. This is a pretty obvious circular feature. Um, I'm going to make sure I've selected my mark crater tool, so clicking that, which is already pre-selected. And then I go and find the center of the crater. And there's a little, there's a little zoomy thing over in the corner. It's either in the right or left corner, depending on where you are in the image. There, zoomy thing, zoomy thing. Okay, <laughs> and that'll help you. Those crosshairs will help you find the exact center of that crater. So you want to click down and hold, and then drag your mouse or touchpad until that circle matches the edge of that circle matches the rim or the edge of the crater. And that mark is your crater mark. It measures the position and the size of the crater. Now you want to keep doing that through the whole image. You don't have to get every tiny little crater. If you start drawing a circle, you'll notice it's red at some point. And if your crater size is like this little, here's a little tiny bitty one. If it's still red when you reach the edge of the crater, you can let it go. Too tiny, we don't want it. it needs to be, I think, 18 pixels, 18 pixels in size at least. Um, you have a little bit of help if you have, if you're looking at a crater image and everything looks like bumps and you're not sure if it's craters or bumps or what's going on. Um, <clears throat> there is a little icon showing the direction from where the sun is coming. Uh, so that's over at the top right of this image right now. Um, now as uh, Stuart, expl Stuart Roberts explained to me recently in a, in a uh, broadcast which will be available uh, as a as a bo as bonus content, if you participate in our survey coming up soon, um, the pictures that we've specifically chosen from the moon don't have the best sun angle. The sun is like right overhead, so the shadows aren't very deep. This is very difficult for a computer to automatically find, and it's even difficult for people to to find. So this image, the craters aren't exactly sharp, but you can still use that sun to kind of help you out. And you want to go through now and mark as many of these craters as you can find. 
and there's quite a lot in this image. So I could actually spend some time doing that. Uh, one time when I do this is if I'm watching Cosmos on Sunday nights, <laughs> I will do this during the commercials because I don't normally watch TV on TV. I binge watch a lot of Netflix, so I'm not used to commercials. <laughs> and it's kind of jarring for me, so it's like, oh, I'll do science, yay. Um, there are additional features. It's really important to look for things that might be weird and aren't creators, and there's a mark feature tool for that as well. Um, so this is just a really light patch that may or may not be a creator. I'm not sure what's going on there, so I'm going to click on it with the mark feature tool, and it's bright, so I'm going to pick light albedo feature. If you don't know what all these terms are, that's okay. We have some explanations up in this red sidebar. The red sidebar above <coughs> the red toolbar above the above that the images is really helpful for frequently asked questions for the tutorials all of what i'm showing you here is part of our video tutorial which you can go and look at at any time the feature guide which tells you uh, what you're looking at so i'm going to open that in a new tab since that helps you identify what you're looking at so here's the feature guide, and it goes through all those features. That's what a light albedo feature looks like. It's bright. That's what a dark albedo feature looks like. It's dark. And actually explains each thing. And then on the sidebar, so right now it's under the Hangoutathon, but usually it's at the top, um, we have all of those tutorials and frequently asked questions in science, all the extra material that helps you understand what you're actually doing when you do the mapping. So. It's the mapping and it's the information all in one place. That all sounds awesome. And um, we're having way too much fun with cameras here. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I'm having fun with craters. So like these really faint ones are the difficult ones. Oh, you can't see anymore. No. These really faint <laughs> ones are the difficult ones, which uh, I, again, I have examples of it in the tutorial video, which again, I, I do not have a background in planetary science. I am a radio astronomer by trade, but Stuart Robin, Robbins uh, sat down with me virtually and actually helped walk me through some of this so that I could do the tutorial videos. Uh, so I've kind of learned from him how to do the crater marking. You don't have to be an expert. That's the point of crowdsourcing is we have many people looking at the image. So even if you're a little bit off, a lot of people are worried, my results aren't good enough. That's totally not true. You're being included in the big database. And when combined together, this data is, is accurate. And it's not just about um, doing craters. There's a bunch of other features in there uh, to mark. And I'm, I'm going to let you, I'm going to hand this over to you. I know you hate it. Um, we're going to end up screen sharing um, some, of, some of the feature guides so that you can see what some of the other features are. But um, while, while Nicole does that, um, we're both trying to use the same computer. Okay. What am I doing? Why did you give me this? I, I was going to have you pull up um, the, the vocab cards okay. to talk about the other features that people can see. And you, you've been keeping, um, like you found the Doctor Who fissure. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I'm best done. There's totally a crack in the universe. Um, I also came upon the Apollo 15 lander. <laughs> in one of the moon mappers images. I was a little bit over it was <laughs> um, and, and so while she's pulling those things up. I still don't know what you want me to do. <laughs> pull up Dr. Who's Crater and, okay. and the the um, But you want me to screen share guide. into the hangout? Yes. That okay. That yes. that was the part I was I was unsure of. Sorry. Um <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell me where to go. Trackpad. So, so okay, yes. I'm gonna tell you where to go because I can't use this trackpad. Okay, I'm so so this. So the, the Doctor Who fissure is on the blog. Okay. So I'm uh so from the blog if you search for Vesta, that's probably Is it on the main blog? It's on the main blog. Okay. I keep trying to subscribe instead of search. <laughs> so if you search for that, that was the part I don't want to hear myself. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have make a little Vesta. Oh, there's go. probably a lot of Vesta. Put it um, put in Doctor Who. Okay, that's probably better. We we blog about Vesta a lot. We don't blog about Doctor Who nearly as often, unfortunately. So so we found the 
Apparently we do. Oh, because the forum the forums. searches the forum. Right. We do have a section on the forum for, for uh, small, media lunch. I'm just going to scroll back through time. Oh. So you want to tell them about the forum while I search for that? Sure. So the, um, <clears throat> the, the CosmoQuest forum uh, last year merged, or was it last year or two years ago? Two years ago. Oh, my gosh, ago. two years ago. Uh, merged and made lovely forum with the... The VOUT Forum, the Mad Astronomy University Forum, which has its roots all the way back to early days of Mad Astronomy and the early days of Universe Today. And it all turned into one big conglomerated forum. So there's all kinds of discussions that go on there. People talk about astronomy, people talk about science, they talk about, um, they talk about science in the news, they talk about controversies in science. Um, we have a, an amazing dedicated team of moderators who keep everyone in line and on topic and polite <laughs> for yes. the most part, if not like scary, scary internet time. Um, and uh, there's also some, uh, so I, I will admit, I enjoy hanging out in the off-topic babbling. I, I'll, I'll stop by there every once in a while <laughs> because it's, we do have a section specifically for off-topic things. There's also a small media at large, people talk about sci-fi, uh, all kinds of things like that. And so, um, you're almost there. I don't know. I don't know what you titled it. Crack in the Universe. There it is. Okay. It was a while ago. That's two months ago. Um, so that's the forum that we invite you to go and check out. Uh, there's also places where you can share your interesting mappers images of cool, funky stuff that you see, like uh, this, which I randomly came across while I was mapping Vesta. Uh, and if anyone is a Doctor Who fan, this is not a spoiler, but uh, oh yeah, there's the image down below. Uh, they do discover a crack in the universe. Turns out that crack is also in my ceiling and started leaking a couple oh, weeks no. ago. <laughs> That's, That's a whole other story. The universe is leaking into your house? Yes. It is leaking rainwater into my house. But it also apparently exists on Vesta, and that uh, amused me uh, <laughs> as I was mapping Vesta. It's it's uh, completely irrelevant. Well, actually, it's not totally irrelevant. It's still an interesting feature that you can mark. It's unusual feature. I don't think we have a specific no. ridges one for this one. But you could still mark it as unusual feature, and that's something that the scientists might want to take a closer look at. And so we do have a whole variety of different things that you can look at um, to help you learn about, well, about all the different surface topologies. So we also, in addition to, um, what are you looking for? I'm trying to find where the surface feature guide landed. Oh, it's part of the science pages, not the educator zone. So this this and is each project has itself. Irene's. Oh, that's an explore now. Okay, <laughs> so so we're we're gonna hide. So so we're we're announcing several things this weekend. Coming in a little while. For now, let me show you the Mercury you show you, guide. Yeah, show, show the basic ones. It's under yeah. So we've rearranged some things in, in the past week so that we can launch some new things today. I've been so busy planning this Hangout-a-thon that... She has no idea what I did to the site. It's no, great. <laughs> no, none whatsoever. No, no, but this we did, this we did, this we did months ago. No, this you did months ago, yeah. but we'll be featuring <laughs> the other stuff later. Yes. So these are some of the other features that you can mark. Uh, this is Mercury, and we actually have different feature guides for each world. Mm -hmm. Because one of the crazy things about physics, which is awesome, is as you do things like move a planet right up next to the sun like Mercury, uh, hit it with uh, really big stuff that creates splatters, which happen to Mercury, and you change the physics and the planetary science involved because you have higher gravity, you have a different composition, all these little objects look slightly different. And so we have a different feature feature guide for each world. And you can mark in our maps all of these different types of features. And we have different scientists interested in learning about all of these different things. Now, when you give to CosmoQuest, you are giving to help pay for Joe, to help pay for Tiny Intern, who's going to be here to do art projects with you in a moment. Um, and with us, we're going to play along, um, and you get to watch me and Nicole fail or not at art projects. Um, I will do a lot of failing. Yeah. So, so you're you're also paying for us 
to potentially be able to do new citizen science projects. We have one that we're desperately dying to do with the National Radio Astronomy um, Observatory, which we've talked about before because this is Nicole's near and dear to her heart. Radio Astronomy and Citizen Science together is like my dream. <laughs> but as <laughs> goodbye, Eddie. <laughs> uh, as, as you know, um, or maybe you don't know, there there's currently a funding shortage in the United States for science. Um, as, as it was recently described to me, word has come down from Congress that the space race is over, we have won, it's time to send the scientists home. This means that grant proposals from the National Science Foundation only allow people like me to ask for two months' salary. There's, at best, a one in eight chance of getting a grant. So if I have to put in eight grants for every two months of salary I earn, it takes me about two weeks to write each grant, and I'm a good grant writer. You can do the math. I'm too depressed to do the math. And, and so the expectation coming down from Congress is that people like me will spend nine months of a year teaching class. But if I'm spending nine months of a year doing nothing but teaching classes, there is no one left to manage CosmoQuest. And that, I think, would cause Nicole to cry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and, and so the fact that some of us are working on projects that are too big to restrict to two months a year worth of effort, it, 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 it isn't occurring to the people who are dictating the, the funding rules. And, and so when you give, you allow us to pay the salaries that otherwise we don't know how to pay and to do the citizen science projects that people want to do, that they want to do the science. Because another one of the side effects of not enough salary money is there's a lot of really awesome science that for the first time ever we have the capacity to do because of all the surveys going on. We have data coming out our ears but we don't have humans to process the data coming out our ears. Well, we do when we do citizen science, because we have all of you. You want to tell us about the radio project that we want to do if we get enough funding? There's a couple of different ideas that we've been floating around. One, is, <clears throat> one was uh, uh, with the Long Wavelength Array, we were talking about doing source finding uh, with a, an all-sky low-frequency radio observatory. Uh, we're still, we, we want to think do a pilot project to actually pit you guys against the sort of like the Manverse machine, but to yeah. put you guys against the computer algorithms, which they are using to find really interesting transient sources. Transient meaning that it pops up out of nowhere. We're not sure what it is. It could be something like uh, neutron stars interacting, really high, high energy physical astrophysical events. Uh, but <clears throat> with the uh, all the data coming down, we need someone, either computer or human, to look at it. A couple of other ideas we've been talking about with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory is. Uh, they're getting lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of spectra from the Green Bank Telescope at high radio frequencies. They're discovering molecular lines in spectra that need to be identified, and there are just hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of squiggly lines, <laughs> which definitely need someone to go through and, and, and look through them. Uh, this is going to inform the science being done with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, a millimeter submillimeter array in Chile, which I visited last year, which is totally awesome, uh, because that's going to that's really opening up the high frequency window. Um, I have all kinds of dream projects in my head. There, you know, I, I want people I want people to look at floppy jets, but that's just me, um, <laughs> and do uh, interesting uh, morphology stuff. But anyway, uh, there are lots of different things that can be done with radio astronomy. Um, and with the very large, I'm, I'm now on a working group for the Very Large Array Sky Survey, which is going to be using the expanded capability of the Very Large Array to survey the entire sky. And there's going to be so much data coming from there that I know, I know there's going to be at least one, if not a few, citizen, potential citizen science projects coming out of that huge deluge of data that's going to come down. Um, so there's a, a lot of interesting ways which you can get involved in, in astronomy that's not optical visual astronomy like we're used to thinking of, which would be really cool. So that's kind of still what I'm, I'm dreaming about, um, getting some of these projects off the ground. But we need the, the money for the salaries to have the people that make the things, like Corey and Joe, who yeah. are awesome. And, and if you haven't watched it already, pause this 
and come back because I think you have the capacity to do that. Um, we posted, uh, you can find it via Twitter, and I will add it to the comments on this Hangout, um, a video from our lead programmer, uh, Corey Lehan. Uh, Corey has been with me since 2008 working to create a variety of different projects. We brought him in to work on the International Year of Astronomy and he's still with us. And It's been kind of an amazing ride because I've seen him get offered jobs and he's stayed with us. Uh, undergrad, grad school, and now he's all grown up and I kid you not, he bought a house this weekend. He's moving in today. And he was so much more adult than me. He actually bought a house. <laughs> and, and I do not see myself doing that in the near future. <laughs> okay, so that aside, that, that's getting into the TMI. Um, Corey, Corey's birthday's today. He's buying a house. His salary requires you to donate. Please donate. If, if you've ever been an employer and had an employee buy a house, you know the trauma I am going through of complete pride for him, fear that I, I, I'm providing for Corey and his house now. Um, so please give and go watch Corey's video. Um, I will put it in the comments for the event page and I've already posted it up on the CosmoQuest X Twitter. Um, I'm going to go to the questions for a moment and move coffee and drinks and we're going to bring in Tiny Intern who's, who's going to show us how to do some neat astronomy projects. Um, well, actually, you could do these projects with anything. But this is a great way to becoming a walking uh, ad for science that causes people to just ask, hey, what, huh? Explain, and you can get them talking science. So while she comes in and joins us on the tiny seat for the tiny intern. Oh, I'm literally sitting on the stool? Okay. Yes. Well, there's going to be a laptop right there, so I can read instructions off while I go. That, that's all good. Um, so while hey she guys. sets up, <laughs> I'm going to go through some questions. Um, we have Skip Morrow saying, I love listening to Astronomy Cast along with other space podcasts when I exercise on a treadmill. Thanks. Most people listen to music when they exercise. I wish um, I watch science podcasts. I guess that makes me a geek. Yay! Yes, you're a geek. But, but there's actually an advantage to listening to science podcasts because I, I ride horses and <laughs> I've tried listening to music while riding my horse, and my off-the-track thoroughbred will go at the beat of the music, which is not always a good thing. And my off-the-track thoroughbred is uh, very sensitive to the smell of pheromones, which means when I was listening to a Scott Sigler audiobook, I freaked the expletive out of my horse because I was getting all stressed out, scared by, by what I was listening to. Science does not scare horses. So this is why you should listen to science podcasts. Um, okay, that was geeky of me. Sorry. Um, we also uh, this is also from Skip. Uh, his daughter Sarah is ten and a future astronaut. Awesome, uh, ready to go now. Doctors G and G. I like that. <laughs> she wants to know when do you think kids will be able to go into space? Um, I think once we get space tourism working a little bit better. Uh, so if you think about it. At, at the turn of the last century, flying in airplanes was initially something only done by adults who were slightly suicidal at the time. Um, but eventually we had Howard Hughes battling to get commercial mainstream as we had the wars between Pan Am and TWA. I think when that future is real, we'll have everyone flying. Uh, Nancy Graziano also wants to know, where can you get one of Tiny Intern shirts? Um, Nerd Machine. So it's on the back. Oh! <laughs> Woo! I broke everything. <laughs> no, I think it was me. Uh, warning, this... Okay, so the, the, the reason Tiny Intern has... Missed a piece. Oh. Tiny Intern t-shirt? is also really clumsy, so... This t-shirt, uh, they run stupidly small. This is an extra large. I weigh 87 pounds right now. It's not an extra large. <laughs> <laughs> so just keep that in mind when, when ordering. Okay, so if you we, donate, you're paying to feed me. <laughs> yes, yes. Feed tiny intern. Um, we we want tiny intern. Yeah, I'm so just gonna stop tiny. now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Guido Bibra asks, um, is there a way to donate uh, other than through PayPal? Yes, it's called a check. 
Um, <laughs> if you email me, I'm going to be monitoring CosmoQuestX at gmail.com and tell me that you're going to be sending us a check and you are a known entity. Guido, Guido, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Guido! Thank you. I He's trust in Germany. You. you know that, right? Yeah, okay. that's okay. That helps with the um, we, we know how to process international checks. Uh, I think there's fewer fees if you mail us a check. If you email cosmoquestx at gmail.com and you're part of our community, I will add the check that you tell us is coming to the donation tracker. Um, I don't feel comfortable adding people who aren't known entities as, as pledges unless they're a company or something, just because I can imagine we get someone saying, hey, I'm going to donate $10,000, and then it never comes, and we feel heartbroken. Um, you know, we know you're good for it. <laughs> yeah, so, so email CosmoQuestX at gmail.com that you're mailing us a check. Um, go to CosmoQuest.org slash donate to find the address information, and we can either accept donations through PayPal or through check. This is a restriction of our university. Uh, this is just what we have set up. I'm, I'm sorry that, that not everyone can use PayPal, but this is why checks exist. Um, we can also deal with cash, but that's a little bit creepier to send through the mail, so please don't do that. Um, okay, so that that was that question. I'm still marking craters over here, by the way. Mark craters. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so we currently have a grad student down at Georgia Tech who is analyzing the data from Vesta Mappers. If you want to mess with the grad student, go on like crater marking binges so every day when she gets up there's more data to analyze. That's a good way to mess with grad students. <laughs> uh, Paul Hutchinson says, good afternoon and good luck from the UK. Um, and I think we're back to where I last checked these. Um, okay, so what we're going to do now... If we're deleting your comment from the Q&A, do not feel bad. It's just they overwhelm us if we don't keep it refreshing. Yeah, so... <laughs> it means we read it and we love you. <laughs> yes. So I wonder if there's another way I can do this. Let's do the done. Okay, so I'm going to use done. Okay. So, um... That'll make them all pop up on the screen. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Never mind, I will just delete your questions as we go if I read them. Um, so this is Tiny Intern. Hey. Um, Tiny Intern is now going to show you how to make a teachable moment out of duct tape. Yeah, so I was running around St. Louis a couple of weeks ago and ran across this great little store that has astronomy printed duct tape. I'm going to hold it up to the camera so you can see it a little better. It has all kinds of stars and dust clouds and pretty awesome things on it. So I texted Pamela and I said, hey, I found this cool thing. How much of it should I buy to do cool stuff with? And turns out the cool stuff that I figured out how to do in the last 18 hours is make wallets. This one is red and it doesn't have inside pockets yet because I never really quite finished doing it. But you can put all your cash and stuff in it and I think I managed to hide all the sticky edges so you won't have to pry your cash out of it. Um, and now we're going to make one with pretty duct tape. And there, are there more rolls still hanging out over yeah, by your desk? Yeah, a bunch more rolls. I'm going to go get both of you your own rolls, too, because <laughs> I'm going to amuse myself watching you do this. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, no, so we're zooming no, in so that it's no. easier for, for you guys to see what she's doing. So while she's finding us duct tape, go grab duct tape. I'm going to go unvining things. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, there you go. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, so we're now on the uh, Cyclops camera. The one that's sticking up in the middle? Yeah. Okay, cool. Wait, where were we before? Because that's the one I was Logitech. looking at. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. And, okay. There. Now we're actually... Like, Look, we match. We do match. We're so cool. She's also matching her prom dress. Yeah. Pamela's awesome enough that she dyed my hair to match my prom dress three days ago. I'm going to prom in, like, four hours. So. But she's with us right now. <laughs> so I kid you not, downstairs are, are is her prom dress, her prom shoes, and jewelry, makeup, everything. And, and <laughs> to give you an idea of how tightly knit our group is, Joe, who you saw earlier and who was making comments in the corner but has now gone off to help Corey move because Corey bought a house. Um, Joe made all of her prom jewelry. Yes. If you've ever seen scale mill flowers, the metal ones with like the little jump rings in the middle and stuff, I now have a giant one for my hair. I have an anklet with four of them 
And then I have a pair of earrings he decided to make me as a surprise because he's the coolest. So, so, so I just I love the day. people I work with. <laughs> we we geek constantly. So those of you who talked about geeking, we we do science and and then we squee over chainmail jewelry. We understand you. <laughs> okay. And then aside from the wallet, if you if you don't want to spend quite that much time, yeah, that works. Okay. Cool. They need to be about eight inches long. I'm You're, arting. Shush. You need to make <laughs> strips about eight inches long of your duct tape. Otherwise, you're I'm posting links. It. Yeah. So. You're posting links to what? To to Corey's video oh. and WikiHow. Okay. Yeah. It's there's the tutorial I follow is actually on WikiHow being cool. Oh. Yeah. It's close enough. As long as as long as you can fit bills it. into it, it'll work. <laughs> and the other Harry thing that's cash. much faster to make, I also have been building hair bows. I think Nicole was posting pictures of her red one yesterday. She decided to make or a bow tie out of it. Because um, duct tape bow ties are cool now. Yep. Everything made out of duct tape is cool now, apparently. Should have made my duct tape prom dress. Anyway. Out of, <laughs> out of, out of astronomy duct tape, yes. So basically what you're going to do, you're going to start with your first strip of duct tape, and you're going to lay it down sticky side up on a flat surface that's kind of stick resistant. I'm using my laptop slip case because it's made of fabric that doesn't pill, so it won't get all over the tape, but it also doesn't stick very well. God damn it. So you're going to take your first strip, <laughs> about inches, eight inches long. Second strip, same length, and you're going to tape it. It was stuck to me. Sticky side onto... The sticky side of the first piece, about halfway across. There's a reason so you I'm have not half right sticky, right half astronomy, half sticky, half astronomy. And you're gonna take your sticky side right here and fold it up onto the bottom of it, so you only have half a piece of sticky, and the other side is all astronomy, and that's gonna be the bottom of your wallet. La, 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 la. So you fold that down and make your seam as tight as you can, so you don't have any stickiness like hanging out, waiting to steal your cash and rip it. Because some stores won't take rips dollars, and that's really annoying. No, Just no, like no. that. Yes, perfect. And it's a little crinkly. Yeah, so is mine. It's cool. Okay. This is harder when I'm not doing it at a table. I've discovered. There's hair in yours. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we do science and not <laughs> not art arts. crafty. Except yeah. me. I'm the humanities She's major the... that snuck into the science group on kind of accident. I leave. I leave you. I leave it to the to the. To the right art people <laughs> to make awesome stuff. You're taking a third piece and you're going to tape it down over the sticky side one more time. And you're basically going to be flipping your duct tape over, doing this until you have a sheet that's about seven inches tall. And I pre cut a whole bunch of pieces, but I may need to cut more after I'm done doing this. Because I only had like five and I think I needed eight or nine last time. And it stuck to me. Oh no. It's eating me. Okay. <laughs> The bows are much easier. They don't take as long, and I'll be able to show you how to make one of those in like two minutes. They're very, very simple. Some sticky happening. What? I don't know what's happening. Right yes. Now. Okay. Everything will be okay. Oh my god. <laughs> Hang out us on twenty fourteen, otherwise known as panic the scientists in the room with duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> no, the panic occurred yesterday when we found the dead bird. Okay. That is and true. it came from you. <laughs> Loud. <laughs> there was a dead bird discovered in the attic, and um, and I don't think I've ever seen someone actually levitate until <laughs> Pamela did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't have enough pieces. Yeah, Lindsay took care of it before. <laughs> Again, with the fam family of adulthood. <laughs> Smallest, youngest person in the room. <laughs> I could catch live birds, no problem. Apparently dead birds... Cause my voice to go up three octaves. Ah. You'd be a great soprano, though. I broke it. Only if there is a dead bird in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, your perfect role is Sweeney Todd. <laughs> <laughs> and I killed Nicole. <laughs> oh, okay, so the duct tape we're using is Duck Brand Duct tape. Product placement. I, I am posting the link for this on the main um, Hangout event page on CosmoQuest. There are also event pages on my page. Those are the ones that are going to the video because because weirdness with, <laughs> with 
Google Plus. So when I say I'm posting links, I'm posting them on the CosmoQuest main event page. Go to the CosmoQuest main event page. Why are these going on me? Because <laughs> you're convenient. <laughs> Right. Okay. I do better with electrical tape. This is this is I don't understand this. I have a little half ruler to measure all of the ridiculousness that is going on. Okay. Need one more piece. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Yeah. Nine to ten pieces of tape should make your wallet about the Can right size. Can you believe I helped build radio telescopes? <laughs> Well, we'll just assume they aren't duct taped together, which probably makes everyone feel a little bit better. You want that? I don't know. <laughs> you should have seen the first prototypes. <laughs> you know, I was working at a two meter wavelength, uh, so there's a little bit of room for slop. Okay. That should be... Oh, there's, there's a Eleven. The Eleven pieces of duct tape. <laughs> I'm sticking everything together. Somewhere my <laughs> my thesis advisor, who is a real engineer, is shaking his head and crying. It's it's not engineering, it's art. Okay. Just think of it that way. <laughs> and art is subjective. So so we're running late moving into the segment on Cosmo Academy, but I'm enjoying this way too much. Okay. I just finished the top. <laughs> <laughs> there. Okay, so once you have your sheet of duct tape that is all stuck together, you're going to take a ruler and measure out if I'm looking Yes, you're going to measure out a square oh, big enough, yeah. that's 7 inches by 8 inches, and then you're going to trim down whatever's extra. So the top of mine, if you use the 11 pieces of duct tape, it should be about the right height anyway, so I just didn't bother cutting the top. And then Are you, you want to count? Huh? <laughs> no, you're out. You're putting oh. enough pieces on until your thing is 7 inches tall. And okay. this is broken off at 6 inches, so I'm guesstimating. Okay, I can use it for more. I'm making an educated guess. Why are we using inches? Why are we using metric? Because that's what the tutorial's in. Wow. Okay. So we're going to trim off the edges so you have nice clean lines everywhere. And you'll end up with like a really jaggedy weird looking piece like that on the end, but it's totally fine. Cut off the other end. Oh. Is there supposed to be a sticky part left? Do what? You fold the top sticky part over like you did with the bottom. And then you fold it in half and you have your basic wallet shape. If you basically just want a little money pocket, then you can tape the sides. You can leave a little bit of extra space on one end and your wallet will look a little more finished on the outside. And you just tape over the edges and then fold it in half. They don't like to stay closed for the first couple of weeks, so if you really want it to stick, you can just put it in a really heavy book for a while, or run over it with your car or something, and it'll stay. <laughs> I know what we're doing later. It was not our intention to buy tape that matches their hair. It happened, but it deeply <laughs> amuses me. It's not my fault that my bangs are age alpha colored. <laughs> OK. And because the bow is really simple, it is my fault. I'm going to go ahead and do the bow, too, because it takes, like, four minutes. To make a bow, I made a sheet. Like so. You made the sheet. You fold your sheet in half and tape the sides together. This and then way? You have a wallet. No. This Other way. Other way. Yeah, that way. Because your cash won't fit in it. Otherwise. Oh. I don't carry cash. Fold it like a hot dog, not a hamburger. You remember that from, like, being in, in school whenever your teachers wanted you to fold a piece of paper? They'd be like, fold it like a hot dog, not a hamburger. No. no. Your teachers never did that? No. Oh, I have cooler teachers than you then. You're 10 years younger than me, dude. Yeah, and 20 <laughs> years younger than me. <laughs> I'm small. Totally I'm sorry. I didn't have hamburgers and hot dogs back then. Where? <laughs> that you took the scissors. Don't need the scissors. To make a bow, um, I believe it said take about 18 inches of duct tape, but I'm making a smaller one, so this should be long enough. Um, 
the length of your duct tape will determine what the size of your bow is. So take long strip of duct tape, and then you're going to leave just a little bit of a sticky part at the end, and fold your duct tape up and tape it together like that. And I'm going to do that down away from the camera on a flat surface so that it doesn't get all puckery and weird. Puckery is a good new word. Puckery is a good new word, and it tastes like kiwis. And <laughs> me. She has synesthesia. And that's right. <laughs> Other people don't know about that. So, so this Very means that that I broke it. <laughs> when you say words, they have a taste to her. And and I love when when I say a new random. Uh, what does lime and alpha taste like? Lime and alpha. It's it's really really sour and kind of sharp, but not in a limey way, if that makes sense. Right. So so I'll just like come up with science terms and go, what do they taste like? And I know if she's having a bad day. I just say the word dirigible, and it makes everything taste good. Dirigibles taste like dark chocolate covered espresso beans, apparently. Colloquial is also a good word. It's like cherry popsicles. Oh, I remember when I said colloquium, and you were like, yum. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> It's called is. lexical gustatory synesthesia if you want to go dork out and learn more about it because it's super really cool. I think I made a thing. <laughs> okay. Considering I ruined the first strip of duct tape I pulled off, I had to go ahead and redo a second one. So you have I your sheet, same on both sides, except there's a little tab of sticky, and then you're going to fold it around like you're making a bracelet and just tape the sticky to the outside edge of the first piece that you made. And you have a ring just like that. You're going to fold your ring in half and then on the edges you want to squish them so they look kind of like an M. Push it in in the middle and then fold it in on the sides. <laughs> you are mocking me in the background. <laughs> I've had to use for my moment. <laughs> Neither does she actually. You picked a really weird one for a whole bunch of international people whose money is way more effective as coins than bills. but. Yes, and you guys oh, have well. pretty money that you can actually tell the difference between the two. Yeah, and yeah, that's nice. So you fold it together, and you have a little bow shape instantaneously. And I need one more strip of duct tape. This is before we're sleep deprived. Yes, this is just the beginning. And then you cut off. I covered red tape. One more strip of tape, just a real tiny one. And you fold it around the center of the bow. Ta-da, duct tape hair bow. And you can just slide a bobby pin in the back, and then you can fit it into your hair or tape it on your back if you have a coworker that's bored. <laughs> so, so if you're trying to figure out why we have awesome art intern who who actually like went to the state finals through doing journalism in high school and and. So she like can write and do art. It's it's because we're scientists, and while Nicole and I, four scientists, are really good writers and know how to communicate, and I can fake it as a graphical artist whenever I need to fake it as a graphical artist. It frees us up to do the science by having this one to do our art. To when I say we need a pamphlet that says foo. <laughs> Science isn't just about the math, the equations, the CCD images. It's also about being able to get your results and share them with other people. And so we need people like Tiny Intern to help us share out what we do and to help us make graphics that explain what we're doing to the layperson. And, and just she does so much random, awesome stuff that, that frees us up. And at the same time, we literally are paying to feed her. Yeah. So um, donate to make Tiny in turn less tiny. And to help me stay, because I love these people, and I don't ever want to leave. So. <laughs> We've skipped ahead to the puppetry sec segment. <laughs> so, OK, so going back to the comments, um, we have Want astronomy <laughs> duct tape from Jeff Seltzer. Yes, so so it's duck brand duct tape. I posted a link on the main Hangout event page on the Google Plus page for CosmoQuest. Um, so duck brand, D-U-C-K, duct, D-U-C-T tape. 
Um, coolest duct tape ever from Richard Hayward. Yes, we agree. You can probably find it at Michael's. I got it at a store called Five Below, but it, it doesn't need to be there. <laughs> Jim Meeker writes, we need to see Tiny Intern in her dress before she leaves. Yes, you will see <laughs> Tiny Intern in her prom dress before she leaves. Um, just so that we can squeeze, because <laughs> we've only seen it hanging up downstairs. So we yeah. went to see And did Pablo's office randomly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's true. The, the, it's been a mobile dress. Yeah, that was my bad. Um, no, it's all good. Um, Keep shreds. Okay. Um, <laughs> Jim Meeker commented that Tiny Intern is 30 years younger than him. <laughs> <laughs> I have the baby. You broke your rule for me, so I have I, the baby. I did. Normally, I only hire people 21 years and older because the astronomy pr profession likes to feed people alcohol. <laughs> um, and and um, I broke my rule for her because I knew she was mature enough to, to deal. To not drink. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Scott Blanchett writes, speaking of corporate donations, a lot of companies also match employee donations. It's a great way to amplify the money you give. This is true. So all of the money that's being donated today is going through Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, which is the primary employer for Nicole and I. We both occasionally earn money doing things like writing magazine articles. But our job is at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. All of the donations go through the university for this project. And it's a complete tax deduction. And we know that companies like Microsoft, we love it when Microsoft employees donate because Microsoft will match. So find out if your employee will match. And I will fill out forms from here to tomorrow if that's what's required. And many more tomorrows if that's what's required so that you can amplify your donation. Um, so the next thing on our schedule, and we're missing Matthew Francis, um, the next thing on our, ske our schedule is to discuss Cosmo Academy, which you most recently taught for. So mm -hmm. you want to talk sure. about Cosmo <coughs> Academy? Sure. So uh, I'm going to disappear. OK. Can you get me coffee? Uh, yeah, define placement of coffee. Uh, totally ask Kyle. Can, 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 okay. can I have two things? Yes. <laughs> I also get them coffee. That's awesome. We all get coffee for each other. That's true, actually. To be fair. Yes. Nicole yeah. is actually the one who's best at using the coffee machine on campus. Which is not that difficult. It's just that we're moved to a new place, and so like everything's in different places, and you have to wash it in a weird bathroom. Anyway, I'm apparently the coffee maker, one of the two coffee makers in our <laughs> office. Um, anyway, so Cosmo Academy, since Bowler, Mr. Bowler Hat is not around, um, Dr. Bowler Hat, sorry about you. <laughs> the Cosmo Academy is the place where you can come and take a course, an online course, in some topic in astronomy. We uh, started off with uh, Ray Sanders doing a bunch of astronomy 101 type topics, uh, which were, you know, basics of the solar system, bas basics of astronomy, basics of uh, light and detection. Um, <clears throat> recently, more recently, we've branched out into more specialized, interesting topics, things that you wouldn't necessarily get in a college course, um, taught by somebody who has expertise in that subject. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Matthew Francis, who t recently taught a, a gravitational lensing course. Uh, so this was a, a short course. It was four sessions. We use uh, Google Hangouts, the private version, not the Hangouts on air like you're watching now. Uh, which allows us to, to have up to eight students per class. So it's a really small, uh, intimate discussion-based system. Um, <clears throat> uh, I taught a Life in the Universe course. Now, I have not done, although I'm not an astrobiologist by trade, I did uh, teach a full semester course, for, well, summer semester course version of this when I was at the University of Virginia. I took over for, um, for uh, Dr. Bob Rood. Since he didn't teach summer courses, he usually had grad students do it. Um, so I, I based a lot off of his, his notes and help um, and uh, tried to make a short course, a four-session short course. There was so much interesting stuff, I had to like try and pick the best. And that, we had an amazing time, um, the students in that, well, students, but it was more like a discussion group, really, uh, in, the, in that course where we talked about the, um, and we actually got to some really interesting arguments, too. I mean, civil, awesome smart arguments about uh, how to begin to estimate uh, the chances of finding life in, in the universe, life in our galaxy, intelligent life in our galaxy. Uh, so we, and we've actually continued as um, we have a little private group on Google Plus where we're continuing to post links and, and discuss things. 
uh, which is separate from the course. It just kind of branched off organically. Um, and then we have one coming up. Uh, this is Asteroids, Observations, Meteorites, and Missions, which Sandy Springman is yeah. going to be teaching. Uh, so there's another one coming up. These are new ways to um, discuss an interesting specific topic in astronomy with someone who's an expert in the field and with your fellow astronomy lovers. Uh, and it also, um, and we pay our, our instructors through that as yeah. well. So, so although it's not a free course, we are, the vast majority of the money <laughs> is paying the instructors for their time. Right. And so far when Nicole and I have taught it, because we work for Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, and we're working to figure out how to get courses run through the university, um, and this is just a matter of figuring it out, and I'm still working on that. Um, but uh, so we're hoping to in the future be able to offer adult continuing ed classes. If you want a university course, go to our partner Swinburne Astronomy Online. They offer accredited uh, courses for undergraduate and graduate credit. What we're doing is continuing ed. And Nicole and I have both volunteered our time to help you out. And the money from when we've taught has gone to support 365 days of astronomy getting produced and all of our videos getting done and to pay the salary of Richard Drum and Aviva Yamani. Um, but the rest of the time, what you're paying for is 15% of the money goes to pay Matthew Francis to organize everything because there's a lot of work in just making sure everyone gets the invitations, making sure everything works. And then the rest goes to the instructor who's working to put together lesson plans, is working to get working to put together um, course notes, graphics, groups, all of these other things. So they're not free. But we base the price that we offer them at off of how much I pay for horseback riding lessons, how much that Nicole's paid in the past for belly dancing lessons. Um, so we try and make what we do comparable with how much you would pay for any other adult learning experience you might be part of. Uh, again, if you want the university course, Swimmer Astronomy Online. We love them. They do a great job. I taught for them for years. Uh, now CosmoQuest consumes my life in delightful ways. Um, so go, and if you can't sign up, bear with us. Um, we got a note this morning from Craig Landon that he'd been having some problems. We upgraded everything to make sure we had no vulnerabilities to the heart bleed, and we're still in the process of checking that we didn't destroy any of our WooCommerce settings. Um, yeah, I, I already broke the forum notifications and then fixed that. Oh, I, but I fixed it <laughs> after <laughs> emailing Corey and then emailing him and saying, never mind, I think it's that. <laughs> so apologies to the forum. That, that was a heart bleed uh, fallout as well. But we are now fully security safe. And uh, just let us know if you have any problems. We are looking for sign-ups for Sandy's class. I'm going to be teaching some classes this summer. I just haven't figured out exactly the timeline yet. Um, looking over, so I, this is just sitting and taunting me in the corner. So, so earlier today I mentioned that the tiny intern, when asked to stage dress, found the worst video ever made, which I love because it's so bad. It's this not is, the worst ever made. Okay, no. It, 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 it is not quite at the level of Armageddon, but this no, is... No, I'm thinking of like the dollar bit at Walmart. Oh, yeah, that's... No, this probably came out okay, as okay, Walmart. Okay. This is Battlestar Galactica in 1980. This this is I was a Battlestar Galactica fan when I was a small child, <laughs> and and um, some of you may have heard the story of of how I got into astronomy when when I was like the original Battlestar Galactica came out in 1978 when I was four years old, and Richard Hatch was my first crush, and I was a tiny sci-fi loving child and. The original Battlestar Galactica had characters with names like Athena and Cassiopeia and Apollo and all of these were Greek gods and then I learned all the constellations are named after the Greek gods and... What's Starbuck the god of? Uh, Moby Dick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but, so, so there's a few anomalous records, uh, a few anonymous names rather. I actually read Moby Dick because the name Starbuck was in it. I was that kind of a twisted, sick child. But but I learned all of my Greek gods because that was related to the original Battlestar Galactica. And um, then I realized constellations are named after Greek gods, so I learned astronomy, all because of Battlestar Galactica. And then when Battlestar Galactica 1980 came out, I was determined to like it, but I didn't. But I was determined to like it, but I didn't, which is why this video has never come out of its plastic. 
because it is part of my childhood that I don't want to go back and rewatch and learn just how bad it was, but I want to have it as, as part of my childhood. You can make fun of me now. It's okay. <laughs> what are you doing? Trying to find the, the name of the worst movie, satire movie ever. Name remember. of the okay. So so we yeah, are sorry. actually going to be later on um, having a discussion about our favorite science fiction. So if you have a favorite moment moment in science fiction, and more importantly, if you can find a segment on YouTube of your favorite moment in science fiction where they got the science right. Go ahead, shoot that to us on Twitter. We are at CosmoQuestX, and uh, we will be sharing that out during a later segment. Um, so for those of you just tuning in, this is the CosmoQuest 3636 fundraiser. We are doing a 36-hour Hangout-a-thon to springboard everything off, and we are um, trying to raise money to help people like you learn and do science. There's this problem today where we have all of these amazing satellites, telescopes, ways of acquiring astronomical data. And unfortunately, we don't have the funding to hire all the scientists that are needed to process and do all the science that can be done. So we need your help doing science. But we also need help funding the people that write the software to help you do science, who fund the turning what you do into published papers part of this. And so it doesn't take us a lot of money to do a lot of science, but it takes more than zero dollars. And with all the funding cuts going on, um, we need your help. So we are uh, crowdsourcing our Crowdsourcing our keyboards off. Let's go with that. <laughs> we are crowdsourcing our keyboards off, starting with this 36 hour hangout a thon on Google, and then we are doing 36 days of crowdsourcing um, all through our website. And the reason we're doing this this way is, is because, as uh, university employees in the state of Illinois, there, there are various bureaucratic reasons that have to do with just stupid little things like what state uh, websites terms of agreements are enacted in and things. We just, we can't reasonably use Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Um, so we're doing this. And we're hoping that you will give and you will help us keep doing science. Um, now, over the weekend, we are doing, um, we're doing a whole bunch of things, and the next thing that we're going to do, and I'm going to turn this over to Nicole so I can catch up with what's happening on my computer, is we are announcing a new part of CosmoQuest. So I'm going to, whoa, I'm going to show you the side of my attic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's a food down at Bellsley Fun last year. Um, okay, so that happened. <laughs> um, we, 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 this is why professionals have, um, producers. Okay, my arm and I are going to go over here now. Okay, so I, first of all, uh, have to put my display back on. I took it off so you wouldn't see everything I Google. <laughs> mirror. Uh, first of all, I did find the worst sci-fi movie ever made. Um, and by worst, I mean hilarious, and the whole thing is actually on YouTube. I, I made my boyfriend Tim sit down and watch it with me, <laughs> he hates me for it. Star Odyssey. Next time you have an hour and a half to kill and want to giggle, um, there's this whole genre of, a, like, 1970s Italian sci-fi that is so bad it's good. Um, <laughs> so that beats out, I'm sorry, that beats out Battlestar 1980. Um, <laughs> That was the one I was looking for. Okay, so we are unveiling a new segment of the site <clears throat> that we have been working on, uh, particularly uh, Kathy Costello and, and Ellen Riley, our educators, who built a part of the site that um, I'm going to show you now. And I don't think it's linked on the menu yet. I don't think so. She's, <laughs> she's reading things. Um, so this is, uh, is this going to be are a complimentary. Are we in only hour two? What, 11? That would be why Matthew wasn't there. Because okay, so, so the wallet thing didn't run long. It ran confused. Oh, so do you want to postpone? Yes. Okay. 
Never so bye. I will not unveil anything. You gotta wait. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, okay, can can you uh, go back to discussing duct tape and arts and things while I rescue my timeline? Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I can um, just uh, go back to some of the comments. Um, Rich Hayward says, uh, Cosmo Academy is great. I've taken the course with both Nicole and Matthew. They were excellent. Thank you. I think you have Rich... Uh, were you? Yeah, so so I, in addition to the Life in the Universe class, I also did a class on the introduction to radio astronomy because it's me. <laughs> um, oh, Jim Meeker is asking Lindsay, do any words taste like bacon? <laughs> Come back. Sit. Okay. Watch out for her teeth. We're going to explore yeah. Lindsay's... It's synesthesia hour with the intern. <laughs> Um, bacon, I have not found any words that taste like it yet. The weird thing that I've been noticing about synesthesia, I actually just discovered what I had was called um, last year. My dad has the same thing, except it's not with words and taste. Numbers have personalities for him. I think it's, I believe it's called ordinal linguistic personification. It's his version of synesthesia. Um, so I haven't found a word that tastes like bacon. The way that I realized what synesthesia was and that I had it was there was actually a thread on Reddit called What's One Inanimate Object You've Always Wanted to Eat That You Can't? And the first thing that popped into my head was Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> the word Michigan tastes like a perfectly baked gooey butter cake, which is the weirdest thing in the world, but it's like it's flaky and chewy and, 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 and just perfect. And so... I was like, you know, it's probably not normal that I want to eat Michigan. So I went and did some Googling and figured out that that was what it was called. But food words don't always taste like the food that they are. And and that causes a lot of problems for people sometimes. It also caused problems for my journalism instructor. Because I'd have deadlines for like 500 word stories. And I'd be running right up against a deadline because I had peanut butter and pickles in the same sentence and I couldn't deal with it. So I had to switch words around. Yeah, my brain can't like handle yet. this. I just don't... <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I have a friend um, from from grad school actually. He's he's a professional astronomer. He's a, he's a theorist. I think numbers, numbers and equations had colors, and I think that totally yeah. worked with him being a theorist because he could understand what was going on on the board in yeah. ways that the rest of us couldn't. The way Dad looks at his numbers thing, like I asked him how if it helps him do math or anything sometimes, and the way that numbers work for him if they're working together, it's like they're all living in the same house and they have to interact with each other because, like, I believe a five is a, a sort of rotund older man who is very genial, he loves everybody, he's kind of the caretaker of all of the other numbers. Nine is really sinister and kind of malevolent and evil. One is the baby of the group and she's really naive. It, they all have very defined personalities, and they have since he was like five or six. So, they, they work together in his brain. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm missing all of this. Okay. <laughs> so no bacon. Sorry, yeah, Jim. No bacon. Sorry. <laughs> um, and Nancy also recommends the Cosmo Academy class because she took one with Pamela last year. Yay. And we are trying to get the link fixed. I'm actually going to work on that next. And we will have Matthew Francis anytime we want him. So do we have any more art things that we want to do? Uh, not really because I haven't attempted to make the inside pocket for a while yet. So that could all go horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> I think we should do that online in real time. In real time? Yes. yes. Okay. Apparently we get to watch me fail now. And, uh, <laughs> oh, 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 and related to Jim's question, Richard Drum wants to know, what does the word bacon actually taste like? What does the word bacon actually taste like? Bacon is actually super, super bland. If you've ever had, um, like... You'll never hear that again. Like a rice cake that's just barely salted or something, it tastes kind of like that, but with a very smooth texture. Because words have taste, texture, and temperature. So it's like room temperature, rice cake but with the texture of, like, a slice of cheese. I, I don't know. It's weird. My brain's messed up. <laughs> and now I'm going to try and make an inner pocket for a while and we'll see how that goes down. Oh, oh, we have a... An, oh, I can't open links in the Q&A. Someone made shoes from Galaxy Duct Tape. Uh, Jeff Setzer put that link in the Q&A app. Uh, it doesn't seem like you can click on links directly, but you can copy and paste it into a browser. Um, so, uh, do you, do, oh, I keep moving. do yourself Galaxy Print Trainers tutorial. Um, so, Someone shoes in are Britain next. made duct tape shoes. Because trainers? Yeah. Ah, good point. 
Yeah, I'm not to that level yet. The last shoes that I made are ones that I painted, and those were Doctor Who shoes, so. Still cool. Yeah, I was quite proud of them. One was Ten Suit, and the other one was the TARDIS flying through space. So it's kind of spacey. Uh, Jim Meeker wants to know if we're making cake pops this year. In theory. <laughs> They were no, they were cake pops. Whether or not they were truly planetary was the issue. Yes. <laughs> yeah. right. There's actually no tutorial for building pockets for the inside of the wallet, so this is kind of just me winging it. Uh, Guido points out that he can actually hear the starlings outside Pamela's house having a party. Oh my god. <laughs> We put the screams in last night, so the birds will not be joining us. Um, so we hope. <laughs> and yes, Sandy is teaching a class. Sign me up. Oh, Nancy has also put the, um, if you're in the Q&A app, uh, the link to the duct tape that uh, Lindsay is using here. Oh, awesome. Thanks. So thank you, Nancy. All right. Oh. Okay. I am. There's so many comments. So many comments. <laughs> Josh Andrews wants to know, what's the tastiest book you have ever read? The tastiest <laughs> book I have ever read. Believe it or not, um, oh, I have to remember what it's called. Can you Google um, a book written by Daniel Tammet? I believe it's The Bluest Day. Something? Born, Born on a Blue, on a Blue Day. Day. There's a book that Daniel Tammet wrote called Born on a Blue Day, and he's an autistic savant. It's actually a book that he wrote. It's his biography. And I didn't know what synesthesia was when I was reading that book, um, but a lot of the characteristics that he, um, that he deals with in his life based on being a savant really kind of struck a chord with me because he uses his savant uh, um, brain mechanisms for learning languages. So I believe it was he went to Iceland and learned Icelandic in a week. Um, he's this good with languages, a really interesting guy. Um, and I read that book five or six years ago, I think, and it's it's one of the better books when I've ever read. When she was a zygote. When I was what? A zygote. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that actually... That actually worked. Check me out. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so what are you doing? So you've made okay. a... I've made tiny, another panel. Tiny little panel using, looks like, two or three rows of duct tape. I think I used three. Three rows. So you make an itty-bitty little panel that's akin to the size of your wallet, big enough to fit a credit card in. I think that one's big enough. Otherwise, you can just put it in long ways. Um, and then essentially just tape it into your wallet with more strips, which is the part I'm working on now. <laughs> yeah, I don't do cash because I'll, if it's on me, I'll want to spend it. I don't, and I live within walking distance of the comic book store in town. <laughs> I don't have an option. Dad won't let me use my debit card, so I have to use cash. She's young, too. <laughs> We haven't emphasized this enough. She's a youngin. Yeah, so I live within walking distance of the comic book store, and they, they now know me by sight. <laughs> I mean, the hair probably helps, <laughs> but Tim, my boyfriend, was jealous because he's been reading comic books since he was a kid, and I only got into them very recently, and we walk in, and I get recognized, and he doesn't. <laughs> I've got to start reading more of them. I, I just finished, I believe, the fifth book in Neil Gaiman's Sandman series, which is essentially the best thing I've ever read. And it's given me the confidence to actually read comic books now. Nice. Um, we have, uh, I think we'll be talking about it a little bit later on. There's a comic book that uh, was produced through you guys uh, called Free Wi-Fi on Mars with some uh, really interesting yeah. stories and art to go along with it. Um, with a bit of a science theme, but definitely not smack you over the head if you're reading science. It's, it's really interesting. And, uh, I think we'll have... Um, Gosh, I think last year's Hangout on you actually read Chocolate Zombies. I did. The Scott Sigler story, which is creepy as anything, uh, as the Sigler story should be, um, which is part of that, and uh, the, the amazing work that uh, came out of that as well. So, we, again, we are, we are geeks, too. <laughs> we work that into a lot of our facets of our lives. And, and I'm in the process of getting someone to fix 
the registration, hopefully, for Cosmo Academy. Again, we just found out that our most recent security patch broke something. Yay! Ironies. <laughs> okay, there it is. She made a little inside pouch. A little inside pocket on the wallet. You can stuff your cards in there, or pictures of your grandkids, or whatever you want. Pictures of your grandkids. <laughs> My aunt's 47 and has two grandkids already, so what? I'm not putting it past. What? There. I'm enjoying my coffee. And I mean, I have pictures of other people's grandkids in my wallet, so... <laughs> <laughs> my wallet it looks a little crumpled. It's imperfect, just like me. It's okay. It's okay. I'm actually pretty excited. I've never had a duct tape wallet before. Okay. Any more comments? Howard the Duck is the worst movie ever made. It's but it's not science fiction. It's true. Sure. Well, we started with worst movie, but then I went into worst sci-fi with Star Odyssey. Shark Shark. Shark Shark. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> My friends came up with Shark Shark before Shark Shark was a Tumblr. I'm just gonna put that out there. <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna switch camera angle again if I can find remote. Remote. Do we have uh, Matthew? Yeah, we can bring Matthew in. Okay. Um. Well, you can. Okay. Yeah. Hold on. Let me bring in. Um. Comments. We zoom. Okay, um, so so looking over at Twitter, we have uh, Brokes Zero commenting um, mm. uh, regarding Battlestar Galactica 1980. But but what about the Wolfman Jack Halloween episode? That thing deserved an Emmy or something. Um, and, and James Moore is commenting, "Thank goodness Asimov was smart enough to walk away from that stink from that stinker." <laughs> um, and and then Jerry Kush is commenting, and Space Cub Scouts or whatever they were called, using superpowers to cheat at softball. Yes, that was part of Battlestar Galactica 1980. Um, and Phil Plate is commenting that Battlestar Galactica 1980 is even worse than you remember. This is why it remains in its packaging unopened, so that my memories from like okay 1980, I would have been six. My memories from 1980 remain. Unsullied. Yes, that word. Um, so, yeah. Keep the tweets, keep the comments coming. If um, you uh, try to find the Q&A app, I just got a tweet about that from Tree Lobsters. Um, <clears throat> the way to access that is if you are watching this on YouTube, you just mouse over the video. It'll actually show up on like, the bottom left-hand corner. Join the Q&A or join the Q&A app. Um, also, I think uh, you can also specifically get to it from the video event page, which is probably on Pamela's Google Plus page right now. So plus.google.com slash starstarter? Mm -hmm. Okay, plus starstarter. No, Pamela no, Gay. You're right. right plus Pamela, Pamela Gay. Plus Pamela, yeah. Pamela Gay. Or like I said, anywhere this is embedded is YouTube. Um, you can click uh, from the video itself. It's like right there. There. <laughs> Ish, <laughs> I think. I don't know. This is backwards. Um, uh, that'll let you join the Q&A app. That's what we have up on the screen right now that we can see at pretty much all times. And uh, you can also talk to each other. So, there you go. So, now that I've realized what hour of the day we're actually in, so so I, I have to admit, I had thought that time was passing much more fast, much more quickly than it was um, because of the donations coming in. Such fast, very money. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Doge scientists. Okay, um, moving on. Um, I, I really have to thank all of you for, for your generosity. We have crossed $4,000. Um, so, so to give you some perspective, um, that is almost a month of one programmer's salary. So we still have a long ways to go, but if we can almost hit in two hours one month of a programmer's salary, you give me hope. Um, if you are a small business owner, um, interested or a big business owner interested in 
making a, a corporate or business donation, drop us an email at cosmoquestx at gmail.com. If you pledge a donation, I will get that up on the website immediately and add it to Donation Tracker. Um, this way, our thermometer will show the actual amount, and um, we will work on getting the money from you later, clearly. Um, and uh, if you can't donate through PayPal, do the same thing. Drop us an email at cosmoquestx.com, and sorry, cosmoquestx at gmail.com, and uh, we'll work with you to find another way to get a donation through. Uh, we are raising money to enable citizen science, to enable uh, science education, to pay our staff to feed tiny intern. Um, literally. Uh, we would do this for free if we could, but society requires things like paying the heating bill, um, paying for gas in the car. Um, We're not going to pay rent. Yeah, sadly, we do have to pay. Well, I, I, we have mortgages or rent. Um, <laughs> I love being a, I love being a renter. I don't have to fix my leaky ceiling. <laughs> but let's be honest. That's why. Yes. I like being a renter. I have a leaky ceiling. Um, I may have just broken that to my husband who wasn't here. Oh, we sorry, Kyle. No, but mine was actually leaky. Yeah, okay. so so we, we now know of two different places that my roof is leaking. Um, Not just Sparrow's actual water this time. Yeah, so, so we aren't trying to get wealthy off of doing this. We're simply trying to pay our bills. And um, when you help us pay our bills, it frees us up to focus on doing science. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say other than it's time to welcome in Matthew Francis. I'm going to send him. Right I'm going to send him another invitation because now it's the correct hour, unlike the first time I sent him an invitation. I'm also tweeting out the link uh, specifically for the video event page. So if you're looking for the Q and A app um, as well as just watching the video, uh, that will work. Because we have to get tree lobsters in here as one of the bruises. Okay. <laughs> that means nothing to me. I'm just going to sit here going, shout out to the bruises. Okay. <laughs> Hi, bruises. I believe this includes, like, Bruce Press and Huffman. No, no, no. This is, this, this is a, a cosplay group for next year's Dragon Con. <laughs> <laughs> the look of distress. <laughs> Except we started a group me group at last year's Dragon Con. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um. Okay. Pinging Matthew. Come on in, Bowler Hat. Can um, I got a text. Pose? I got a text from Nancy. Oh. Um. Nerd. Nerd. Wait. Turn around again. Nerd machine. Okay. And if and if you happen to know my phone number, you can text me. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> Which Nancy? Graziano. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Apparently, uh, I muffled where her T-shirt came from. Okay. Came from Nerd Machine. And we now have hello from Central Illinois. Hello. Um, can you hear me? There's Matthew. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Are we echoing? Nope. You're fine on this end. Okay, cool. So, and uh, let's see. Now let me let me get my camera adjusted so you can see my shirt. Now, oh, I love that shirt. That shirt is featured on the Tumblr called Star Torialist. Which is my shirt. Yes, that is your shirt. That is my shirt, yes. That's, uh, I, I sent that to Summer Ash who runs the Startorialist site uh, requested that I be featured on it. So this, my supernova <laughs> shirt. So. so welcome, welcome to the show, Dr. Matthew Francis. Dr. Mr. Francis. So you, you, when you say Dr. Matthew Francis, you sound like Fraser. Dr. Matthew, I know, that's why I'm saying it that way, Dr. Matthew Francis. Dr. Matthew Francis. <laughs> That's the way he always introduces me. Dr. Matthew Francis. Well, and I love your Twitter hang handle because it turns out to be Dr. Mr. Francis, which is very Germanic of you. Yeah, this is what I, I, I have been told this. Actually, I should... Yeah. I, let, yeah. Me, let, me, let me make a little tag for myself so, uh, so people can uh, see who I is. 
But yeah, check out the Star Tutorialist Tumblr, which uh, Emily and Summer are collecting the different fashion clothing and accessories worn by astronomers, fans of astronomy, or otherwise related to astronomy in space. And occasionally General geekery. Some There's occasionally some dinosaurs too, I think. As I said, general geekery. It's uh <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they launched it at the last American Astronomical Society meeting, and they just ran around taking pictures of people's awesome outfits. It was a lot of fun. Cool. List. And silence descent. Yes. Yeah, I'm looking at pretties. All right, so we um, did a very we did a brief overview of Cosmo Academy a little while ago when we thought it was twelve o'clock and it wasn't. <laughs> so twelve why, o'clock central, one p.m. Eastern. Yes. Uh, so yes. why don't you, as director of Cosmo Academy, go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about what is Cosmo Academy? What is what is the purpose? What is the the thing? Okay. Well, Cosmo Academy is the uh, uh, a group of online classes that are taught by um, well, people who are generally uh, uh, experts or trained scientists in particular areas, um, and they're topics that you might get, if you, if you took a, well, let's put it this way, if you took a, a, an astronomy class at a, your local college or online, you would probably get 10 minutes on these topics or maybe an hour. We devote a full class to certain things like radio astronomy, like dark matter, like gravitational lensing. Um, we, we, we have classes that colleges don't usually offer, which is how to turn, um, find freely available data because most, uh, most astronomy, at least the big, big astronomy projects are funded by the government, and so the data they they produce is free for the public to download and use. And so we have classes where you can learn how to find this and turn it into the kind of pretty pictures we all love to look at. Um, Hubble Space Telescope images, when they come out of the telescope, if that even makes sense, don't look anything like the ones on HubbleSite.org. Um, they are... Uh, the, the, those pictures that we all love, and I, I look at them all the time for fun, and, and as well as use them in my writing and classes. Um, those images are all uh, taken from raw data and made into something that looks very beautiful. Um, and that's something that you can learn from our classes. Um, so we have a we have a wide variety, and in fact, we are open to suggestions for for classes, um, keeping in mind that uh, it, it's based on the availability of instructors and ability by those instructors to teach those topics. If you wanted me to teach a class on asteroids, um, I would probably say no, but we have a class on asteroids starting in just a few weeks, taught by Alessandra Springman, who is very much an expert on asteroids. She works at Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, and her job is to zap asteroids with radar to measure their properties. So who better to teach a class on asteroids than somebody who zaps asteroids with radar for a living? Um, you could probably we could probably get away with just having her zap asteroids on on camera, and I think everybody would love that. Yeah. But uh, have we not done this as a hangout. Yeah, I'm wondering that we should. Why? Okay. <laughs> well, that may, that may be, yeah, well, I think we'd have to, we'd have to discuss this with, uh, with Sandy before we'd <laughs> be able to, to make any promises about it. But I, yeah, but again, it's, it's, this is the kind of thing we can do. And another thing that we, that makes our classes very distinct is that they are all very small, intimate classes. We are limited, we limit our classes to eight students at a time. If we have more than that who want to attend, we add a second section because what we want is for everybody to be able to to see each other's faces, get to know each other, and more to the point, 
they need to be able to interact with us, the instructors. So we are kind of the anti-MOOC, the massive open online classes. We are sort of the opposite principle to that. Most people who start MOOCs never finish them because they are huge classes, there's nothing personal to them, they are a huge amount of time and the only thing you can get out of them is what you put into them because there's nobody who's going to care whether you're there or not. Um, our classes are short form, they're generally four hours long, um, four, four, I should say four, four hour long sections, not four hours straight, that would be insane. Um, be like summer semester. Yeah, say I've, I've taught that kind of class before and it is no fun for anybody involved. Um, but four hour long sessions, so we are able to hit topics, we are able to answer questions. Um, it is perfect for people who really want to know something about a topic on a level far beyond Astronomy 101. So uh, I'd be happy to take questions. I also have queued up a, uh, a lecture from Dark Matter. I can give like a 10-minute spiel on Dark Matter so you can see kind of the way I teach at least. Um, or we can just keep chatting about the kinds of things we can do or, or uh, what we'd like to do in the future. I can talk about the classes we've taught and uh, um, the classes we're hoping to offer in the future. Yeah, so, I, we'd love it if you could talk about yeah. some of the, the things that we've done. Um, I know I'm planning to basically do a calc-based astronomy 101 this summer. I still owe you dates. I suck at that. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you still owe me on that, and, and Nicole owes me another class, too, I think. I know. You, you owe me, what, what is it, exoplanets, I think, you said you were going to teach? I, I could do an exoplanet, although we covered some of that in the life in the universe. I have to just... Well, there's always going to be some overlap. Yeah, there's well, always going to be some overlap, but... At least one person who... Would I mean, we could... Intro to radio astronomy, so I could run that again if they were sufficient. Yeah. Well, I've had requests for the dark matter class again, so that one definitely should come up, and probably I think there's probably some interest for the black holes class too. So let's just go over the classes we've done um, so far. Um, we started off actually as being very much a, a astronomy 101 approach, uh, mm -hmm. talking about you know introduction to the solar system, uh, eight eight-hour-long classes um, talking uh, talking more broadly and less in-depth. And then we realized that actually we didn't have to stick to that model. We, didn't ha we don't have to do things like colleges because we ain't a college. We can do what we want. Um, and so... Uh, uh, so we, we taught, let's see, we did, what, four classes, I think, along that model. We did uh, introduction to the solar system, sort of a general introduction to astronomy, a introduction to cosmology, and then a, an introduction to uh, galaxies and galaxy clusters. I think those were the eight, eight hour long classes. And then from there, we went to um, Big Bang in the Dark Universe. That was Pamela's class. Um, we had introduction to radio astronomy with Nicole, uh, introduction to black holes with me. Um, Emily Lakdawalla of the Planetary Society taught a class on uh, making pretty astronomical images from Cassini data. That was a fun class. We had uh, two two very full sections of that. A lot of a lot of good stuff from that. Um, we did, um, and then then a, sim a similar class uh, just last month from Peter Dove um, on uh, uh, actually just how to take images that don't look so good and make them nice. Um, basic image manipulation, which is actually general generally useful skill. Um, then let's see. Then. Two more classes from me, one on dark matter and, uh, actually, yeah, one on dark matter and one on gravitational lensing was just wrapped up last week. So many, uh, many uh, uh, classes, many ideas for more classes. As Pamela said, we're hoping to offer a longer, more intensive course on calculus-based astronomy. Um, we have... A, an idea we've been kicking around for a while which would actually be aimed at professional astronomers, journalists, writers, um, and uh, uh, people who, who do 
basically astronomy on on a kind of a pro, astronomy on a kind of a professional outreach basis to talk about what are the latest finds how do we understand these on a little more in a little more depth so kind of a summer school type class for uh, public outreach and writers and the like we've talked about that so um, so that would be a very different kind of class but it was one that uh, I'm looking forward to developing um, with people over over the next few months so uh, stay tuned for different offerings um, I'll probably bring out my my black holes class again uh, coming up pretty soon now now the most common question that I see coming in from people trying to register other than the why doesn't your site work right now again we're we're working to fix this we are <laughs> yes <laughs> Our normal, our normal site admin for this particular subsite, Ray Sanders, is planning to spend all of tonight running our green room. So he's currently spending time with his itty bitty, tiny little adorable daughter. Um, and so I, I've managed to snag a volunteer, Phoenix, who's uh, one of our dear community members, and he, who's never used WordPress before, but is an amazing computer scientist, is desperately trying to figure out why it isn't working, because I can't be on air and coding simultaneously. Um, so we're trying to fix the registration problem. Again, we're sorry. We updated a security vulnerability and apparently locked everyone out. Um, but... The usual uh, problem. Yeah, usual problem. Um, so, so the uh, most common question we get, other than why is it your site working, which is only a common question today, is what level of math is expected for this course, and do you expect me to have a university degree? And usually those come in one sentence that isn't necessarily <laughs> perfect. So can you yeah. answer the, those okay. mush together commonalities? Um, the classes sometimes have a little bit of math, but generally speaking, um, if you can recognize an equation and understand what each part of that equation is, you're doing pretty well. Um, so basically, this is high school algebra level at best. Um, if you can look at, you know, if if you can look at a formula and understand that, okay, the, the if it has a fraction bar in it, and understand that when the bit on the bottom increases, the whole number gets smaller. Okay, that's the level of math that we often are using. No university degree is required. Um, we, uh, a motivated high school student shouldn't have any trouble with this. Although I think most high school students would be saying, why in the world would I want to take a night class on top of, uh, of being in, in school full time? But um, and, and no prior knowledge of, of these topics is is required either, although um, obviously an interest in them is, is helpful. But um, uh, there are some classes that do require a little more sophistication, and we say that up front. Yeah. For example, the classes on image manipulation, you really do need to uh, know how to use a computer you know, beyond, the, beyond knowing how to, to uh, log on um, to your internet account and, and pop open a web browser. Um, so, but again, we let you know about that. But anytime there's anything beyond the usual, oh, you can just show up and have your see see what we're doing. Uh, we will we will inform you of that. Um, did that answer? I think that answered the the questions. I, I think so too. Um, so so with your your let's let's look at one of the most popular classes, which is your dark matter class. What what are some of the things that you go over when you're teaching that? Okay, well, dark matter is obviously a uh, uh, one of the big topics in modern astronomy and cosmology. Cosmology being the study of the universe as a whole. Um, as we've learned, dark matter is about eighty percent of the total mass of the universe. So the stuff that we are, uh, uh, the stuff that that. We, we know the familiar stuff that we're made of that everything yes yes all this all this stuff I'm um, baryonic <laughs> that is that is that is ordinary matter or baryonic matter or you know atomic matter um, depending on how which way you want to split and slice and dice it um, that is that is uh, 
at most 20% of the total mass of the universe. The rest of it is entirely invisible to all forms of light. Um, dark matter, we're, we're legally obligated to say that dark matter is a really dumb name for it. Um, yes. Because when you say dark, you think, oh, you know, it's like my shirt. My shirt is dark. No, my shirt is black. Your light shines on this, and the reason it appears dark is because it's absorbing light. If you, have dark, if you were to somehow able to trap a cube of dark matter in glass, light would shine right through it. It would look like there was nothing in the cube at all. Okay, it, it is invisible. There's dark matter in the room with you right now. It's everywhere. It's like the surveillance state. Um, it's uh, it, it is everywhere. It, it is uh, and when you uh, I always said I always just used to say the Matrix, and then I realized the Matrix is 15 years old now. Stop it! Um, Stop it! Yes. So so it's like okay, maybe I should have more more pop more more up to date pop culture. No reference. problem when I use contact as a reference. It's fine. Well, I I, I always use the Princess Bride. And oh, realizing that the Princess Bride is is what twenty seven years old now. Timeless. Yes, so, it is timeless. I mean, Star Wars will never Star Wars will never age. Star Wars is like Star Wars is the, the Casablanca of our era. Um, you, you'll we'll still be quoting Star Wars uh, in fifty years, so that one will never age. But the Matrix, I don't know if people people find that one fresh anymore. But uh, dark matter is here in the room. Oh man, I didn't get a donut. That's not fair. Um, I'd get you one if we knew how. You haven't you haven't perfected the teleporter device yet. Um, no, more donations to do that. <laughs> sorry, that was really snarky. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, uh, so there, but but that's something that's something that is really hard to wrap your brain around. The fact that dark matter can be in the room with you, and not only do you not know it it is almost impossible for you to know it because if a dark matter particle passes through your body to your to your from the point of view of the dark matter particle you are not solid you are you know, at most a patchwork of little tiny dots and those dots are the nuclei of the atoms that make up your body okay those don't take up much space atoms are tiny Tiny, 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 and that's what a, that's at most what a dark matter particle would see when it passes through your body. So to hit to to actually interact with your body, it has to be very unlucky. It has to hit one of those things. So dark matter to detect it, what you have to do is go a mile underground and build a very, very quiet place, a place where nothing else could confuse it, and try to find those very, very rare reactions when a dark matter particle hits. And so that's the kind of thing we talked about in the class. We talked about the astronomy. How do we know dark matter exists? Well, it, it may be invisible, but it has gravity. Everything has gravity. Um, so we know it exists simply because uh, we can see its gravitational effect on ordinary matter. We can see its gravitational effect on light, and that gets into the gravitational lensing class I just finished last week. Um, so, and it affected the behavior of the early universe when everything was, as, as most people know, I think the universe is expanding. Things are getting farther apart. You, the, the, the fabric of space-time is stretching out and carrying everything with it. I, I actually like the river metaphor, where you're car everything is being carried along by the current that is space-time. And so in the distant past, everything was all scrunched up together. And so when you have when, when that is happening, you have places where maybe the density is a little higher and places where it's a little lower. And you can actually have sound waves traveling. And dark matter has an effect on the behavior of those sound waves. And so we actually see the effect of dark matter in the light from the very early universe, from the very earliest moments. Where's my, where's my beach ball? <laughs> I just have to bring a... Acoustic sound waves, yes. not radio waves, which are light. Just making that... No, no, no. 
No, no, no. The sound waves I'm talking about are actual literal sound waves. The acoustic waves of the thing. Yeah, acoustic waves. Um, these, however, are th this is this is the outward sign of those sound waves. We're not hearing those sound waves. Instead, what we're seeing is where the where the matter is is bunched up. The universe was just a little bit hotter. Where it was stretched out, it was just a little bit colder. And so what we can do is we can measure the temperature of that by the light that that matter emitted. And that's what we're looking at here. This beach ball is the sky and microwave light left over from when the universe was 380,000 years old. Um, 380,000 years sounds like, you know, sounds like a long time to us. But in cosmic terms, it is a mere blink of the eye. A, a, the tiniest, tiniest fraction of the total duration of the universe. And so, uh, so we can see the effect of dark matter. We have, we have a bunch of different ways. And so part of, a lot of the class was just going over all of those different ways we know about dark matter. How do we know it exists? How can we find it? How do we know... Uh, uh, I mean, how, how do we guess it behaves? How do what, what kind of particle might it be? How do we know what it isn't? All of those things are very important questions. So how do we know it's not a bunch of just bricks? You know, if you if you look at just the gravitational effect, you could do dark matter just by having ordinary bricks uh, spread out at a certain density. That was a, that was a good introductory physics question that I did back way back in the day. Um, but the the thing is, bricks. Even, even as small as they are, we'd be able to see those because when you shine light on bricks, they warm up, and they emit infrared light. Okay, so dark matter is not bricks. You can say that, that, that that's the thing you can quote me on or something. Um, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, but that, that's that's the uh, that's sort of the the quick version of what is what is the dark matter class about. <clears throat> And, uh, so so I, I love this comment that we just got. Uh, Chris Miller is commenting, uh, the fact that the universe is expanding explains why my commute to work seems to get a little longer each day. Um, and yes, yes, it really does. Um, <laughs> yes. So... I, we, we've hit a snag with our Q&A app where we can see all of your comments, but um, I can't display them on the screen right now. Yeah, so. the, the hosting account can't show them anymore, but we can see them, we just can't control them. <laughs> Yay! Uh, I would like to make an announcement since I opened my inbox. We have been accepted as a, as a, um, for a display at the Maker Fair in Kansas City. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you're in the Kansas City area, I think at the end of June... Corey, Joe, me, and Lindsay are going to be there at the Maker Fair with CosmoQuest Citizen Science. Just got that email today. Yay! <laughs> well, tiny intern. Tiny intern. <laughs> tiny intern. Corey and Joe. Um, uh, so that is uh, coming up at the end of June. That's one of the places where we do our guerrilla science that we mentioned before. So, yay. Um, Nancy Graziano comments, uh, I took a Cosmo Academy class from Pamela last year. I signed up for it after learning about it during last year's Hangout-a-thon. I strongly recommend it for anyone who may be interested in any of the classes. The Cosmo Academy classes are worth far more than the small fee that they, sorry, it scrolled, that they charge. So thank you, Nancy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Craig for the, 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 this is the email notification that Cosmo Academy was down. Shut up and take my money! <laughs> <laughs> We're trying. We're trying. Craig. This is awesome. Um, Rich Hayward is saying Cosmo Academy is great. I've taken a course with both Na Nancy and Matthew and both were excellent. We just need more of them. So, so you can get more of at least Nicole if you donate. Um, at least beyond December. She's funded through December. Programmers, less so. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and Matthew, his time is always bound by many different things, but we'd love to get him more engaged in, in doing more things, and that's only possible if you give. You can donate by going to cosmoquest.org slash hangoutathon. Um, the URL is below us. 
Um, so go to that URL and you can donate to get more people learning, more people doing science. And with, with Cosmo Academy, we provide uh, classes for free for teachers whenever we can, and we do online teacher professional development. So we're working to make sure that educators around the world are up to date in their understanding of space and of astronomy. So, so give. Um, yeah, I'm, yes. Um, so Matthew, will you be incorporating, incorporating the new inflation paper into future classes? Because I know I don't understand it yet. Um, yes, I, I will. I always try to incorporate anything that is <clears throat> any kind of recent news as much as possible in. Um, actually, there was a discussion of having a gravitational waves class. Um, I have to. I have to think about that. Um, that's. Uh, uh, that might be slightly higher level simply because you need to. You need to get a little bit more into. Uh, the way the way things move in under the influence of gravity, but uh, I, I, I'm still pondering that. But that would certainly would would relate. Um, uh, we were the, pretty lucky during uh, the Life in the Universe class. Yeah. Class Craig Landon pointed out that there was a conference happening right that week <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> about uh, searching for life in the galaxy, and so we were able to. Um, and since it was a conference that was. Uh, recorded and, and live cast, we were able to watch some of the lectures and dis nice. we watch them offline and then discuss them in the class. So we were getting the up to the minute science um, from that uh, and being able to discuss it with each other. Well, certainly with the lensing class, we had, I would say, at least two separate results that came out during the class that were worth looking at. Um, including one that came out on the day of the last class, and unfortunately, my art, my own article didn't show up that day because everybody was so excited about the uh, the Earth mass exoplanet. Yeah. Um, exoplanets, exoplanets, exoplanets. Exoplanet, schmexoplanet. <laughs> but uh, um, <laughs> no, I, I love exoplanets. Uh, that's just something. That's something that I always say is you think about it. We 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 are. Th this is this is almost a literal embarrassment of riches. The fact that complaining about exoplanet discoveries is like complaining that you have too many choices for dinner, <laughs> because you know, with 30 years ago, the only planets we knew of were in our own solar system. 20 years ago, we knew of what four, maybe. So 20 years ago would have been 1990. The pulsar planets. Yeah, the pulsar planets. Which were discovered when I was a senior in high school, because I, I I was working at. Uh, Haystack Observatory in Massachusetts. Yeah, Haystack! For Bob Phillips, who Nicole later worked for. Um, and he came flying into the little cubby, which I shared with the printer, because that's where they put high school students. And um, he, he squeed as as much as a male can squee. That man can squee. Yeah. We love you, Bob. And um, yeah, so I remember exactly where I was when those planets were discovered and I learned about it. So, yeah, it's it's been, I was a high school kid when we started finding planets. Nice. It's all changed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's, and that's, of course, the punchline is, you know, 20 years ago we only knew about planets orbiting pulsars, which are very different than planets orbiting normal stars. And 10 years ago we were starting to be able to number them in the dozens and of course today we know of, of literally thousands mm -hmm. so it's uh, uh, or say thousands of candidates more than a thousand confirmed exoplanets well, so we recently dumped a whole big cache of, of confirmed exoplanets from the Kepler data I yes. think that happened right before oh that's we right that's right it was like 800 more or something ridiculous like that it. It was like, <laughs> yeah so this this is where this is where we are. It's like we 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 can complain about exoplanets, but because we are, uh, dare I say, privileged to have so many to look at, um, we're no longer saying an exoplanet is a discovery. We are now having something has to be special about it for us to talk about it. It has to be a planet orbiting two stars, like Tatooine. Um, it has to be a very nearby planet. It has to be an Earth mass planet or smaller 
you know, when we found one that was smaller than Mercury, it's like, that is a big deal. Um, and of course, that one is crazy because it skims practically above the surface of its star. That's that's not a... The, call that one Hades if we ever name it. Um, not a place to build a vacation home. You think Mercury's hot. That one is, is much, much worse. Um, but this is the kind of thing we're talking about is, you know, we, we are able to to react in real time and incorporate these new finds into, into our classes. And our instructors are knowledgeable people. Um, we keep up with stuff. We, we you know, I, I would say I, I don't always teach. My, my particular areas of expertise aren't necessarily what I teach about, but I am knowledgeable enough that I can I can fill in where where need be because you know this is this is the area of modern research. This is where things are. This is our you know, we're we're not just trying to reproduce astronomy 101. We're trying to give you something that nobody else gives specific so, so information. I, I have a question coming in from the internets, which is where all good questions come from, and bad questions, but we're getting good ones today. Um, we ignore the bad ones. Yeah, that's true, actually. Um, so Adam Synergy is asking, where can I get a CMB beach ball? Ah. That is a good question, because I don't think you could ever buy them. Uh, I think that I, I got mine from one of the researchers working on uh, the WMAP project. She had a whole filing cabinet full of them, so she was giving them out to everybody who wanted one. Well, I um, think um, the, the, the company that puts out the plushy particles yeah. has the CMB map plushy. So you may not be able to get a beach ball, but you may definitely get a CMB plushy. Which is cute. It's That's Particle Zoo. Yeah, okay, that's it. Particle so, Zoo. So there's... A link on the WMAP website called the Inflatable Universe. Oh, okay. Maybe and you can't get them. Uh, inquiries can be sent to a contact page, but since WMAP is no longer really a live mission, I suspect that you will simply go into sadness. So I'm going to keep Googling. <laughs> oh. He's going to find that beach ball. I am. So Plonk, Plonk, uh, Plonk should come up with their own beach ball. Yes. Although WMAP is a little easier to make because the, the angular resolution wasn't quite as good, so the, the colors are a little more distinct. Plonk is more... Plonk almost looks like uh, the color of television turned to a dead channel. It's got so many fluctuations. And anybody who gets that reference, uh, um, oh, sure. talking about the matrix, talking about the matrix being uh, considered now an, an aging reference. How's that one? Um, so somebody asked me a question recently about TV static and how much of that is actually from the cosmic microwave background because that is radio waves and that is getting picked up. And we sat there and thought about it and realized TVs don't really quite work that way anymore. I don't even, yeah, I, I don't know how digital, I honestly don't know how digital receivers work, and I think I, sh you know, I, I, I feel like maybe I should, so maybe I should yeah. pitch an article. Theorist? <laughs> yeah, I'm a theorist. I am a theorist. Closest to the door. <laughs> and I yelled, at my, I yelled at my boyfriend, I'm like, you don't understand how to have patterns, you have to turn it. And he just looked at me like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> That's my extent of it. We just got one uh, partly so I could watch, uh, we, we tried it out to, so I could watch the Olympic opening ceremonies when they were live, and then we kept it so I could watch Cosmos. So, that's what we're Yeah, I was going to say, the, the, I, I actually have an antenna now, which is, you know, I, I don't, I'm not generally a TV watcher, but I've been keeping up with Cosmos. So, so, looking at questions from the internet that make me laugh, um, Rachel Fry, we love you, she writes, I think there will be a lot of great quotes coming out of this Hangout. And if you find any, tweet them, please, and help promote the Hangout, because the more people watch, the more are likely to donate. Exactly. So, and all of, our follow all of our followers know all about it, but maybe yours don't. Yeah, right. we've, been talking about, we've been talking about this for, for days or weeks, but your followers may not have heard about it. So even, even, a, even a retweet, even a, you know, here, here's what I'm watching right now, these people are a bunch of goofballs. You can do that, and it'll it'll get more people to know about it. You never know. So, so Rachel goes on to write that her favorite quote so far is, science does not scare horses. This is true. 
Um, Unless and, it's a science of snakes. Well, yeah. Okay, and then Jim Meeker goes on to write um, his quote from at Dr. Mr. Francis is, um, dark matter is not bricks. <laughs> I said you could quote me on that, yeah. And, and one of the things that really amuses me about that particular quote is uh, saying dark matter is not bricks reminds me of Don Winget when I was a graduate student saying that if there was just one acme brick of dark matter per solar system sized volume of space it would account for all the dark matter but how do you detect a dark matter sized brick? At that point in time we hadn't actually figured out how to do all of the microgravitational lensing that allows us to figure out the cross uh, cross-sectional sizes of dark matter particles, and it was actually possible that there were acne, acne bricks in mm -hmm. solar system-sized volumes of space that could account for all of the dark matter. We've now proven that Don's theory, well, not theory, Don's frustrated <laughs> comment in class, Don's frustrated comment in class was, is no longer conceptually possible. Cross-section of a brick is far too large. <laughs> um, but Bricks in the bullet cluster. <laughs> so, so, at Dr. Mr. Francis, Matthew, you have it completely right. Dark matter is not, not bricks. bricks. Uh, we have a comment from Dan Dalberg. Uh, oh, you can pull up. You can pull up the uh, pull up. I, I have a second window open. You can pull that up for the cartoon if you want to share that with people. Yes. Um, so Dan Dalberg says, ensure you promote this in your local relevant meetup groups. A lot of people use meetup to find yeah. like-minded people in their area. Make sure you promote this event there. Yeah. I, the I know. Okay. <laughs> I can't tell you what's in the dark matter sandwich. No one knows what's in the dark matter sandwich. And uh, it's someone standing up at a lunch counter. So the mystery meat of the universe is dark matter. Is there we go. That's a great quote. So the mystery meat of the universe is dark matter. Oh. <laughs> I am at Starstrider oh. on Twitter. There we go. Oh. <laughs> and we are now five minutes away from our first announcement of new things that we almost announced an hour ago because I had time zone fail. Um, <laughs> it wasn't and, even time zone fail, it was just clock fail. Yeah, it was clock <laughs> fail. Um, and, and we have another member of the Cosmo Quest team who is snuck in <laughs> around the corner. Uh, Georgia Bracey uh, is now with us. Um, and she is the head of our formal education team and we're going to force her on camera in five more minutes with this announcement. Uh, Graham Stickings is asking if last year it was possible to donate by credit card. Why not by this year? Can you no, use no, no, PayPal? No, no, no. You can totally donate by PayPal. You can PayPal. use PayPal to donate with a credit card yeah. even if you don't have an account. But there there are certain uh, times that people run into issues with, with PayPal, uh, either because of the nation they're in, um, or just weirdness. Yeah. So, the other problem was a, a particular Visa debit gift card that wouldn't work. Yeah. But Visa a regular debit credit cards. card will work through PayPal even without an account. Yeah. So the issue with Visa debit gift cards is they're trying to prevent you from turning the gift card into cash <laughs> because reasons, and and so you you can't use certain things like pre certain prepaid cards and gift cards just because. They're saying, no, thou shalt not have cash. Uh, Rachel Fry said, uh, posted in the Q&A app a link on Reddit where uh, they have posted the Hangout-a-thon. If you are a Redditor, please wow. go up that. Uh, I think I'm going to go do that what as well. Hmm? What what? Reddit is it in? I don't know, but I have a link. <laughs> Yeah. We'll figure Thank it out. for the tweet, Matthew. <laughs> what did you do? I figured since you were, you were talking about other things, I might as well get that in before I forget. Yay, I'm retweeting that from all the places. <laughs> oh, we have a comment from Timothy Legauer, and it keeps moving away. Good morning, Cosmo Quest people. Timothy Legauer is my partner who uh, is at home, and I uh, wish I could be there to help out, but instead I have to work all weekend. So yay for working. <laughs> yay, my boyfriend working. Uh, boo, not helping us with the Hangout-a-thon, but he says hi. He had a great time running the green room last year and had a lot of fun. So, so right now we have Phoenix T and Rux N, that I can't even pronounce her last name. Rux, whom we adore and don't try and pronounce her last name. They are currently the volunteers running our green room, and Phoenix is the person desperately trying to fix uh, whatever the heck went boink on Cosmo Academy. Um, One more thing from Rachel yeah. Fry. Aside from monetary donations, oh gosh, things keep moving. 
<laughs> aside from monetary donations, does Cosmic SF have any opportunity or need for volunteers who can give time physically or digitally? Yes. So, so when it comes to, to giving time uh, physically, we are always asking for volunteers when we go and do real-world activities. So, for instance, if, if you would like to donate your time at the Kansas City Maker Fair, which Nicole was just highlighting that we're going to be at, um, we always need booth volunteers. Dragon Con, we're going to be at Balticon next. Um, we go to all of these different uh, festivals that aren't necessarily science festivals because we don't want to talk to the same people. Um, it's, it's, we That's love true. you who are already in our audience, but we don't need to recruit you because you're here. So, so we go to places like science fiction conventions, maker festivals, all of these not already astronomy places, and we, we lure people over to the dark side. We lure them over to our world of astronomy. The dark matter side. The dark matter side. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, we need volunteers at things like that. Online, we always need help pushing communications out. Um, we're going to be giving help um, making our open source actually like work open source. Um, I, I found a, a consultant who's going to help us out, Yay. Llewellyn Falco. Some of you may know him. Uh, he's actually Llewellyn Falco on Twitter. Um, he's, he's going to be helping us out, um, and so we're going to be looking for programmers. Um, we're always looking for moderators to help us push content. Um, and marking creators. Yeah. Like legit, that sounds like it's the basic thing. And we, fault lines yeah. and albedo features. Marking the surface features through the citizen science projects we really need because now that we have that paper showing that the results are valid and accurate, we need to keep keep marking, keep marking. There's a lot more moon, there's a lot more Vesta, there's a lot more Mercury. So do the citizen science and share the citizen science. That's and we will be announcing. Those are tiny. How do we still have work to do on them? <laughs> People aren't doing their jobs. So, so we're going to be announcing a new citizen science project in an hour, I think. <laughs> okay, she's a little excited. But it's not the radio show anymore, but it's still really exciting. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, is it the one you were telling me about earlier? I guess not. No, no, no. This one is completely secret. Ah. Uh, it's in our office. Like, yeah. <laughs> My inbox knows about it. Yeah. I think our, our T at 10 group knows about it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's it. So Follow up on Reddit, uh, on the astronomy subreddit is where there's uh, Dear Astronomer, our friend Ray Sanders has posted the link. So go and up that on Reddit um, so people can come watch the hangout. Hang out. Yes. Um, so, so one random announcement is we are in the middle of the thou shalt die perhaps this weekend via tornadoes. So <laughs> you were talking about possible volunteerism. Um, it's, well, well uh, uh, Joe Ray, who was one of our uh, most beloved employees and has now gone on to activities that actually pay a much better wage, um, or at least pay more hours than I was able to pay. Um, he did a weather assessment for us and says we're probably fine, um, but uh, just saying donate now when we still have internet because there was a tornado last year that was two blocks that way, uh, like literally two blocks away went past my house, actually hit my Jeep while we were driving home. That wasn't fun. On my Facebook there's a post along the lines of, if you don't hear from me in the next 24 hours, this is where you can find our bodies. Oh. Um, yeah. Freak the heck out of me. Let me tell you. Yeah. I'm like, why are you driving in the tornado? We were stupid. That, that was my first major tornado experience in the Midwest. Too. Yeah, and my husband's Canadian and it was his, his first major experience and he was the one driving over trees as they fell down in front of our Jeep. Um, anyways, um, so yeah, those are, those are the <laughs> This Midwesterner is... <laughs> I'm a Bostonian is the problem. Um, but <laughs> later now... Um, are we ready to make announcement number one? Yeah, so I'm gonna relinquish my chair to Georgia and get hot tea. Um, <laughs> woo! Which so, way do I go? Uh, I don't care. One way. Okay. There's, you can go through there. You, go over here. Yeah, the, you, you walk. Oh, that works too. <laughs> so I am now being joined by my Learning Space co-host without a wall in between us this time. Because <laughs> we're usually in Nick's office. Come on, I can see you. Good morning, Georgia. Hey, Nicole. 
Triton shipper. Yes, yes. Mm. I've had enough coffee finally. Oh, so yes. Georgia Bracy, uh, our formal education lead, uh, former fifth grade teacher. Yeah. Uh, you're know. working on a PhD so now. So long ago. Yes. Does I all did the things. 13 years of fifth graders, and I really miss them. Actually, they're just a ball of fun all the time. Uh, they're mostly always chipper in the morning, and they got me going. So I, yeah. But that was a while ago, and uh, yes, I'm now at University of um, Missouri in St. Louis, working on a PhD in science education. Go figure. Yay! So, yes. So yeah, uh, keep, we keep learning. I need to put my display back on. So major announcement. Um, do you have? Where's the zoomy thing? No. I was gonna. Yeah, that's the wanna, zoomy thing. Oh, it is the zoomy thing. Yeah. Yeah. You may have to switch cameras. Yeah, which I do over there. Yes. Can I? Can you hand me that keyboard mm -hmm. assembly? <laughs> Here you are. Like the chat pad of doom that neither of us can figure out. Okay, so we are gonna switch camera sources. Whoops, not that. <laughs> What's it called? Okay. Broadcaster camera? No. no, 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 no. You want a conference cam. Conference cam. <clears throat> okay. Put that back, back over okay. there. And now. Oh my gosh, I didn't notice the donuts either. How did I miss that? Also, very important. People keep taunting me with donuts. I'm sorry. And we were doing that with, with pizza and Mike Simmons yesterday. Well, there's just a Mike. huge open box of them right here. Yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to zoom in a little bit so we can see Georgia cool. and uh, what will be my screen. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. Thank you. Quite the command and control center here. <laughs> Let me tell you. Uh, Keyboards and buttons everywhere. <laughs> and squirrels. And squirrels and, and dragons. dragons and donuts. Oh, you got one of the squirrels. Uh, you, I found there's it. There's more. I found it in the bedroom I was sleeping in last night. I'm like, why is there a squirrel? Oh, because it's Pamela's house. <laughs> Mattress is a little lumpy. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> All right, so in the screen behind Georgia, again, I don't know how well you can see this, but you can definitely follow along with at home. Uh, so we are going to introduce the new section of the site called Explore. Explore. So let me get that. My, my, my computer is, is very old and sad and slow, so we're getting there. Cosmoquest.org slash x slash explore. <laughs> Go. <laughs> <laughs> I have maxed out the RAM in this laptop. It's, it's really sad. Or it's the internet. That's probably or both. Or both. Right. I think it's very internet. You know what? Um, oh, here it comes. <laughs> no, it's my computer. It has like no memory right now. Aww. So this is Explore. Anyway, uh, why don't so, you tell us a little bit? So Explore, uh, we've been working on this. Actually, it has a history. We've been working on this for a really long time, um, but more work has gone into it just in the recent uh, past. And this is a very nice uh, resource and supplement to, first of all, teachers, of course, because that's what I always sort of think of first. Um, but really to anybody that's doing any of the citizen science and any of the things going on in CosmoQuest, you can go to explore and look up all the astronomy information you would ever hope to need. Yeah, hand me that other thing. Uh, Maybe thing? I can screen okay. share that'll be a little bit better. So people can actually see it. Give me the thing. So whether you are working on one of the MAPPERS projects and you want to know more about surface features, you want to know more about craters, you want to know more about history of the moon, anything like that, you can go to explore, you can search on topics and come up with uh, just a real encyclopedia of astronomy information. Pictures, content. You want to talk <laughs> about the timeline? Timeline. Please. I'm slowly getting it up so you can keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a timeline of astronomy um, that two of our other educators uh, spend an awful lot of time working on being up there. So if you want to go way back in time and see how things evolved, how things formed, 
when exciting events happened. And this is a great thing, um, actually, for teachers and students. Um, timelines are, and reading timelines, not only creating them, but reading them, working with them is an important skill, um, something I actually did quite a bit with my fifth graders. And you can go in and use the timeline that we have here. I can't to see pull up. the webcam. This is annoying me. <laughs> Move the window. I can't. Oh, because trackpad. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you, I brought up I brought up the website. Is that what you were trying to do? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I can just okay. If you if you go. yeah if you if you bring my screen if you bring my screen up I have the website up. Done that. All right, so keep going. Yay. So, uh, okay. so there are three. So yes, yeah, so there are three main parts. There's mm -hmm. uh, the astronomy 101. What we're calling astronomy 101. You'll see all three of these scroll through. Uh, that is kind of just the encyclopedia of all the astronomy. It's actually a lot of content from Astropedia and from NASA. Um, and so this is uh, any basic information that you want to know about astronomy. Right. And it's nice that it's all in one place. So a lot of times um, students, you know, they're not sure where to go on the Internet. Um, and as teachers, you know, you worry about where they are going sometimes on the Internet. <laughs> and this is something that's easy, again, for teachers to just say it's right there, it's within the same site. If you need background information, if you want to know more about something, go right to Explore and just start digging in. It's all right there. So, yeah, Astronomy 101. Uh, so uh, go info. ahead to the, um, there's also Planet and, Fact Sheets. Right. So and click that. And Planet Fact Sheets. So uh, once you go into the Read More, that'll give you a list of all the planet and or planet fact sheets that you can use for basic planetary data. Right. Um, and again, learning the planets, learning about the different um, surfaces and features of the planets, that's uh, a big thing. But the timeline. With the early grades, too. So if, yeah, so the we, timeline. So uh, Matthew, can you go on the timeline and click Read More, the little green Read More button? This is the the landing page for the timeline that was put together um, by Kathy and Ellen. Uh, the text might be kind of small, but it, it goes back to antiquity and up to the present day. Uh, we do need to do a little bit of updating on some of the current stuff and uh, future and beyond. But this uh, timeline, so pick a, pick a time okay, range. Yeah. Let's see. Um, when would you like to go? Yeah, we'll do 65 to 69. This is a fun time. <laughs> Things are really happening back then. <laughs> Woo. So here's our, our brief timeline of the show. Bye. So you can scroll down and see all different events um, that happened in astronomy and space history during that four-year time frame. Um, so yeah, it starts off with... points for why I picked this one. <laughs> what? <laughs> what did you say? Say again. I said no bonus points for figuring oh. out which one I'm, why I picked this one. <laughs> that, I, we can't read it from here. <laughs> our viewers okay. again, but I'm our sorry. I, 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 I zoomed out, zoom out it still. Okay. So, yeah, so this is a timeline that will take you through um, the history of astronomy. Now, uh, the content is still uh, a work in progress. If you find, uh, so we, we were in a mad dash to get this finished and ready for launch. We so were. if you do find little mistakes, I know some equations uh, had trouble with symbols copying over, do let us know. Again, email us, cosmoquestx at gmail.com, um, and we'll go ahead and fix those things and work on that. We want this to be a really accurate and really useful resource for educators of all kinds. Right, so if your students are doing any kind of space and astronomy projects, this would be a great place to send them just to get their basic basic facts. Mm -hmm. It's also great for students who are finished with you know, their other projects, and there's always a few that get done, and they want to do more, they want something else to do, and they can just go in and explore and explore, and get all kinds of great, all kinds of great information. Matthew, um, can you click, uh, so yeah, under the Explore logo, so those are the three main parts under the main category. There's Timeline, Fact Sheets, and Astronomy 101. There's also a fourth section called the Planetary Features Glossary, which is written and put together by Irene Antonenko of the Moon Mercury Mappers Project. So if you click into that, this is literally a glossary of all of the weird, bizarre, interesting planetary mm. features that you may mm. come across in your mapping or that are seen around the solar system. Uh, so you can pick pick a favorite, Matthew. <laughs> pick one you pick just one that sounds funky. Really, never heard of. 
Where is he going? I'll pick Graben. Graben! Hey, Graben. So that gives you definition. It gives you the sample image. A beautiful um, image. They do yeah, insert. So the glossary has a nice interlinking feature. So if it's got a, a term in there that is another glossary term, you should be able to click over and get to that term. So you can explore this network of vocabulary related to planetary surface features. And since we're mapping the surfaces of the Moon, Mercury, and Vesta at the moment, this will help you understand what it is you're looking at. And if you are playing the mobile app games <laughs> we'll be talking about later, this is really useful <laughs> for getting better at those games. Yes, learn your lunar vocabulary. Beautiful. So you have Planetary Features Glossary, Astronomy 101, Planetary Fact Sheets, and the Timeline of Astronomy all here on the Explore site. Um, and, and we are looking forward to you guys using it and looking forward to your feedback on how we can make it better. And <laughs> oh, okay. And of course, <laughs> we're getting whispered at. We're getting production notes. Um, your donations will help us keep this site going. Will help us uh, pay the people that create the content that make the awesome stuff in Explore and on the rest of the CosmoQuest site. So when you donate, there's the link again uh, for the Hangoutathon that will keep this project going and make it so that you guys are being a part of it and helping us make this work. And you were talking about volunteers um, earlier, mm -hmm. and I'll, I guess one way really to volunteer is if you're using Explore, um, we would always love to know what you are using it for, mm -hmm. and if you're a teacher, what kinds of projects you're using it with in your classroom, and it would help us a lot just to send us an email, educate at cosmoquest.org. Um, let us know how you're using it, what kind of projects you're doing, and if you find anything that's uh, like a missing picture or a strange symbol that shouldn't be there. You know, <laughs> help us out that way too. Just send us a quick email, and and we'll get right on that because it's uh, we're still we're still working. I was on doing it. all the HTML symbol finding <laughs> for yes. all the equations. Oh yes, there Good are time. equations. There are some equations. So, so uh, you can really yeah, get let us know and help us out. Yeah. Right. Oh you, my goodness, I'm breathing in the sugar of the, of the donuts. <laughs> the donuts that can that you mention funny. donuts one more time? Oh, it is. It's just locked me up. Here, I'm gonna have to take that back. Here. I think we're. I think I'm good without that. Good so, cosmoquest.org slash x slash explore. That mm. is uh, announcement new feature number one. So we'll be getting that into the menu soon. At some point, <laughs> <Very> <laughs> it'll probably be under educate in the. Um, it will be on the on the main and menu. I'll, okay, good. That was a question I had. I'll add it out. there the next time I'm on break. Okay, because okay. I can do that too. But oh yeah, that works. Okay, next time I'm I'm, I'm not on camera. <laughs> and don't forget CosmoAcademy.org as well. Cosmo Academy. Cosmo Academy. To the Cosmo Academy. Gotta put one more plug for that before I sign off. Yay! Thank you for joining nice. us, Doctor Mister Francis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never gonna not call you that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nicole Gugliucci. Dr. 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 Ms. Gugliucci. Dr. Ms. Gugliucci. Except yeah. that's not my initials. <laughs> it's all good. Oh. Let's call you noisy. Noisy, noisy works. I, I respond to that. Good. It's okay. It's totally cool. All right. So that. Uh, so thank you again. So are we ready right, to you're welcome. transition yeah. to one o'clock, one central, anyway, segment? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Georgia, we Thank got. Thank you. Thanks, Georgia. Yay. We did that. I don't hit my head on it. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so, some of you may remember an incident last year called the making of the planet pops. They were delicious. During which I demonstrated before a live studio audience that I suck at baking. Now, we, we had the original planned intent of me replicating that experience and hopefully being more successful this year. And then reality struck, otherwise known as me looking at my kitchen, looking at my camera, looking at my kitchen, looking at my camera, and going, no. <laughs> but here is a promise I will make to you. If we hit $5,000 in donations during this hour, and we're currently well over 4,000, so this is entirely doable, but it's up to you. If we can hit $5,000 in donations during this segment, 
on Monday, when I'm still good and sleep deprived, either prior to recording Astronomy Cast or after, I will make cake pops. Yes! I'm live, it over. Live on the internet. <laughs> so, if you want to watch me fail to bake, yet again, Donate so that we hit the $5,000 mark during this hour. And if you're a company, or you own a company, or you own a small business, some people prefer to be called businesses, I don't care, and you want to pledge, I will count the pledges in towards this $5,000 goal. If you want to watch me suffer making cake pops live on the internet on Monday while sleep deprived, Oh my gosh. I'm going to have to This over. face is looking dubious. <laughs> I'm a really good cook. I'm a really sucky baker. Um, Nicole can testify. Do you know how to cook? I, I do. Really yes. Well. You're a really good cook. I'm not to be trusted with baked goods. Because it involves chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little yeah. bit more exacting. So I, I will make cake pops if you hit the donation point of $5,000 during this hour. Now what I do know how to do is send my husband to Walgreens to buy Oreo cookies. And I kid you not, that is exactly what happened this morning. Thank you, Kyle, if you're watching. I suspect he's downstairs working. Nancy Graziano cars. is familiar with this segment because she helped me do this for, what, 100 people at uh, Geek Girl Con last year. And had a lot of Oreos. And, <laughs> and at Dragon Con, I kid you not, the folks from uh, Death by Puppets bought me a few thousand Oreo cookies. We did an estimation of how many Oreo cookies there are per container. How many people would fit in the Crystal Ballroom at the Hilton Marriott? No, at the Hilton at Dragon Con in Atlanta. And then we bought enough cookies for everyone to participate. So and then I have. Some. I think I think there was an order of magnitude mistake there. Because no, we, we did. We didn't have a full room. Oh, okay. <laughs> so so we had two fail for the wins that occurred. One was. We bought enough cookies so that if we had a completely full room, everyone could get cookies. And we didn't have a completely full room, so we had extra cookies, and I'm okay with that. So, so we're going to do a variety of different demos. And I'll point out, it's 1 p.m. here. We both ate breakfast a long time ago. Food needs to be figured out. Hasn't been figured out yet. We actually forgot about lunch. We have donuts. We have donuts. <laughs> um, I'm going to switch cameras so that Nicole's in focus too. Actually, if you lean in, I think we'll both be in focus. Why are you out of... There's sludge on the camera. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> Lost it. Lost it. Uh, while she's doing... She's, she, are you using the squirrel to clean the camera? <laughs> I'm using oh the squirrel to clean... But, but, but you're now in focus. Because squirrel attacked. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Just the new content area looks great. Uh, and Guido points out, if I had a lot of money, I'd buy all the Cosmo Quest classes and then give them away to people like me who are interested. That's really sweet. And I rotated the camera. Recentering. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> hey, squirrels Squirrels love science, and they're willing to sacrifice their clean bellies to make sure that we're both in focus. I don't even. Okay, I Oreo can't. cookies. Science with Oreo cookies. Any moment can be a teachable moment if you have the creativity to think outside of the box. And in this case, by outside of the box, I mean taking an Oreo cookie outside of, they don't really come in boxes anymore, but play with me. I've got an Oreo cookie. The Oreo cookie is the new moon. There's no visibly illuminated part of the moon. So this is the case of, oh, I can use donuts. <laughs> I just realized I've had too much caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you guys are all on the planet Earth, and this represents the sun. In those moments where we have the moon directly above the Earth, sorry, directly above the sun, line of sight. So you guys are the Earth. The moon's actually way over here. Oh, okay, okay. So you guys are the Earth. You're looking at the moon. 
here's the sun, the moon is currently illuminating the other side, the moon is currently having its other side illuminated by the sun. So Nicole is getting us a moon. Yeah, so here's the illuminated side. <laughs> it's facing. It's being lit up. It's not really cream, it's light. <laughs> it's being lit up by the donut sun. Now, the moon comes in multiple phases. Whoa, I just broke the moon in half. Okay, getting a new moon. I shall eat the broken moons later. Ah! I broke another. Oh my god, we're having Oreo fail. How, how do we have so many structurally Oreo horrible moons? My mark. Damn it. Well, if. Ish. <laughs> okay, I now have a gibbous moon. <laughs> so, in this case, I have a moon that is mostly but not entirely illuminated. So, in this case, the sun is behind you. So, the sun is like, here's the sun. Sun is way over here somewhere. You guys are still the planet Earth. Here's the moon. Now, if you guys are doing angles in my head, if you guys are the Earth, the sun is over here. We're going to call that not quite 90 degrees because if it was 90 degrees, it would be off the edge of your field of view. We're not quite off your edge of field of view. So we have Earth, Sun, Moon. If it was a full moon, the moon would be over here getting illuminated. Okay, so the sun would be there <laughs> on the other side. Well, no, no, no. So if we have, there's the Earth. Yeah. Then this is 180 degrees off of this. Okay. Oh, I see. I think I see what you're trying to get at. Yeah, so, so this is actually really, really hard to do if you guys are the Earth. So I need to move the Earth. And that's okay because we have more donuts. So. Oh, your fingers are going to get sticky. Yeah. <laughs> Sun. Earth. So if we had a full moon, we do. So here's my full moon, fully illuminated moon. The moon is over here. So sun's light is illuminating the earth, chocolate donut, and the moon is not directly behind the earth, because if the moon was directly behind the earth, we'd have a lunar eclipse, which happened last week. But still, moon generally orbits on a tilted orbit so that it is above the earth or below the earth, allowing us to see a full moon. Full moon. Now, the thing is, the moon is orbiting. And as the moon orbits, it becomes less and less illuminated. So when it's over here, ah, I broke another moon. Here's, here's my gibbous. So it's slowly as it comes this way, what we're able to see becomes less. Now, the same amount of the moon stays illuminated the entire time. But what we're able to see of that illumination gets less. So over here somewhere that's not on a straight line, straight line, over here somewhere, I'm showing this on a two-dimensional screen, so this probably kind of sucks. Um, Get your donuts and Oreos and do it with us. It's less <laughs> illuminated. <laughs> now the thing is, as it continues to orbit, normally I tell you to now eat off half the frosting, but my cookie is far more to <laughs> Are you eating the earth? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my cookie broke in half, so yeah, I can eat half the frosting off of that one. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to make a third quarter moon. This means that when I look at the moon, half of it is still illuminated. I don't want to know what the comments say yet. How many strawberries is a cheek to illuminate the moon? <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> okay, so so. Half of the moon is still illuminated. That remains true. But we can only see half of the half that's illuminated. So I'm going to cut off the half that we don't see. While the giant space monster eats the planet Earth. Oh. Oh, I'm going to make it just down. It is breaking. <laughs> I use this with the scraping of the teeth. I the tried teeth. that. Oh. I failed. I broke the cookie instead. OK. So we have structurally unsound Oreos. This is the half of the half of the moon that's illuminated that we're able to see. 
So if, like me, you are perpetu perpetually perplexed that when you look at the moon and you see half of the moon that you see illuminated, remember, you only see half of the moon. And the reason that when it, you only see half of what we see of the moon illuminated is called a quarter moon is because we only see half of the moon and only half of that half is illuminated. That makes a quarter moon. So you go from you got that? holding pieces of Oreo together. You go from full moon when it's sun, earth. The earth is getting smaller every moment. Sun, earth, moon. <laughs> <laughs> to over here, you still have half the moon illuminated, but you only see the half that's pointed. So there's the part that's illuminated. You only see the half that's pointed towards the sun illuminated. Now, when... That's why I'm usually a healthy person. So when the moon gets all the way over here, we need an earth. Sorry. <laughs> sun moon, earth, half the moon is still illuminated. In this case, it's the entirety of the part that's towards the sun. We don't see any of what's illuminated. So what we see is nothing. This is your chance to eat off all the frosting. As the moon continues to orbit around, we now have the moon over here. Half the moon is still illuminated. So in this case, we have we can only see half the moon, and the half that's illuminated is the half that's facing towards the sun. Always the part that's facing towards the sun. This is first quarter. So we go new moon, don't see anything, first quarter, full moon, full moon. The earth is getting radically smaller. It should be a lot smaller than the sun. That's well, why. that's true. I'm but eating the donut for accuracy. It's now getting closer to the size of the moon. Okay. Over here, we still have half of the, the moon that's illuminated. It's the half that's towards the sun. So there's the illumination. There it is facing the sun. Now, normally when you teach this, you have Oreo cookies that are more structurally sound than the bag that came from Walgreens. Walgreens is someplace we go frequently, but they're good for many things, apparently not for providing structure. It may not be Walgreens as well. It may be kind of small. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, so I have a full moon. So Yeah, just do the phases part. So you can go from full moon to scraping off just a little bit. And I've never figured out how to get gibbous moon with my teeth. So I'm scraping off with my thumbnail just a little bit. So at this point, I have a wanning gibbous moon because it's getting smaller. Then... As it continues to orbit and loses structural oh my integrity, God. I, I, I am. We do not have a single good Oreo. Yes, I did just eat Michigan. Thank you. <laughs> we need funding, fund research program to make a stronger Oreo. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Galactus! Thank you, Chris. The moon so, is not made of green cheese, but Oreos. So I now have. An almost quarter moon, which is when half of the sucker is illuminated. I'm now going to make I now have a crescent moon. So that's when it's starting to get closer to the sun over here. And new moon with clouds. <laughs> Yeah, so it's the going through the phases, and so if you're if you're doing an activity with particularly really small children, like preschool age kids, doing the whole geometry isn't a good place to start. But just showing them the phases and teaching them that the moon does change its shape in the sky every night if they go out and look at the moon, you can just have them eat the bits of cream to show what the phases look like and have them look at, look out every night and and track that difference. So just shapes and differences. <laughs> And patterns is something interesting that you want to show to preschool kids. So the next thing that we're going to do, and I'm really kind of disturbed by my inability to do food demonstrations without destroying the food. This is two years in a row. I thought I found a safe demo to not destroy. I was wrong, but at least it tastes really good. So... I need water now. <laughs> So now I'm going to 
try and find a slightly more sound cookie because plate tectonics is not fine. Um, our planet has a very hot center, unlike this Oreo cookie. Um, and when a planet has a very hot center, as it rotates, you end up with differential rotation. That means different parts of the planet are rotating at different speeds, so we have a rotating core, lots of charged particles, all sorts of stuff going on. That is the realm of geophysics, which is awesome. The part I like about all of this is this rotating hot stuff generates the Earth's magnetic field, which means we are alive. Yay. Without a magnetic field, we'd be getting bombarded with cosmic rays, with gamma rays, with, with all sorts of deadly, awful particles. And we'd get cancer much more readily, and other bad things would occur. Um, so anyways, planet, liquid core, awesomeness. Now, one of the side effects that's not so safe for humanity of having this liquid core is the surface of the planet, the plates that make up the part of the planet we're standing on and that our ocean is up on top of, those plates are moving. Um, a few weeks ago, a uh, part of Chile decided it needed to go north. And as things move, we end up with earthquakes. As things diverge, we end up with places where that molten core leaks. Well, it's not actually the core that's leaking. It's, it's the pockets of liquid that's lower down that's leaking. Um, and we end up with volcanism. All sorts of awesomeness occurs. And you can actually use the Oreo cookie to teach plate tectonics because that squishy white stuff in the center, that acts in the same way that the molten stuff acts as a lubricant to allow the plates to move. So one thing to think about is the liquid rock, the molten rock, all of that is a lubricant on which um, Essentially, the plates act more like hydraulics than like boats. So let's start with the, the first example, which is just a plate sliding along quite happily. Now, if you hold the base of your cookie firmly and you gently, gently, gently push just the top cookie, you'll find that it doesn't slide neatly. If, if you were able to see, and I'm going to try and switch cameras and get Oreo cookie all over all the things. Um, we're on this one. So I'm going to try and zoom in so that you can see this better. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Okay, so that's as far as I can zoom. So if you have your cookie and you grip the bottom one firmly and you press the top one, you're going to find that it tends to move and jumps. That moving and jumps that's a sliding of a plate. And the way it jumps, that's what we call earthquakes. Now, there are cases of slow motion. Currently, Tokyo is undergoing multiple centimeters over, um, I think, less than a year. It's had multiple centimeters of back and forth, uh, large term waves undergoing as it's, well, people are afraid it's getting ready for a giant earthquake to occur. There's motions currently going on all over the world. Most of the motions short and fast. We call these earthquakes. Sometimes they're slower, what Tokyo is currently experiencing. It's never a smooth process. So that sliding plate, we call this liquid that it's sliding across. I have to look at the word because otherwise I, I'm hopeless. It's asthenosphere. That's the, the liquid rock that acts like a lubricant. I finally got a cookie apart. I feel the need to say this is also the full moon, and now it's half the moon. Okay. So plate tectonics, lunar phases. Plates don't just slide, though. Sometimes you end up with cases of a divergent boundary. So in this case, you want to break the top cookie. So I've managed to break mine in many places. And as the plates slide apart, you can see the stuff in between, especially if you apply pressure as you're pulling them apart. This is a divergent boundary between the plates. At a divergent boundary, well, it's not like the ocean's just going to leak down to the core of the planet. At a divergent boundary, you get a chance for all of the stuff in that athenosphere, all of that liquid lubricated rock, to 
come back up. Um, an example of a place that this is happening on planet Earth is the mid-ocean trench between the east coast of the Americas and the west coast of Europe and the UK. That mid-ocean trench is filled with volcanism. It's a place where life is able to exist without any sunlight. Um, it's a place where everything lives off of the chemicals coming out um, from the asthenosphere. And it's a place where you get new land forming at a rate that uh, one neat stat I learned was it's the same rate of divergence as the rate at which your fingernails grow. So this is a diverging plate. I shall eat it later. Maybe. We're now starting to get the ridiculous number of Oreos up here. Um, <laughs> the carnage! Does not feel the same. That's a whole cookie. Why am I now finding whole cookies? Okay, so here's a cookie that it has been pre, it's had a hard life. So we also end up with plates that instead of diverging, they fall onto my keyboard. Um, in this case, I have, and this is easier to see side on. I have one plate sliding over the other plate. That is a convergent plate boundary. Where we get convergent plate boundaries, and I'm going to walk up to the camera so you can see this a little bit better. You can see that where the plates converge, the one plate slides up on top of the other plate. We get convergent plate boundaries places like the Himalaya Mountains. The Himalayas are the youngest mountain range on the planet Earth. This is where we have two different plates coming together and weather, erosion, gravity, all those things that are constantly flattening mountains just haven't had enough time to, well, flatten the Himalayas. So when you look at the Rockies, when you look at the Urals, when you look at the Caucasus, when you look at all of these massive mountain ranges around the world, um, they get worn down over time. So the White Mountains on the east coast of America are from what I remember, uh, are actually much older than the Rocky Mountains. And you see this in the variations in the geology of the two different mountain sets. So here I have my convergent plate boundary, less leaking of the asthenosphere. I'm an astronomer, not a planetary scientist. That's all I have to say on my inability to pronounce that one particular word. So the next thing that we have is basically the case of California. So in California, we have this unfortunate problem where Baja would much rather go to Alaska. So we have two plates, and I'm trying to break just the top cookie. Okay. So I have two plates, and one of them is trying to move sideways relative to the other. This is a transform plate boundary. So you can see the one plate slid relative to the other plate. So when you have the transform plate boundaries, this is the case where you get sliding earthquakes, you get fault lines like the San Andreas Fault, and as they slip and slide, well you can see where these two plates come together. Let me get closer to the camera. It's not exactly a smooth line. Well the plate, plate boundaries on the planet Earth aren't exactly smooth lines either. And where the two plates slide along each other, as they go, they build up energy, build up energy, and then move in bursts as they break through the frictional layers um, and jig and jog, and we end up with horrible earthquakes. Just like it breaks up the Oreo cookies, it breaks up the planet. We're constantly reforming our world. And what's kind of awesome is plate tectonics the physics is the same on every planet, but the nature of every planet is slightly different. Here on the planet Earth, our core is still molten because we're still cooling, and our planet is actually still hot because, well, we've built up a lot of radiation um, energy from, well, things decay. Our planet has radiation constantly being given off. This is where radon comes from. Uranium undergoes nuclear decay, plutonium, thorium, all of these different things found in the Earth's crust. As they decay, they give off heat that gets built up inside the planet, keeps the planet warm. We have moving plates. Mars has cooled off already. It's a much smaller world. It doesn't have moving plates. Venus decided it wanted to be weird. 
and as near as we can tell with Venus, the entire planet just periodically resurfaces itself. So you can't teach about Venus's plate tectonics with cookies, and you certainly can't uh, teach about Mars, because, well, neither one particularly has plates going. Okay, so I have to embarrass my husband and make him come on camera for a moment, because apparently he heard us saying that we forgot about food, and I'm going to move <laughs> my thing of moons, because he Cookie just carnage. brought up an awesome thing of food. Cookie carnage. Yay! Okay, apparently that is as much of my husband as we're going to be able to see on camera. <laughs> so he just brought us... <gasps> There's hummus! <gasps> oh my god. <laughs> so we have hummus, olives, and it's red pepper hummus. It's my favorite. Um, pita chips and carrots. Um, so apparently we don't need to subsist on donuts and Oreo cookies. Um, although I think both of us would have, but this is much better for us. Yes. Um, so now you know something you never knew about the planets. And what's awesome about this is they make Oreo snack packs. You can turn any bad lunch into a teachable moment by getting Oreo snack packs. And this actually works with any cookie that's filled with stuff. You can do this with ice cream cookies. That's like seriously Just messy. Just do it quickly. Yeah, <laughs> do it quickly or do it on a really cold day outside. Um, you can turn any time you have two cookies separated by squishy middle. Um, heck, I can do this with pita chips and hummus. Um, there's so many ways you can do this. You can turn almost any moment into a teachable moment. Teach people about plate tectonics. And while the Moon, Mars, and Mercury don't have the same active... Well, well recursive. Oh, sorry. Don't have the same active plate tectonics that we have here on Earth, they do have different things that have happened on their surfaces. So what you see on Mars is you have places where the planet has slumped down and you see vast valleys. So there's Valles Mar Marinaris. I always make it sound like an Italian food. Um, one of the theories for what caused that region is that as all the volcanoes went off, there had been a magma area underneath, and that part of the planet actually slumped, and water cutting through it just added to all of the how that got formed. So when we look at the moon, we see a, a variety of different places where different plates, as it cooled, um, went from being flat to having ridges and ravines. We even see fault lines and what are called graben on Vesta as we look at it. So this sort of formation of surface features happens on every rocky world. And you can turn every Oreo cookie into a teachable moment. So judging by your giggling, we've been getting some pretty good comments going on. No? Yes. Um, no, I was switching, switching on something else. Um, uh, I was actually finding the uh, post that I wrote last year in October um, around the time of Geek Girl Kong when they did the Edible Science panel. So I just tweeted that link out from Lazy Astronomer. Um, if someone is controlling CosmoQuest Twitter, can they retweet? <laughs> I don't know who's in charge of that at the moment. Um, uh, it's Edible Astronomy at Geek Girl Con, or if you go to the CosmoQuest blog and search for Geek Girl Con, um, I listed uh, some of the different uh, activities that we did on the panel that involve food and astronomy. Um, most of it's planetary science. Actually, I think it's all pretty much planetary science. Um, ones that we did at the panel and other ones that um, were done. Another one that was done at the Do-It-Yourself Science Zone, which will be returning to Geek Girl Con this year. Uh, and then one more that I couldn't uh, actually pull off, um, but you can pull up at home. So there's the Oreo moon phases and Oreo plate tectonics at the top, just using Oreos to show those different things. Um, you can make regolith, which is the, the uh, surface layer of the moon, is this stuff called regolith, and you can simulate its formation from impacts with graham crackers and slightly stale powdered donuts. <laughs> There's actually like a time, a, a, an optimal time for doing that. Um, it was the entire edible solar system scale model, which is uh, one of my favorite activities to do um, with Dark Skies Bright Kids. We had a pumpkin as the sun, and then we uh, found other food items that, if uh, the pumpkin is the sun, 
that were um, to scale what the planet sizes would be. So with a certain size pumpkin, you have, uh, I think, oranges for, for Jupiter. There were plums involved. There were teeny tiny nerd candies for Earth and Venus. Um, by the time you get to the dwarf planets, you're using grits, and the kids are like, why are we picking up grits out of a bowl? Because that's how tiny that dwarf planet would be next to the sun. Um, and then we would spread it out on a, a track outside and actually do the scale distances as well, so the kids could start at the sun and walk all the way out to the different planets. So that's edible um, and, and uh, with various levels of healthiness in that model um, that you can use to show the, the scale of the solar system. Uh, Touchdown is, is a NASA activity we did during our Terra Luna workshop, which you'll hear a little bit about Terra Luna later, um, where you use uh, various cups and straws and marshmallows to design a lander uh, that astronauts, your, your marshmallow astronauts, could survive a landing on the moon. So it is not completely edible, but it does involve marshmallows, so I decided to include that one as well, although I don't even think we got a chance to do that at the panel. We, um, we were having too much fun with the Oreos and the regolith. Um, you can make craters, of course, with the flour and cocoa powder demo that we use all the time. And although that's technically food, you don't want to sit there and eat flour. It's not quite, we haven't quite figured out what to do with the leftover flour. And it does make the powder students bags. smell like brownies. Yes, everything smells like brownies. Um, and then the edible comet, which is super fun because you have uh, ice cream, especially if you have, you can crush up Oreo cookies to make that like the rocky stuff in the comet, or you can just get cookies and cream ice cream um, and uh, scoop that out, make a whipped cream tail, and because we're super dorks, we bring liquid nitrogen along. And, and pour it over, and it would make a crust um, and then freeze the, um, the whipped cream as well. So that you can make an edible comet demo demonstration. Uh, that's just for fun, and look, it's a comet, and then you eat it. Uh, so all those things can be found on that particular post from October, all those links with a, a fantastic picture from the Dark Skies Bright Kids group, um, kids making that, that crater and uh, getting photography of the flower going everywhere. And, and I'm happy to share that we just got word from Phoenix that um, Cosmo Academy has been fixed. You can now go register for the asteroids class that is available. Um, they just scrolled off the screen above me. Um, so if you'd like to sign up to take a class on asteroids with Sandy, um, how do you say her last name? Springman? Yes. Sandy Springman. I can say that one, I just can't spell it. There's okay. like an extra N somewhere. <laughs> so if you'd like to take uh, that class with uh, Sandy Springman. Is that, is that link working? I had an email saying that link wasn't quite working. Oh, yeah. Which computer is it? It's this one. Okay. <laughs> Which computer is it? <laughs> we, we told you that was going to be a constant question. Okay, so that changes that. And then if you click on that, it goes through. Yes. Or open for registration, and then if you click open today, today, that's the link that was broken, and now at the cart, yeah, that all goes. Yeah, so now everything's up and working. And it's since it's just seven in stock, that means someone's already signed up. Ooh. So that was a quick sign up. Thank you so <laughs> much for the quick quick sign up. Um, whoever did that is absolutely awesome. So at the beginning of, I'm on the wrong screen, um, something else we said would be said a lot. So at the beginning of this segment, I said that should we make it over $5,000 during this hour, I would cook planets live. Now I'm having, I confused my computer, so I'm now opening Chrome back up to unconfuse my computer. <laughs> And I will check the amount. So here is this hour's challenge. This is our first promise, pledge, extra thing of the day if we hit a target. There will be giveaways given out throughout the, the Hangoutathon, and we're going to start getting one of those, I think, in the next hour. Um, um, the first challenge is, should we hit $5,000 during this hour, I will make Planet Pops live to a studio audience. <laughs> and Joe is giggling over here now. Yeah, everyone here knows that I am fail at baking. 
I can cook. I can cook very spicy food. We are at $4,987.93. So if someone can donate 20 bucks, it will put us over, and I'm going to be forced to make Planet Pops live on air. So we, we're only halfway through, well, no, we're 40 minutes through this hour. So I'm trying to figure out what can you make me make if we make $5,500 this hour. I have to help. Yes, <laughs> she has to help. I'm an even worse baker than her. I let Jim do all the baking. Oh, yeah. Oh, Jim, those, those really gorgeous cupcakes, Jim makes those, yeah. I, 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 again, I can cook, I can't bake. So I will help. I mean, you saw my uh, low wallet attempt. I will help <laughs> if we reach the new goal of 5,500. Okay, 5,500. So, we will have Pamela, it looks like, but if you want me to make an idiot of myself in the kitchen. <laughs> in the and, and we will feed them to Tiny Intern. That works. So, so uh, for those of you just tuning in, we have an intern working on our project. Her name is Tiny Intern, at Tiny Intern on Twitter. Oh, she's is big! She's currently downstairs getting ready to go to prom tonight, <laughs> which is really kind of awesome. So she's going to come up here in her prom dress later. She's also been helping you in social media. She came on air earlier to make wallets. Um, so yeah, tiny intern. Um, it's this big. And um, someone tinier than me on this project. We, we, will, we will make her eat cake pops in order to grow tiny intern. Um, yeah. <laughs> I like how Joe is just hearing this and laughing. Ah ha! Uh, no, I'm not. I'm listening to live. Oh, you are. Okay. That's my. <laughs> so, so Joe, our main programmer, is now over in the corner. He is awesome. Um, well, we had an obligatory "That's No Moon" comment from Jim Meeker. Thank you, Jim. I was ignoring that as hard as I can. Shut up. <laughs> So the voice in the corner is is Joe Moore. He is our HTML5 ninja. He is the one who's responsible for making sure that all of our citizen <laughs> science projects work. Why are you dying of laughter? Wait, who said this? Tom again. Uh, Tom Nathan. Eris and Celine play with the solar system. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we destroyed the solar system. Yay. Eris means discord. And, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've been reading. I've been. I've been reading some Wonder Woman comics, so I had to like go through that, <laughs> look through all that too. Uh, yeah. Oh, and people waving a donut around reminds me of topology class. That that is. We true. want to Mr. know Martin. more. Oh, did you guys know that the, the universe is a four-dimensional hyper donut? We have a donut. See, that's what that's what I meant, right? Yes. Okay. It took me a moment. I went to topography as in geology. Oh, that kind of topography. I was very confused for a moment. Hi, Joe. I don't want to know. Joe Steel. is hovering. <laughs> There's another display arm. All right. <laughs> so, so here is a donut. We live in a universe that parallel lines stay forever parallel. It's flat. And only certain geometries allow parallel lines to stay parallel. A nice Euclidean universe of, of like your box shaped shaped universe, it can have flat lines. Not flat, it can have parallel lines. A spherical universe in four dimensions. So go beyond three dimensions into four. Parallel lines eventually come together. If you have a saddle shaped universe in four dimensions, parallel lines diverge as they, they go up the seat and back of the saddle and down the, the leg flaps of the saddle. Donuts, which were not a shape any of us learned when we took Astro 101 before my age, are not on the list of allowed geometries of the universe. The allowed geometries of the universe are a sphere, a saddle, and a box. So you have flat for the box, closed for the sphere, open for the saddle. Unfortunately, then there's this little discovery called dark energy that kind of destroyed many things, including how easy the math used to be, which wasn't particularly easy, but then it got worse. So the problem is, we live in a universe with a closed geometry. The sphere is a closed geometry. It's a closed shape. But parallel lines stay parallel. They don't converge the way they do on the sphere. Pretty much the only closed shape that rationally allows parallel lines to stay parallel while being enclosed is a toroid, otherwise known as a donut. 
So when you look at the donut, you can imagine two parallel lines on the surface of the donut staying parallel. You can imagine two parallel lines going up and over, staying parallel. You can even do this at funky angles. Parallel lines on the surface of the donut, because donut is three dimensions, parallel lines on the surface of the donut stay parallel no matter how you draw them. Now the catch is we, we don't live on the surface of a three-dimensional donut. We live on the surface of a four-dimensional hypertoroid or four-dimensional hyperdonut. <laughs> Joe is giggling. It's just, it's just awesome. <laughs> Computer science. <laughs> um, so if we hit $5,500 this hour, I will make donuts. How's okay. that sound? I thought I was going to help. You're going to help. Okay. But if we're making two things, we can make two people, we're right. going to make donuts and planets. Whee! Oh, okay. We're over 5K. We're now aiming for $5,500 this hour. And if we hit $5,500, I will make donuts. And together, we will make planets. And, and I'm taking full responsibility for the, the donuts because I know my stovetop. And I know how hard it is to keep the oil the right temperature. Uh, yes. I like you. I'm not going to splatter you with Yay. cooking oil. It's I can do that all on my own. Uh, Tatiana Vasilevska, I think I got it right this time, uh, says, Pamela should dye your hair blonde if we hit 8,000. <laughs> <laughs> No, okay. So I don't think we're gonna have any this is a thirty six hour hangout. Right. If we hit fifty thousand dollars, I will dye my hair and my eyebrows, goddammit. My hair and my eyebrows blonde. If we hit fifty thousand dollars by ten PM tomorrow. Ten PM Central Time tomorrow. Because <laughs> I really want to see this. <laughs> so, someone tweet that to hold me accountable. And then somebody else Photoshop her with blonde hair. <laughs> oh, God. How long does she have to keep it? Joe is asking the question, how long do I have to keep it blonde? I don't know. Tweet suggestions. <laughs> Thank you, Tatiana. It's for science. I'm not cutting my hair. That That's just a whole land of pain. I will dye my hair for science if we hit $50,000 by 10 p.m. tomorrow. That is my pledge to you. Said in a very sad voice of hoping that we hit it, but because reasons. Okay. Science. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm, I'm, uh, what do we have on the Q&A app? Uh, well, that was one of them. <laughs> You show you want me to keep reading? Mm -hmm. um, oh, gosh. Uh, Nancy says, all this edible astronomy is making it difficult to stay on my diet today. This is why I said, yes, I usually eat much healthier than this. <sighs> I also uh, walk a bit more, so my Fitbit numbers are really good at taking diet well. But we're doing great things for my husband. So since we're in the attic, the poor guy is up and down the stairs. So we're actually going to be giving you reports of how many flights of stairs he has done <laughs> based on his... <laughs> His, uh, his We're up to at least, I think, camera. 16 flights of stairs. Really? Already? Mm hmm Okay. Um, yeah, because we have no control over the comments, I am like, wow, 40 donuts. Uh, waiting for California to fall off the cookie. That was a while ago. Uh, <laughs> the next Nobel dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Oh Use donuts to create teachable moments. Face donuts! Um, uh, keeping it blonde through Dragon Con. Oh, Richard wants me to keep it blonde through Dragon Con. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> this just stopped being safe for work. <laughs> okay. Um, I will keep it blonde through Balticon. Okay. Which is a month from now. Yeah. I think it's a month. How much to dye it red? She does that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she does it red anyway. Yeah. I, it, yeah. Use the hummus to explain a loosely bound asteroid. We like the furniture. <laughs> no, I like the furniture and don't want to get the hummus on it. That's the. <laughs> 
Um, and we need some milk with our solar system. We do. No, not you. Well, I could do almond milk. So we're at 5,214. We have 13 minutes to raise $300 if you want to see us make donuts that represent the shape of the universe. And you get to see me make an idiot of myself in the kitchen. So the next thing we were going to do is, is we, we've just demonstrated some really nerdy things. And like so many people, we get our ideas for food-related things from Pinterest. And Nicole is very much the, the Pinterest guru yeah. on our team. I do it you now again. better than I do. Okay. <laughs> I don't use it as much as my, 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 boyfriend, my boyfriend actually makes bookmarks recipes. Um, so yeah, we have a Pinterest board. Let me see if I can get the new tab up and get it on the other screen. And I'll work on being able to actually screen share it so that it's not looking quite as squirrel interrupted. Well, it's more that the screen is kind of just... And, and I'm going to mock our engineer for a moment. Joe, the AC will work better if you close the windows. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so do you want to do Educator Zone? Or? Yeah, let's do Educator Zone and Pinterest both. Okay. So first, Educator Zone, um, which we talked about before, but I will actually show you briefly. Um, that is the part of the website where you can get resources, educator resources, um, uh, demos, it's where the learning space homepage is now hosted. There it is. We, we are at $5,946. What do we do if we hit, we have 10 minutes left, a new challenge. What do we do if we hit $6,500? A lot. I barely have baked now. now. <laughs> what do you want us to cook, Jeff? We broke the programmer. No, I mean, my mind goes to steak, but... <laughs> How do you make steak spacey? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think they're all donating because they want to see the vlog. Yeah, that's probably true. Okay, so we're going to stop adding to the this hour. If we hit... 50,000 50, by the end of, of the 36-hour hangout of Vaughn, I go blonde until Balticon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the educator zone, which has nothing to do with air dye, uh, surprisingly. Um, this is the part of the website you go under uh, educate from the top the top bar of Cosmo Quest and Educator Zone right there. That um, lists our lesson plans over on the side. So Carol Luna. I think we have a short segment dedicated to that a little later on, which is about uh, our lesson plan about the moon. Cosmic Castaways has its own lesson plan. Uh, astronomy versus Astrology is one that Pamela wrote. Uh, yeah, in flies water. Hmm? Flies water. Flies water? I have a wasp to kill. No. Ask Kyle. Okay. <laughs> we, we collect dead flying objects up here, apparently. Investigate, uh, which is uh, currently in the last phases of NASA product review and has a workshop coming up uh, in June, which we've gotten a lot of wonderful applications for from teachers, uh, is now listed there. And uh, learning space and other resources from our education partners. These all live on the educator zone. We also have a blog that is occasionally updated with New resources. Uh, we did an episode of Learning Space about all of the interesting mobile apps for astronomy. You guys sent in lots of really great suggestions for mobile apps for iOS and for Android, as well as a few apps that were more uh, computer browser based, which we thought were so cool we had to include them anyway. Um, <clears throat> we've and we've done uh, the Cupcake Geology, which is another fun food one, which I, I mentioned before. Uh, we've talked some about NASA Wavelength, which is a, an educational resource for teachers. You can go to all the different Get all the all the NASA educational resources in one easily searchable, really, really wonderful site, um, which they've provided for use. Um, so you can hear about all those things in the educator zone. Now, what I will be blogging about soon is a Pinterest board that I started um, using the CosmoQuest Pinterest account, which did not get much use, I will be honest. Um, but uh, we decided to try and curate some some of these CC craft activities that we've been uh, talking about. Oh, excellent. You've got it on there. Yeah. Um, um, screen share. Moment. 
pretty sweet. So we've got a couple different boards, and the one we're currently working on is called Making Science. Um, and I've uh, tried to, I've gotten some really great suggestions from our friends over at Mad Art Lab. Uh, in fact, I think we're going to try and get them into this project as well. I just started this week in, in curating all of these fun astronomy type things that you can make. Um, think about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so you want to click on the Making Science board? Which one is it? All the way on the right. Okay. The one with the constellation. Um, so I've started curating. Oh, I'm on the right. You're in the wrong <laughs> <laughs> No. Okay, there we go. There we go. So you can see some. Uh, oh, and Georgia's added a bunch more new ones. Um, you can see some of the things that could be made, uh, including star wheels. You have. Um, there's the moon Oreo again. That's a really nice one, actually. Um, there is a, a cheese, tr a planetary cheese tray, which someone pointed out was on Mad Art Lab, so I had to include that one. Uh, and uh, there's um, a, a really pretty constellation shawl that I would love to make, but I don't know if my knitting skills are quite up to to, to, to handle that one. Uh, so we're trying to collect a lot of these ideas, although we won't be able to go through a lot of them in the hangout at all. We're hoping to build one or two. I think the, the space wall is going to have to go in there at some point. Um, we will be collecting those and putting it on the Pinterest board and uh, blogging about that on Educator Zone because this is really cool for education, especially informal education, after school clubs, things like that. I can't. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, what do you want me to click on? <laughs> uh, just scroll down a bit so you can show some more of the things that we can. There's the oh. amazing Jupiter Planet Cake, uh, Planet Pops. Oh, we have science, uh, Mad Art Lab paper, Scientist Paper Dolls. Yes. Uh, which anyone can make. You print out these cool paper dolls and you can color them and, and have a good time with that. And the uh, the bleach shirt, I think we are actually doing. Awesome. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, and I put my boyfriend's dragon eggs on there because dragon eggs. <laughs> I don't <laughs> yeah. know if that has the instructions. And those uh, constellation wall oh, arts bits, uh, which I really want to make. Yeah. Yeah, that I want to do. Your, uh, hey, shush. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There are men on the other side of the wall hunting a wasp. It's gone. <laughs> okay, I've heard the wasp is now gone. Um, we yeah, love you, I totally Joe. That. I totally want to make that. <clears throat> and I like the, the little horse, the rocket pack. Yeah, that looks awesome. And that's not just for kids. I totally want to make that for myself. In their pin for that. Yay. Yay. Look at that kid. He's the coolest kid ever. This one. I was sad. It was too late. <laughs> What? Joe has appeared with a Nerf gun. I'm not sure why. Okay. No, this is Kyle's uh, fly killer. Oh. I don't want to know. <laughs> it, it, it fires salt. What? It, it's, it's like shot. It's salt, and it kills flies without creating a squishy mess. Okay. I learn new things every day. <laughs> okay. Unscreen share. Unscreen share. <laughs> I've gone fiddly. <laughs> I've officially gone fiddly. So those are some of the ways in which we, we get artsy and craftsy uh, as well. Um, hey, stop shooting things! <laughs> we get arts and crafty as well with our hair, with our, our duct tape wallets, with our rooms and our houses and all of that stuff. And for those of you who don't know, wow, we made a lot of Oreo masks. <laughs> um, our next segment we are featuring Phil Plate, the Sirens, uh, that's S-C-I-R-E-N-S, -E which is a bunch of really amazing women who are helping promote science through social media while working in real media, uh, or I guess old media, I'm not quite sure what the correct <laughs> term is, um, as well as Kyle from Scientific American. They are all getting ready in the green room to join us, and we have some amazing giveaways that don't involve dyeing my hair coming in the next hour. <laughs> so, so stay tuned. Please uh, push out to all your social media channels what's going on, and don't forget to reach out to anyone you know that might need a tax deduction. That sounds corny, and I know that some people still haven't gotten their tax returns back, but... You're going to need a tax return next year. You're going to need to file one if you're in the United States, at least. Tax deductions, they'll be there next year, too. So, um, yeah, when you donate, you're helping your tax return, and you're helping us do science. It sounds lame, but I'm going to say it anyways. 
Um, yeah. Anything good on questions? Be there. We quiet. We are hunting wasps. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, manly men hunting the wily wasp. You guys, that's too much. Did I mention we have the best commenters in the world? <laughs> this is, I mean, this is, I, mean, I, I as, as, as I run the, uh, I do the, the running of the tech for the learning space, so I see that one most often. We just have the best, most insightful, awesome commenters, so thank you for always participating uh, like you guys do, either with the silly snark or with the serious, deep questions. We appreciate it all. Okay, I... And apparently I have an evil laugh. You can. We all can. Oh. All right. I think that's it. Oh, there's a chat message. Hi! Hi! Oh, hi us. Hello! Hi! We're getting Hello. the phone brought in, and Kyle, and I'm guessing Phil's coming in. I'm taking a picture of the carnage that we created with Oreo cookies oh, earlier. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm going to do another one. Okay. <laughs> so, so did you guys see our Oreo cookie monstrosity segment? No. <laughs> <laughs> you want to describe while I tweet? Yeah, so you can use Oreo cookies to do science education in fun and tasty ways. Except that our Oreos weren't structurally sound to begin with, and so there's just a pile of broken Oreos <laughs> on the table between us. <laughs> so, so welcome. Um, we are now entering, what is this, our... We are now entering... Hour five. Hour five. Oh my god, it's only five. It's only five. <laughs> we are now entering hour five. Uh, we hang out at Thon to raise money to get more people learning and doing science. And joining us this hour, we have our good friend Phil Plate, who's one of the people who had all the conversations with Fraser and I, or at least some of the conversations with Fraser and I, when we were conceiving of CosmoQuest. Uh, he works at Slate Magazine, working on the Bad Astronomy blog. And we have the sirens popping in one by one, and sorry, my trackpad is on the ground now. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to say this is Kyle, who comes to us from Scientific American. Hi, Kyle. Hello. Um, we have Christina, whose last name I'm not going to destroy. He's coming in with us. Can you tell us how to pronounce it? Ochoa. 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 Okay. Uh, so there's, there's Phil Plates with his... Uh, Binoculars in the background. Hey, Phil. <laughs> Phil. I have to do that because otherwise it's just like big empty white space back there, and there's like big empty white space right here. So I put the binoculars. <laughs> Can you carry that door open? Because I believe that's the bathroom. It's the bathroom behind me in like yep. my my like you know coat closet on the other side. It's the, only, <laughs> the only wall I have that, that looks at all decent. <laughs> okay, so we also have with us Tamara, who's another one of the sirens. Hi, Tamara. Hi, I am strategically placed to block the laundry behind me. <laughs> that, you totally get that. Props. No big deal. And and then we also have, is it pronounced Taryn? It's Taryn, yeah. Taryn, okay. I, I'm, if you ever watch Astronomy Cast, you'll learn my role in Astronomy Cast is to mispronounce things. <laughs> um, so, so, Christina, could you tell us a little bit about what the sirens are? Um, sure. Well, the sirens is uh, for very scientifically enthusiastic actresses. Uh, we came together and we independently do a lot of outreach and we're very involved with the scientific community one way or another, whether we're a part of it or we're supporting it. Um, and our goals are to slowly but surely infuse projects and the industry with more science. Uh, so just generate scientifically literate content would be our ultimate goal and just anything that's outreach related and advocating for STEM. Awesome. So so I'm yeah, getting reminded by Phoenix, you guys need to turn your lower thirds back on. It came off when you left the green room. Oh, oh. good point. 
<laughs> I, I have no lower third because I am coming to you from an iPad, which apparently does not support Google's toolbox or Hangout toolbox oh, very well. So that's okay. We, I'm we, way ahead of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I have you usually are. <laughs> Where did my lower thirds go? We'll find them. So you guys are in this awesome position where we, as scientists, people automatically go, oh, you're a what? Or they go, oh my god, scientist! But 90 <laughs> scientists go, oh, you're a what? You guys get the, oh, you're an actress, or oh, you're a writer. And, and that's a much better response. Um, but you've chosen to take that response and leverage it to get people doing science. What originated that idea? Taryn did. You want to yeah, take it, Taryn? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I, I wrote a reactionary blog post to uh, the creation debate. Um, and I was so frustrated um, sort of by, by its content and by sort of the support of the of the creation platform. Um, I basically, uh, and Tamara and I had been speaking about doing some sort of science and acting thing a couple years ago and hadn't been able to sort of mobilize our efforts yet. And I wrote this post um, and I'm like, the only way I believe that we're going to be able to create a more scientifically literate population is by doing it through media. And what better than to do it vis-a-vis -vis the platform of acting and as an actress um, we have sort of a stereotype that is the antithesis of what you would think sort of a scientifically literate person would be. You think, oh, oh, acting is glamorous and sort of narcissistic and all this stuff. And I'm like, how amazing to sort of utilize that platform to uh, to create more awareness for science and just sort of lead by example and then in doing so create this sort of enthusiasm for more scientifically literate um, properties. Uh, you know, uh, entertainment properties, because uh, we all write and produce as well, and a lot of the stuff that I write has a strong science element to it, and that's really important to me, and that's sort of where I want to leave my mark. So I joined forces with Relia and Tamara and, and Christina, and we just sort of are taking it organically, and it's kind of exciting the um, response we've gotten. That was awesome. And, and I, I have to say that as part of their contribution to this hangout of fun, the Sirens and Phil Play uh, each have come up with various things that they want to send you guys as a gift. So this is not passing through our hands. This is coming from these guys. Um, so so Phil has a small Canyon Diablo uh, that's Meteor Crater Meteorite. Um, yep. A copy. Do you want to tell them what you have, Phil? <laughs> sure. That way, at least uh, the camera. I think the camera will be on me then, and then you can actually see. Can you see what I'm holding up? Am I small or big? You're big. There we go. Okay. I was just seeing Taryn. Um, it's funny how this thing pops around. So this is a Canyon Diablo meteorite. It, it's actually from Meteor Crater, Arizona. Uh, so this, this is part of the iron asteroid that fell 50,000 years ago and carved a mile-wide hole in the Arizona desert. So I got that. I have a CD on the floor now. There we go. By my pal Kim Bookbinder. Let's see. How do I... There we go. She is a songwriter and uses astronomy and science in her music. The first track on this album, which is called The Sky is Calling, is actually a sonification of uh, uh, the Big Bang, of actually sort of a theoretical model of how the Big Bang emitted radiation turned into sound. And she has a song called Stellar Alchemist, The Sky is Calling, The Drake Equation. So if you're sort of a, an astronomy dork, you'll know what all that stuff is. Um, and they're fun songs, too. I have a patch by her. It says, I am a stellar alchemist. My heart is an iron fist. Heart is an iron fist. It's a, it's a supernova <laughs> core explosion reference. That's how awesome she is. And also a NASA postcard. <laughs> this is way harder <laughs> than it should be. Um, and it's 3D. When you rotate it, it shows the sun and an eruptive prominence. And there's the Earth up there, which you probably can't even see. There it is. There it is for scale show you just how flippin' awesome the sun is. So I will donate these under whatever circumstances Pamela and Nicole wish me to do so. <laughs> so we have one more thing of awesome coming in this, this session. And that's coming in um, from, from the sirens. And uh, Christina, do you want to, to go ahead and tell us what you guys have? And again, um, 
coming from them. This is not from us. This is from them saying thank you. Uh, we have a version of Richard Rhodes' Hedy's Folly um, to give out. It's a wonderful book. Um, and it's the biography of, by the way, I pronounce Hedy, but I think it's Hedy Lamar, right? In English, it's Hedy. I have so, to say, it. Um, that's Headley for any Blazing Saddles fans. <laughs> um, and we will personalize it and, you know, sign it and send it to uh, whoever you, uh, Pamela and Nicole, deem worthy. So that's coming from us. So, so we, we believe that there's no such thing as a free lunch, but also no such thing as a donation too small. So any donation... Uh, over five dollars is eligible, and what we're going to do is is powers of two, so donation two, four, eight, sixteen, <laughs> thirty-two, going through uh, for donations greater than five dollars. So starting when? Starting at the beginning of this hour. All right. Cool. So um, we're here not just to give you stuff, we're or just beg you for stuff, because. Begging is why you do telephones, but we don't. <laughs> um, we're here to talk science. And Take a picture of this. What was that? Oh, I'm taking a picture to tweet out a view on the camera. I'm being very meta. Sorry. Oh, that's, that's, that's good. Good. <laughs> I appreciate meta. Meta is kind of the way the way I live my life. Um, <laughs> hey, Christina, how come you chose Hedy Lamar for as a book to give away? Hint, hint. Uh, well, I think that for us, she's very <laughs> good question, Phil. <laughs> uh, so I think for us, she's representative of that very dichotomous personality where she was um, an actress, a wonderful actress, screen siren, and yet she was an inventor and also uh, responsible for some of the technology um, with frequency alternation that we use now in Wi-Fi, and she patented a bunch of uh, new... I'm, I'm going to be redundant here, and uh, <laughs> she created a bunch of new patents uh, that, you know, now help us today, and I think she's a very little-known figure that should be more prominent and should be an example of how people can pursue things in science and in the arts and how we don't need to limit ourselves, and it's open to everyone. I totally want that book now. <laughs> I think that there's a, I think there's a movie in development about her too. I'd spoken to someone a couple of years ago, and he was so passionate about it. And um, his name's Mark Forby, and I need to like find out again if this movie is in development because then we can all just support it and bring the story to the. Because so many people don't know the story; they just know her as like the most beautiful actress in the world. They didn't know how uh, influential she was. So, so Phil, you're kind of the odd man out, except there's another man on the panel. You, you actually come to this um, entirely from the science side, where you're kind of sneaking in to the, the uh, mainstream old media. I still haven't figured out what to call it. Um, with the writing that you do for Slate and with the television show that you did for ever so brief an amount of time. Um, how... <laughs> Sorry. Um, you mean my hit TV show? Uh. Yes. I loved it. <laughs> I have it on TV. <laughs> Holy Haleakala! Um, okay. So. <laughs> you know, yeah, we were going to title it Three and Out, and then decided that probably was a, a bad sign, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I've always sort of been in a weird place in everything I do. So I started up with old media like uh, uh, writing for magazines and newspapers and that sort of thing and wound up started doing TV interviews, news shows, that kind of thing and then getting getting the odd talking head gig on some Discovery Channel show or whatever eventually getting a three-part show called Bad Universe and um, I found out that you can spend a huge amount of time on a TV show that airs once and is gone. It's, it's kind <laughs> of funny that way and you, you, could, you might be able to hit a million people all at once but then that's it. And in the meantime, I was writing a lot. I've been writing for the blog for years, and actually it was Fraser uh, Kane from Universe Today and, of course, Astronomy Cast, who got me blogging in the first place, actually, uh, in, in many ways. And it just, you know, as, sort of, as some of the old media is kind of going away and the new media is starting up, I'm doing a little bit of that, and we'll do some YouTube stuff, some Hangouts, 
just trying whatever I can to get the message across because I, I love this stuff and I like talking about it and I'll be happy to do it in whatever medium is popular except for possibly Pinterest and Instagram. I'm, I'm just not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I tried actually and it was, um, it, was, it was eating up more of my time than it should have for the impact it was having. You know, I could try it again, <laughs> but we'll see. So, so you started doing science communication back when you were a postdoc at Space Telescope Science Institute and I know many of us came to know your work from how you slammed movies. What, what was the origins of Mr. Bad Astronomy coming to be an entity on the internet? Well, I actually started doing this um, uh, before I had my PhD. I was a grad student at the University of Virginia well, when, when Nicole was like in elementary school before she went to UV <laughs> or something like that. Um, I just started writing on on this new fangled interweb thing that everybody had just invented, <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. And that was mostly just debunking bad science, uh, the the idea that um, uh, uh, you know why does the moon look big on the horizon and why is the sky blue, simple stuff like that. And it evolved into just everything that was whatever happened to be ticking me off at the time. Um, <laughs> But I enjoy writing about real science, and that's that's. I'd rather do that all the time. I actually hate having to write about attacks on science or people who misinterpret science. It's not that I hate it, it, it but I just hate that I have to. Right? It's like anything else that you're trying to fix, trying to make better. It's it, you're like, I wish I didn't have to do it. I wish I could just do it this way. Write about, look at this amazing discovery. So I try to do as much of that as I can as well, because that's more positive. It's a lot of fun, and uh, it just it was one of these things where it was just timing. Uh, the web was new and shiny. And I was one of the only people out there doing it, and I've just been riding that wave ever since. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And, and now what's cool, too, is, um, is doing the entertainment side of it, because that's becoming very popular, where TV shows and movies and even people designing video games are making them more scientifically accurate. Uh, and what I'm finding is that um, uh, over the past yeah, 10 years, something like that, there are actors and writers and directors making TV shows, acting in TV shows and movies, um, who really love the science. It's not that it's just, oh, I'm writing science fiction because that's the genre I was hired to do. It's like, no, I love this stuff. I want to write about a moon base or whatever. And so when um, when Taryn and Christina uh, and Tamara and, and the others, uh, Rylea, started talking about doing this in a more organized fashion, I'm all for it. We have... and. and what have I been talking for 20 minutes now? I'll shut up in a sec. But we have people who are using their celebrity for evil. Uh, you know, I can name names. I won't name names. I certainly would never mention Jenny McCarthy, for example. Um, or Alicia Silverstone, who's just come out with a book telling you not to vaccinate your kids. Um, people use their celebrity platform to promote whatever things they believe in for ill or, or for good. I would rather do this for good. And so I love the idea that there are actors and actresses out there who are using this to promote good stuff like real science. So I, I love this idea of sirens. And uh, I remember just jumping right in and saying, what can I do? What can I do to help? And I've well, done Phil, the whole has been, uh, <laughs> Phil, you were absolutely, not only were you really supportive, but you were inspiring to us because you... People can be abrasive sometimes, and you have skeptics and people debunking science, and they can be a little bit too harsh sometimes for the general audience, for the people that we're trying to bring in and to convert. And you do it without being condescending. You do it with humor. You do it, you know, in a very pleasant manner. And I think that comes across for us as something that we want to emulate. Oh, well, thank you. And I'm kind of just here. I'm just, I'm just kind of hanging out. Yeah, and Kyle's here too. <laughs> So, so Kyle, you come to us from from a, a background where you're currently writing for Scientific American, but that's not all you've done. So, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So, I kind of came out with the same experience um, that Phil has been doing, um, albeit uh, a little bit not not as long as, as he's been doing it. But um, I uh, have a background in engineering, and then in graduate school, I kind of I kind of discovered that I liked talking about science more than actually doing it. Um, Phil continued on doing actual science, and I just kind of, I, I found that wave, kind of what Phil was talking about, and I started to write it. So um, in graduate school, I started writing for Scientific American. Uh, currently, I'm at 
<laughs> I keep mentioning Phil. Currently, I'm at Phil's old <laughs> quanta of Discover Magazine, and um, oh, I'm sorry, week, place it, It's okay. It's okay. And uh, in about a week or so, I have some other big job news that I can't talk about. But it's all in the same uh, vein of taking science to use um, to make pop culture seem more interesting. It to people. My, my kind of philosophy is that people already love this stuff. People are already passionate about their favorite shows, about Game of Thrones, about The Hobbit, or, or something like that. If you can find something sciencey in there and make it interesting and add value to that passion, it's the extra little bit that they can say, oh yeah, I love, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch's smog was awesome. Do you know, like, maybe this is how a, a dragon could actually breathe fire, like a bombardier beetle mixes chemicals. Um, do you know how that works? So it's about adding value to the content that they already like, but then you're also learning something. So everything that I try to do, my bread and butter is just taking the nerdy stuff that people already like and infusing science into it. And I found it really, really successful. You don't have to come at it from an angle of, let's learn calculus. No, I can, if you want to go through to find the actual growth rate for tribbles on the enterprise, you can do that, <laughs> and it's not that difficult, and it's something fun that you can work through to th because you know you're getting to the end of, I want to be like Spock. How did Spock actually know that number? Uh, that's that's how you get there, and I, I I think it's one of the more successful science communication avenues out there, at least in my experience. Well, and I think that actually brings up a really interesting point about. Can you guys hear me? Are we? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that I keep popping in and out. I apologize for my horrible Wi-Fi, but I think that actually brings up a really interesting point about the time that we're at. Um, you know, when you look at what the studios are doing and the way that they're trying to engage fans who want a deeper dive into the world that they've created, the internet, um, all of these different interactive tools now allow people to have that. So if we can grab a piece of that landscape and infuse some scientific information into that, we're already jumping on top of what the studios want to do. And the great thing is they have a lot of resources. So if we can get a little piece of that, then that I think is, you know, beneficial for everyone. Yeah, exactly. My philosophy with, you know, taking nerdy things and putting science into them has always been that the Venn diagram of people who are nerdy and like Magic the Gathering and Game of Thrones and Dungeons and Dragons and the people who like science are actually pretty overlapping, <laughs> a lot more <laughs> overlapping than others. I mean, someone who is uh, a leader of the Kim Kardashian fan club will have probably a slightly less of an overlap than someone who, um, you know, plays Titanfall on PlayStation or something like that. Those, kind, those kinds of people, the kinds of people that already like science are the ones who are on the internet. They're the ones who are early adopters. Those are the people that can be most gotten by additional good science content. And you see that. I mean, I've... I've 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 done statistical analysis of what the best starting Pokemon in the original Pokemon games would be, and I I and and no joke I get better more reasoned arguments from people who disagree with me about Pokemon than people who disagree with climate change or evolution. A hundred percent, they are they are much more knowledgeable. They make much better arguments than climate deniers, than vaccine deniers, people who are already passionate about something like Pokemon. And that's, I think that's what we really have to tap into, just channel that passion into something else. Well, and, and I love that you're making it okay to think reasonably, to think rationally. And that that's what can be so important at times, because let's face it, your, your average teenager, your, your average person, no matter who they are or how old they are, has insecurities and doesn't necessarily want to admit, hey, I'm a science geek. Sure. And there's this amazing moment of realizing that this person you see on TV thinks science is cool. And even I fall prey to this occasionally. I, I was at Dragon Con several years ago, and Kevin Grazier, who's the science advisor from Battlestar Galactica, had taken me backstage before a panel to, to get a um, Galileo scope box signed uh, to use to fundraise for the International Year of Astronomy. And Michael Hogan, who played Colonel Ty on Battlestar Galactica, came in and 
internally I was like, oh, it's Carl Ty. And and he quite verbally went, oh, you have a Galileo scope. <laughs> and so my awkward dialogue was, why yes, I have a Galileo scope. Let me talk to you about this Galileo scope. And inter internally I was going, oh my god, there's an actor who knows something about science. Sure. And so my inner dialogue was jumping up and down with a voice four pitches, four octaves above <laughs> my normal pitch. And, and there was just this moment of us science geeks have actually infiltrated the popular kids table. Yes. Right. And, isn't that something? I feel like that has happened over that happened a while back ago, but I think the portrayal of these people isn't in the in the media. It's yeah. just not very accurate. And we have a friend, Crystal, who has a brilliant TED talk on, you know, the uh, myth of the scientist, where she analyzes these roles of scientists in the media, including very popular and shows that we love, like Big Bang Theory and stuff, and she talks about um, you know how they are portrayed still in these archetypical ways that are not embracing the variety that we do see in the scientific community nowadays. And, and one of the things that I think leaves me so confused is we see science getting embraced more and more by mainstream people, but science funding isn't following. We're actually seeing a drop in science funding from well, what existed when Phil started his career, and even more from when Phil's advisor started his career, and and so we have this this strange <laughs> we have this strange need to bring all of us together and say, hey, if you donate this hour, these wonderful people have things to give away to you, and if you are a power of two donor, so two, four, eight, sixteen, I'm out of fingers at that point, thirty-two, sixty-four. Um, donate. It doesn't matter how much you give as long as it's enough to buy lunch because there's no free lunch. So five dollars or more, power of two, number of donate, number of donations into this hour. Um, these people are giving things away as if their gift to you to say thank you for for donating because even though it's okay to sit at the cool tea table now and say I'm a scientist, society still doesn't reward me and I'm required to ask for help help so so what what is causing this weird disconnect where we live in a society where it's starting to be okay to say hey I'm a scientist I love science I'm not a scientist I love science but we aren't funding education or science particularly well I think we put a premium all of a sudden on not just uh, careers but endeavors that reward net profit and bottom line and um, you know in Hollywood it's also more maybe vacuous and superficial kind of world so we put premium on things like uh, image and success and blockbusters and things like that but I know in general looking outside of our little bubble that we live in here um, it's it's also kind of just bottom line net profit and science is a long term oh my god that looks so good and I have a miasma here of someone cooking barbecue or something. It's just this horrible thing. That looks really good. Um, sorry. So I think that, you know, it's just a little bit of this weird balance that we have to look long-term in science at, and people don't make those investments because they want quick, gratifying rewards. But at the same time, I, th I think we might actually be on the cusp of some kind of yeah. sea change in this respect as well. I mean... Uh, if it, it does kind of seem more like a generational thing, where the older, uh, where where the older population still has these low acceptance of scientific ideas, um, not really valuing it. But like you said, when nerds become cool again, it's kind of oh yes, normal people that I know do this job, and like any other job, they or you know government assistance, they need the funding. I just wonder how long that's going to take. I mean, I don't. I don't mean to I don't mean to name drop, but Christina and I will be hosting an Intel Science Fair event um, next week or so, and 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 opportunities like that that just kind of hit us out of the blue, entertainers out of the blue. It kind of shows me, at least a little bit, that large scientific thinking organizations are pushing for people to get the word out because they know nerds can be cool, scientists can be cool. They didn't. They didn't hire Christina or I 
just because we we are sciencey. They could have hired anyone. They could have hired a professional MC. I am definitely not one of those. But they chose someone who could who could riff about you know how cool that iron meteorite that Phil showed everyone that they are donating for people who donate. Um, we could talk about how cool that would be. That's the kind of people that I think are being sought after now, and that's 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 better than it could be, I think. I agree, uh, and, and throw this out as well. I'm I'm um, Pamela. What you were talking about, how how uh, people can donate to this, and how science funding seems to be dropping, even as its popularity is increasing amongst the public. Uh, what we're doing here is is a microcosm of of, of the, I don't want to say the problem, but the situation. Yeah. We have gatekeepers here. Uh, when when you're applying for grants, you're applying for grants from some funding agency, and typically that's the government. And the government will give money to science, but right now we have an unprecedented number of people who who actively and vigorously, aggressively, enthusiastically attack real science that we know to be true. They're attacking it, saying it's wrong. Uh, that's a real problem right now, and to be able to circumvent that and go straight to the people and say, look, this is what we're doing, this is cool, give us the money directly instead of going through the government, I, I, I like this as a metaphor for what's going on, but I like it also. It's what we're all doing. Um, I'm writing for a magazine that doesn't curtail what I'm saying. I get to write whatever I want as long as I don't get sued um, within my own sort of parameters of what I like to write about. Um, and what everybody here does is the same thing. It's the same with Kyle and the same with the sirens. I know that you guys are doing um, uh, the science nights and uh, you, uh, Christina, you're on um, uh, Chaotic Awesome talking about science and going straight to uh, YouTube, straight to Hangouts, that sort of thing, directly contacting people. It may not be getting out to millions of people at a time yet, um, but it is getting that direct contact, which I think is, is critical right now. And I think that actually leads to something else when you talk about funding, which is this idea that ultimately, at the end of the day for funding, there is a gatekeeper, and that gate gatekeeper is a person who is A, passionate about something, and B, usually either wants to be reelected or reappointed, which means they're going to try and do what the populace demands. And if you look at who many of those gatekeepers are right now, they grew up in the 70s or the 80s and what was happening in the media you know you had things being glorified like Wall Street you had Michael J Fox you know starring as a kid who just wanted to make it on Wall Street and these are the things that shape and influence the things that you're passionate about so my hope is that whether it's through efforts like ours which you know reach a smaller audience a show like Big Bang that you know is one of the top sitcoms um, and reaches a massive audience that the people who are growing up now and or maybe in positions in 10 years and 20 years to be those gatekeepers, they will be passionate about science, and there will be a much larger audience that they are responsible to. So when you have to check mark off which, which kinds of endeavors are going to get funding, science will be higher on the list. So I'm hoping, as Kyle said, we may be at the beginning of a sea change because of that sort of ripple effect down the line. I have a question about, about that. Um, sorry, I have a question about that. The, I've been seeing a lot of um, crowdsourcing kind of projects, you know, the, the um, meteorite, naming meteorites on Mars, uh, sorry, the craters on Mars. It's all these kind of, oh, you know, you donate, you buy, and then the funds go towards grants um, and, you know, scholarships and things like that. My, my question being, does that in turn make the organizations kind of lazy about it, though? Do they feel, because I know we see it in the industry sometimes, producers will be like, well, you can just kickstart this project, or you can just find it elsewhere and, you know, crowdsource these things. Does that, do you feel like that happens in science? I'm not as, you know, in for when it comes to funding and stuff, but I feel like having these opportunities and these platforms might be a double-edged sword, and people might be like, well, they can get it elsewhere. So, so it's messy. That 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 <laughs> day, um, you you run into situations where you're starting to see the early commercial space agencies, early commercial space projects, finding highly successful funding opportunities in crowdsourcing. But this isn't them being lazy; it's them needing venture capital and just finding a new and creative way to say, 
let's launch a bunch of CubeSats. Let's launch a bunch of CanSats. Let's change how space exploration is done. And they're creating a new field. What we're not seeing yet is the academic side of research being able to fully embrace crowdsourcing. And, and this is something that we've mentioned several times throughout the day, is as people who work in a university setting, I'm an assistant research professor, and Nicole's a postdoc um, with faculty privileges. Like parking. <laughs> like parking. <laughs> um, as as I'm looking, <laughs> parking's important. Right. It um, doesn't matter if you're at a studio or a university. Your parking spot shows status. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> we have faculty parking permits. And um, because we're at a public state university, we have certain limitations on the, what we're able to do because we work for the state of Illinois. Um, and the state of Illinois, more than any other state, has had to develop a lot of accountability rules simply because five of our last seven governors are in jail. Um, so so our, our university justifiably worries about things like all the details and user agreements and terms of service. And, and when you're a university, a lot of the um, intellectual property rights and things in crowdsourcing start to become scary. So we can't actually use sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo um, just because the terms of service aren't ones that, that a public state university can agree to. So we have to get more creative in how we do this, which is why we're doing it this way. And, and honestly, if I could just write grants instead of having to be awake for most of 36 hours to fundraise, I would totally write grants. But the problem that we're, we're dealing with is Nowadays, you need to have a whole suite of ways that you raise money. I thought I'd done a good job at diversifying the funding that we have for CosmoQuest. We had money from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, from Mercury Messenger, from the Dawn mission. We were working with Space Telescope Science Institute. I have a large NASA grant that I'm the principal investigator on. We had all of these different funding sources. We're working with the National Science Foundation for our planetarium shows. And then funding started to get cut. Sequestration hit. At one point, we actually got a message saying, we're sorry, due to sequestration, the rest of your funding is gone. It wasn't the choice of the person that we were working with. The person we were working with had all their funding go away, thanks to Congress. So working with crowdsourcing isn't a form of being lazy. It's a form of desperation. It is much easier for someone like me to sit down write the 20 pages and all the ancillary documentation for a federal grant and say, dear NASA, dear National Science Foundation, here is this awesome research program I want to do. It is much harder for me to come online and say, look, I'm going to sing for my supper along with my postdoc for 36 supper. hours, literally. So our business manager, Don Olive, is She's responsible for making his homemade soup. <laughs> Love you. I'm very happy. I want soup. <laughs> So, so for, for professional academics, there's no laziness involved in this. Uh, we are singing for our supper in hopes of getting enough funding to keep our programming team going um, through the end of the year and hopefully beyond. So we're looking to fund the next 12 months of our programming team. And it's not easy, but every grant I write, I have roughly a 1 in 8 chance of getting it, looking at the flat statistics. My personal rate is more like 1 in 3, 1 in 4. But that's a whole lot of grants. And each grant, I'm only allowed to ask for two months of my salary, two months of any of my senior personnel's salary. So that means I have statistically, if I look at, at the flat out odds, a 1 in 8 chance of getting a grant when I write it. Each grant will only pay for two months of my salary. There's 12 months in a year. This doesn't make it easy. This is making it possible. It's sad. It hurts. Please find something more can cheerful to talk about. Like how you can I ask you ladies a question? Yes. Um, I want to just uh, get your guys' uh, opinions on sort of the future of, of private funding because I, I don't see this issue of um, of government funding changing anytime soon just because of entitlements. Yeah. Um, but you know, you have these foundations like B six one two that's 
you know, doing the asteroid deflection research. And then you have something like Google X, you know, putting a lot of money into these sort of pie in the sky ideas. And, and you just see sort of what a private company like SpaceX has been able to do. So how do you, do you see this is like the future of where some science funding will, will have to move to because the government just will be bootstrapped. I mean, I, I'm sure that most people would rather have their tax dollars going to you know, the future of humanity as opposed to, you know, retirement entitlements that the government owes on, you know, on interest rates for their debt. But that's just the reality of it. It's, it's, it's one of these things where I'm getting asked questions that I've never previously been asked. Um, one of the most frequent questions I've been getting is, um, what is, and I'm being pointed out that our Apple TV is, is currently um, promoting Apple products, and I need to, oh. <laughs> I need to Cosmo Quest brought to you by Apple. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> I'm an really undercover not. Samsung spy. I will get you. Um, so, so what I was saying before having it pointed out that um, uh, the Apple TV had kicked in screensaver mode was... I'm getting asked things I've never been asked before. I'm getting asked by business plans instead of grant ideas. I'm being asked to show the sustainability of the projects that we're working on. I'm being asked what commercial benefit is it to what you do. And the first time I started getting asked these questions, thank God it was from a friendly target. Fraser Kane was the one having this conversation with me. And he, he has all the commercial experience I have never had. I'm an academic who sort of kind of understands capitalism, sort of, maybe, on a good day. <laughs> um, and, and so he's like, you've got to have answers to this. You've got to have answers to this. And so I've been thinking things through. And while I can't tell you what our sustainability model is, what I can tell you is what we're worth. And what we're worth is we're creating something where scientists who have great ideas, who just need the help of other warm bodies, citizen scientists, because they don't have enough students in their programs, because they can't afford enough students. They need volunteers. We're providing a place where they can come with their ideas, and we can generate their science. And so our model is to make science more affordable. And we're hoping that people will find that important enough to invest in, to donate to, to make it possible for us to change the model of how science is done by creating a research facility that's not inside of an ivory tower, but is instead on the internet and accessible to everyone. Amen. <laughs> no, I love this. I love the citizen scientist angle. I think everybody needs to be a citizen scientist. We're a member of this planet. I just, I think it's a great platform to to launch this from. And where do we see a lot of the great citizen science projects happening? Again, it's something pop culture-y. It's video games. The coolest things that we're seeing, whether it be um, iWire out of MIT, where I think 120,000 players are helping researchers map um, the neurons in a brain and their connections at something like 100 times faster than the researchers could on their own, or... Um, I forget the name of the game, but the the protein folding one where you in three dimensions you 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 see the I'm sorry, what is it called? Fold it at home. Fold it at home, and uh, and they're and they're finding little discoveries that researchers weren't even aware of yet. So you when again when you're when you're combining something that people are already passionate about, if you can do it's going to take a little bit of extra funding, like you said, of course, but if you can make something sciencey, take it a little bit out of academia and make it some sort of game, something fun, a little bit more accessible than if you've ever read the abstract for some of the papers that come out of these places. It's a little <laughs> bit it's a little bit less than accessible. So I mean and that might be a, a generational thing too. I mean I I know the the woman who runs or helps run iWire and she's She's very young. She's, I think she's under, she's under 30. She's done TED Talks. She's very accessible. She's on Twitter. She does appearances. It's very public. It's very engaging. It, like you said, it's not behind that ivory tower anymore. It's something more accessible. And I, I don't know, I'm, instead of 
lament it's it's easy to get depressed about how much we're not doing but it's also it, if if you're looking in the right directions it's easy to get excited about the really cool things that people are just starting to do too and i think one of the the things that we're trying to add to the the story of citizen science is citizen science isn't new it's uh perhaps had its modern form since the Revolutionary War here in America where um, Thomas Jefferson was one of the ones that actually pioneered um, huge nationally based collection of weather data because they were hoping if they could get enough farmers collecting weather information, sending it in, eventually we'd be able to say, if you see this, you'll see that, which is now being used to predict that the next three days there's going to be massive bouts of tornadoes across the American Midwest. The, the um, network of, of weather observers started by Thomas Jefferson is still working today. Wow. Um, organized out of the Smithsonian Observatory. Um, but, props to TJ. Yeah. And <laughs> Virginia alumni present. Um, but, oh. but what we're trying to I add feel like that's going to show up as a plot line on Sleepy Hollow somewhere. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, or so, turn. <laughs> One of the things we're trying to add to citizen science is the education aspect. We're trying, trying to say, we don't just want people collecting data. We don't just want people marking images. We want people marking craters. Please go mark craters in a different window than the one you're watching this in. Um, we also want people learning. And so this is where, with CosmoQuest, we're taking all the aspects of a research center, saying, hey, come take classes. Come join discussions. Come." Come learn with us and be our our peers, our apprentices, and let's build a scientific community that hopefully will grow up to have a larger and larger influence. And and we love bringing in people like you who are coming to this from such a different perspective from from the two of us. We're we're academics. And and do you guys, what advice do you have to to us academics who are learning to become science communicators? Because you're communicators learning the science side, so we're meeting in the middle. And we help give us advice. I think one thing that I notice a lot is uh, scientists are extremely passionate individuals about their work. Ask any postdoc about what they're doing, and they will start spitting a bunch of information at you that you can't even digest or process correctly. But they are so passionate about it, and I think that if we can take that and use it with science communication. So, you know, religions across <clears throat> the world gain new followers every single day because they tug at those kind of visceral emotions and those very innate faith and hope and fear. And if we can tug at those and find that love and that connection in other people with communication, I think that it'd be so easy to get new fans and followers for science, which will inevitably help the cause. Um, so I think that just, I like seeing things like uh, TED Talk become popular and be one of the number one hits on Netflix. And I love seeing people who, whether they do a great job or not, they try. They really want to put their work out there. I think uh, the direction I would encourage you guys to go in is, um, is one of, of storytelling whenever possible. Um, I think that inject for for a general audience, you know, so much. Um, sometimes the the obstacle to getting into science oriented material is you just feel like, as Christina was saying, you're getting this barrage of of information. But when there's a story element to it in some way, shape, or form, um, then that's your entree in, and suddenly you have a character or an event that you're following, and suddenly you're down the rabbit hole and you're learning all of this new information because you've got a doorway into it. So always think about how does the outsider get into this piece of information or, or into this topic? And then I would just encourage, you know, use of, of metaphor. that it is a, a very useful tool when it comes to different, different ideas that we have for projects that we want to do and, and things we want to talk about. And, you know, one, one idea, which perhaps we'll do at some point, is, um, you know, taking a look at some of the, picking a topic and taking a look at all the different metaphors uh -oh. used to <laughs> describe a piece of science fiction and looking at, hello, am I back? Yeah, yeah. you're back, you're back. Looking at, you know, what is, I'm back, okay. Um, <laughs> but anyway, 
looking at looking at what is most effective. So um, so that I would encourage storytelling metaphor. I think those are really useful tools when trying to convey information to a general audience. And distilling it down to oh Kyle, am I jumping on you? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna disagree with you guys, but I am. Yeah. No. No. I'm gonna. <laughs> No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm going to disagree. Go for it, jump in. I, I'm going to disagree is what I'm doing. Um, it's, uh, Bring it. it. When you're in, Phil, maybe Phil will know a little bit what I'm talking about, but when you're in science communicator circles, that's kind of the accepted wisdom, right? And I'm, uh, use story, we're, we're, we're social creatures, use storytelling, use metaphor. Uh, it, that's all true, but I'm also kind of tired of just, just, saying the accepted wisdom of that to scientists. That is not the first thing you have to do. When, when you, you have to learn to be a communicator first. It's not uh, like, like going through your education as a scientist. You have to learn how to do math. You have to learn um, the principles of planetary motion, things like that. At the same time, you can't just say to a scientist, make your piece a story. That's not easy. Making something a good story is just as difficult as making, uh, as, as fully fleshing out the discussion in your paper. It takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of practice. When I was in undergraduate and graduate school, um, what I, I really wanted to start communicating, so I took it upon myself to learn that basis first. You read, uh, t take someone who's a great writer like Carl Zimmer. Find a great piece by him, read it three times, see what he is doing well, and see why it works. Read great writing. Take, I took a free online course from Stanford University, How to Write if You're a Scientist. Read books. Don't Be Such a Scientist is a great book outlining the structure of stories, how communication works in entertainment. That's the first thing you have to do. It's, I, I don't like just, it, it seems... It seems a little lazy to me to just tell people communicate, use metaphor, while not at the same time telling them how to do that in the first place. So I, I think the grass, the the groundwork really has to be laid first. Of you have to communicate on somebody's level, but that's going to take work. You weren't trained to do this. This isn't your job. So if you want to make it part of your job, take it seriously. If you want to get on. Twitter and promote your research, do it seriously. Don't sound like a robot. Take free classes. Read great books. That's, I think that's really the ground floor instead of just saying try to do a story while you're also writing a grant. It's just not gonna, it's, it, it's just not gonna jive well together, I don't think. An alternate. I'm gonna take it one step further, Kyle. Oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say partnerships. When you partner a good storyteller with a scientist. Absolutely. To make that thing happen. And, and we'll have Scott Sigler on, as, as well as Nathan Lowell. Uh, nice. I'm waiting to hear if we're going to have some other authors, some of the science fiction authors that we've worked with to help us tell stories. Right. And, and so one of the things that I find really useful to do is uh, when I go to science fiction conventions, I go to the writer's workshops. I go to the narration panels. Um, my voice and my ability to write are the two things that make me successful as a scientist. And so I get training wherever I can, and it may mean that here at CosmoQuest we need to bring in some of these experts on narration to teach some of our classes so that people can learn how to communicate science as well. Uh, what were you about to say, Christina? Oh, no, I was just going to add on to what Kyle was saying, which I, I do agree with. I think it's a very easy answer to give and just be like, oh, well, you know, infuse your passion and, and be a better storyteller without saying how. But it also <laughs> takes that initial review. Like, people do have to realize maybe they're not getting their ideas across in the first place because there are a lot of, you know, wonderful scientists who believe that they're getting their message across, and it's up to the rest of the people to, you know... Smarten up and understand it. Why are they not getting, you know, what they're trying to say? So it takes that ego kind of, you know, check and be like, am I communicating effectively first? Mm -hmm. Ask your peers or ask the general audience, put it out there and get that review. I think that, you know, in this case, Bill and Kyle both do a wonderful job of transmitting that science to the general audience, but I'm sure that that's not something that they've gotten there by assuming that that's the case. Well, you know, I'll jump in, and I'm going to disagree, Kyle, that you're disagreeing. 
I, I don't know how, how meta we can be here, but uh, that's at least one I step I'll take. Um, well, I disagree with you that you agree with me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Honestly, uh, uh, there's more to this. This is all, what we're t discussing here are components of a much larger picture. There are different ways of, uh, of communicating science. So, for example, um, you know, I write a, a blog, or I might tweet about it. Someone like Elise Andrew can have her page, I effing love science, and have it, it, apparently 17 times the population of the entire planet uh, paying attention <laughs> to what she's writing. Um, you can go and, and do uh, a, a science bit on Chaotic Awesome, like Christina's doing. Uh, you could talk to writers of movies and make sure that the science that they're doing is correct. Uh, the Science and Entertainment Exchange, I love... Uh, uh, promoting this group out in LA gets scientists and uh, cr you know, creatives together, writers, directors, uh, game show or ga uh, video game producers, all that sort of thing, and they talk about the science of what they're trying to do. And a lot of the times, the scientists can correct the science. You know, you know, spaceships don't work this way, or they can say, "Oh, you want to deal with a viral epidemic? Did you know that this kind of thing can happen?" The writers don't, and they, "Wow, we now have a subplot for our movie." It, it, everybody, everybody wins. But all of these things are different ways of communicating. Uh, we need all of these. We need the passion. We need the storytelling. We need to tell people how to do that. Certainly, um, and there are different. E even in these venues, uh, I read. I don't know. Probably about four or five dozen different blogs, uh, ranging from uh, the, the the snarky and very simple ones. Up to, for example, and, and I mean sort of on an academic level, up to one called Astrobytes, which is written by uh, grad students and postdocs, I believe, where they take current uh, research papers that have come out and discuss them at a at a slightly easier to understand level. Although you kind of really still have to understand some astronomy to understand them. That's perfect for me. I I have a PhD in astronomy, so I can read these things and go, oh, this is a good story, and their take on it's different than mine would have been. I'm learning something here. Uh, so there's. You have to think about who your audience is, what it is you want to do, what you're good at maybe already, and and do it that way. I think there's room for a lot of different ways of doing this for everybody's voice, no matter what that voice might be. I think that's a really good point because I was I, thinking I have relative. Go one second. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, we are at the five minute mark to the end of this session, and at the end of this session, I have to switch to another hangout uh, because technology. Um, we're good for another hour. Ignore me. Ignore me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Continue. Um, I, was thinking, I was just thinking about the... the okay, go ahead now. <laughs> okay. Uh, just the, these relative levels, because Kyle and Phil, they're at the higher echelon of science communicating. Um, I mean, communicators. They, they do it exquisitely. They have PhDs. They have masters. Um, for me, as a science communicator, I'm at this lower echelon level where I feel like I'm doing a good job if I'm talking to friends who are busy, they have kids, they wonder why I think the Mars rover is important when they're just like, I need to get my kid down for a nap, this and that. If I can make anything to do with science relevant to their life because it seems to be this macro issue where they're like, well, this doesn't affect my day to day. Why should I care? Why should I be educated about this? And I try to distill it down to a level that impacts them. Now, my level of expertise on this is, is nowhere near the others, but I feel like that's still relevant. So being a science communicator, I just try to distill it down to um, sort of the lowest common denominator as to why this is relevant to a regular person's life. So I don't know if that adds anything, but I just think it can be relative when it comes to the idea of storytelling and communicating. I can't see anything on my It computer. absolutely adds something. I mean, your, your leverage is every bit as good as anybody else's. You're just applying it at a different spot. And right. that's what I'm saying. That we, we do this in all these different venues. Uh, we're going to be reaching people. I mean, there, there have been uh, these, these programs involving uh, rap singers and pop artists and, and doing different things to get just science into that. And you never know how, how much reach that's going to have. Mm -hmm. The more areas you cover, the more uh, interests you can you can sort of throw your blanket over. The more people you're going to reach. So th that's that's that was the point I was making. Is that the, the more different ways we have of doing this, the better. I went to a fancy Hollywood guy hairstylist, and he um, and he'd never heard of Cosmos before, and now he tweeted about it, and he has all these like celebrity <laughs> followers, and I'm like, 
because of me. He's watching Cosmos because I overpaid well, I for think, a haircut. <laughs> I think that also brings up another element of all of this, which, you know, just evidenced by this hangout that we're doing, and that's community. And going back a little bit to what Kyle was talking about, um, kind of knowing what your own strengths and limitations are. You know, Kyle, you were talking about how at some point you sort of discovered that science communication was really your niche and that you were a little bit more focused on the communication element than, you know, the actual practice of science. And I hope I'm phrasing that properly. Apologies sure. if I'm not. But um, so, you know, so for you, really learning how to become an incredible communicator about this topic took up a lot of your time and resources. You know, for academics, some of them may have the time, like you, Pamela, to really learn how to become a wonderful communicator. Some of them may have very little time outside the lab because then there's all those other things like life and family that take up your time as well. So knowing what you have the time to spend the resources on, I mean, for me as an actress and a writer and a producer, I have to make decisions every day about, okay, am I going to edit something on my own, which I can do or am I going to, you know, do I need something really fancy and do I really need to send this out to an editor? As somebody who cares deeply and passionately about science, there's so much I can communicate, but then I know, okay, I've interested somebody in this topic. Where can I send them? Where can I direct them to get more information for a deeper dive that I can't provide? So even something like this, knowing, okay, look, there are now more people I have to send your way when my, you know, amount of information ends, I think is a really good thing that... Um, uh, that this time and this technology allows us to do. Right now, let me let, let, let me let me agree though. with all of you. Let me let me just agree with all of you to get even <laughs> more meta. I mean, the, yeah. I, abs absolutely, absolutely, Phil. The the wider that we cast the net, the better. I mean, as long as people are communicating in whatever way works for them. I mean, these can be sleeper kinds of things. I mean, <laughs> do you, do you rem do you remember? Do you remember when Cosmos was announced and we're like Seth MacFarlane's uh, heading it? We're like what? Why? You mean from? You mean from Family Guy? That guy? Oh, he liked Cosmos as a kid. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Good on him. It, like these things can, it, as long as everyone, if if that's what you want to do, as long as everyone is doing what they feel comfortable doing and has a passion in, about it, these things could be. Uh, down the road, incredibly influential. I guess we'll never, you, you can't really, um, and I've written about this, we will never really know if this iteration of Cosmos worked. We'll never have the data to see how much it influenced people at, at what time and what they did afterwards, but who knows? Ten years down the line, the next greatest show or communicator could have been, yep, I saw Neil deGrasse Tyson on Cosmos, and that's what really did it for me. So there's, there's never really a stopping point to say we shouldn't communicate this way or that way. Um, to your point, Phil, I'm, it's, it's more so just keep at it, and hopefully down the line we will have reached somebody. I think we're one thing we are looking at it, all of us, that just in general, and I know that, you know, um, you, Kyle, and Phil, and the way we communicate, and I know that Fraser and you, Pamela, on Astronomy Cast, which I listen to all the time, the, the audience that we are targeting in this particular group is also maybe not scientifically literate, but very scientifically enthusiastic, and definitely inquisitive intellectually. And, you know, there's a giant gap here that we are maybe not looking at, which is youth and kids, um, which is a different audience, and the communication for them is probably going to be completely different from the way that maybe we write about it, or we communicate um, about science. And that's something that is also worth noting, that, you know, getting the children and the next generation excited about it is just as important. And I think that's a little bit of where media and sort of our sirens mission of trying to create more science infused media and to um, to encourage more accurate portrayals of science in the media and, and people working in STEM fields. Um, I really do believe in the idea that you can't be what you can't see. And when you see something in front of you, it inspires. I mean, just to share a personal story, I have a three and a half year old and she's in preschool and once a week she takes this class called Mad Science and, you know, they play with prisms and show them dinosaurs and all kinds of neat things. And the very <laughs> first class, she came home and I said, how is science today? It's science for the first time. And she said, Mommy, I love science. And you know what? The teacher was a girl. <laughs> Those were the first words out of her mouth. Like, I didn't prompt this. I mean, we've never talked in front of her about, you know, 
science being a male or female domain. Wow. I mean, she knows I love it. But the fact that that was the first thing she said, that an impression is made that early, was just, you know, anecdotal evidence to me that it's very important to um, have all kinds of different portrayals of scientists in the media and that showing this can, can have a direct effect way early on. I know it's only one and it's anecdotal, but it's mine, so it matters <laughs> to me. <laughs> So one thing we talk about a lot is what inspired us to get into astronomy. People ask that question all the time. What inspired you guys to love astronomy? Because that's probably different than what inspired us, but maybe not. And I'd just love to turn tables and ask you that question. Christina, why don't we start with you? What, what inspired you to love science? Uh, I think there w I was never shown any limitation in why I shouldn't love it when I was a kid. Uh, there was no one in my family ever said, you know, oh, well, you're a girl, you should like something else, or um, because of, you know, where I'm from, like, oh, you know, Spanish people, we don't necessarily, for whatever reason, no limitation was placed on gender, age, sex, anything like that um, for me. So I was kind of aware of it within my family. It was uh, topics that were discussed at the dinner table um, and explained to me and I was allowed to participate in those conversations and ask questions even if it was you know far beyond my uh, level of comprehension I could ask those silly questions and I could um, I was allowed to participate so I think that I grew up I don't remember a specific catalyst for my passion for it, but I do remember just always loving it and enjoying those um, conversations. So I, I assume that you similarly didn't have anyone telling you that you weren't allowed to love um, architecture or uh, plumbing or, or uh, I don't know, paleontology. Well, that's fine. <laughs> or I guess... <laughs> uh, I don't know, religious studies. What made science different that you're now willing to spend your spare time singing science songs? Well, not literally singing science songs. I was trying <laughs> to do a song of science. I was trying to do a song a of science. Siren, and I failed to do a pun. <laughs> <laughs> Get that. It was good. No, um, I think that for me, it's so present in everything we do, and it's something that. Um, Science affects us no matter how we look at it. I think I gain an understanding of how the world works when I gain an understanding of how a specific um, part of it works. I extrapolate anything that I learn in science. I use it on my day-to-day, -day and I, I believe that I am more analytical and I'm more inquisitive in everything I do, including art, including acting. Um, I am, you know, I, I kind of trial and error. I mean, I... I do it all, you know, based on the learnings that I've had with science. And I think that it's that little moment when you realize, oh my god, learning is fun. It's not even just about science per se, it's that learning process and science is such a vast volume of information and knowledge and questions that we don't have answered that I think I gravitate towards that. Tomorrow, I, I don't think Christine has pointed this out yet. Oh, I'm sorry, Pamela, but I, I think it's worth noting she has a degree in marine biology. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. That that did not get mentioned. Sweet. That is. You therefore know that otters are the frat boy of the ocean. Otters are the That's the scientific term. I, I think I've I've read it somewhere. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. I I mean I I did study. I'm a scientist by training, not by trade. I, like Kyle, you know, didn't really uh, pursue uh, higher education until later in life and am now currently uh, getting a master's in physics through a university in Spain that I do kind of go back and forth and uh, take my exams and stuff there. Um, so, yeah, but I, I think it's that passion for just continued learning for me and science provides that and then sharing what I've learned with other people. So that's kind of why I'm so enthusiastic about it. That's, that's awesome. T Tamara, what, what brought you to, to science? 
Um, I, I have to probably lay the blame at my father's feet. Um, he was a bit of a sci-fi nerd, and so I grew up stealing the Isaac Asimov books off of his shelf, and, um, you know, something was always, whether it was Star Wars or Star Trek, he's told me, um, you know, whatever it was, um, I was always fascinated by the what if, um, by, you know, the question of, um, what if this could happen, you know? Oh, am I dropping in that again? Yeah. You're dropping okay. in now, but we're listening anyways. Uh, okay. Um, okay. All right. Yeah, I was always fascinated by by the what if, the question of, you know, if we take a what could be happening out there? What would happen if, you know, this kind of um, medical discovery took place? What would happen if there were robots and they were in our houses? And how would we treat them? And would we treat them like people? Do they have rights? all of those kinds of questions? And um, that continued to fascinate me. Um, and then, you know, I sort of took, I went to a performing arts high school, I was a theater major in college, so I sort of took a little hiatus from science, and then um, at some point I dated a guy in college who was a med student, and he happened to be taking this bioethics class while we were dating, and we got into all these incredible fascinating conversations about, um, you know, different conditions and, and things he was studying in class, and that sort of vied some of my interest in science, and then I found myself, I kept gravitating towards um, theatrical projects that were science-based, um, like there's Copenhagen, um, which is about uh, Niels Bohr, and, um, you know, and I just found myself constantly coming back to these projects, and then I was like, okay, this is something you're genuinely interested in, how can you take a deeper dive, so. That's and then I went to space camp and <gasps> things like that. What? <laughs> Um, I actually went this past August, so August yeah. of, uh, yeah, about eight months ago, and it was awesome. I got to do, like, simulated, uh, did a simulated spacewalk, um, I, uh, things or tried on the, on the space shuttle, um, all kinds of stuff like that, so lots of, like, anti-gravity simulator, not the gravity simulations, but lower gravity, one six gravity simulators, so it was great. Oh, so I actually have a question for you. So I went to space camp back in, well, 88. Um, and then again, okay. several more times, because nerd. Um, young nerd. Um, when I was at space camp in, in the late 80s, early 90s, they had space shuttle simulators, and you, you'd pretend to fly up to space and then to go do experiments on the International Space Station that at the time was Space Station Freedom. Um, and then come back down to Earth um, on the space shuttle. What are they doing now that they don't have a space shuttle? Well, when I was there, still had a space shuttle. Um, you know, the, there were th basically three different places you could be stationed during your simulated mission, either in the space station, in, I mean, they called it the orbiter, but in, in a, spa a space shuttle or in mission control. So that's how they're still, they're still doing it. Um, yeah. I don't know, maybe they'll need to change the name of the orbiter <laughs> to something. <laughs> um, but yeah, now, now it, it's still that much. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay, we need capsule simulators. So for those of you tuning in and not sure what the heck this is, <laughs> this, this is the CosmoQuest 36-hour uh, hangout-a-thon leading into 36 days of continued crowdsourced funding. We are working to raise money to, well, to do science and to teach science and to generally get more and more of the world engaged in learning and doing science together. Uh, with me is Phil Plate, Kyle Hill, and uh, three of the sirens, I, Christina, Tamara, and Taryn, whose name I probably mispronounced because if I don't No, you're getting it awesome. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm very self-conscious about my ability to mispronounce things profoundly. Um, we, we're talking about how people in media can influence how the general public loves science or doesn't. I mean, that's the other side of this is um, I, I'd love to ask, and you can run away if you want to, the, the time block we're currently supposed to be in is eating lunch and playing the game of Flux. Uh, there's a space version of it, but this, this is, is more way more entertaining. entertaining. <laughs> so if you guys are willing to hang out a little bit longer, just drop off as, as needed. Um, I have 30 hours free, so I'm good for that. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Being a quarter. Um, so, so if we can keep you for like 40 more minutes, um, 
then, then we have to switch to, to we have our science team coming on, um, and we're going to talk science, and we have a big announcement in the next hour, so you want to be around in the next hour. Uh, not you guys necessarily, but you audience want to be around in the next hour. Um, so so what, what I'd like to hear is, I know a lot of people get turned off of science, and often media is part of that. Um, how can we fix media to get science not seen quite as badly? Mm. Bill, you, you, you are the scientist here. I'm going to ask you how you would fix media. Sorry, guys. Just because I don't know the answer, I would really love if um, Kyle and Phil told us how they got into it, like where their love yeah. for it came, if that's okay. I, I don't know the answer, and I'm really curious now. <laughs> Okay, Phil, go first. Okay, um, yeah, we'll get back to, to to answer your question about what I would do with the media. It's easy to just burn it to the ground, start over, <laughs> um, done. Um, as uh, as far as how I got interested in this, um, I've just been interested in science as long as I can remember. I mean, literally back to when I was uh, in preschool, and um, my father was an engineer, and my mom had had a series of different jobs, eventually was a, a, a worked at a jewelry store, was a manager of a jewelry store. So they, those weren't straight scientific careers, but they were very supportive of, of whatever it is uh, we wanted to do. So I, it, we might, meaning me and my siblings, so I would, I would say uh, if you want to know how to, how to get a science interested public, probably starting at the family level may be the best way to do it. Um, and, and we all pursued whatever our careers happened to be, from you know opera singer to astronomer. So it's, it's been fairly eclectic. Um, and, and in my case specifically, um, as a as a kid, I, I we went down to see the Apollo 15 launch. So I was really young, but I, I remember that. I remember watching the Saturn V lift off, and that was pretty amazing. And um, they bought a, a small telescope, and we we set it up in the driveway, and I looked at Saturn, and it was just that simple. Just boom, that this is what I want to do. And dinosaurs got kicked to the to the curb. Except now I do asteroid impacts. Well, I, I, I don't do research in asteroid impacts, but I talk about it a lot and I write about it. So I'm, I'm, I actually combined dinosaurs and astronomy in, in my own way uh, much later. But that's how, that's how I got started. <laughs> and, and you're going to be back tomorrow uh, for a second hour with, with Fraser Kane uh, talking about, and I'm double checking the time on this, but I believe you're going to be on uh, at 11 a.m. Pacific tomorrow, discussing uh, all the ways the universe is trying to kill you. Yeah, 11 a.m. Pacific, <laughs> 1 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. London, 4 a.m. Sydney. Phil will be back to talk about uh, the universe is trying to kill you. In a lot of different horrifying ways. So. Ladies, Yay. I'm so, so sorry. I actually have to be somewhere by 1.30, and I can't quantum entangle myself there yet. So <laughs> That's all right. I... We're <laughs> taking advantage of the fact that you guys are far more interesting than what we had planned to do right now. <laughs> yeah. You guys are amazing. So thank you so much, and donate, and everyone. This has, been, this has been absolutely great. Thank you. Bye, thank Jared. You so Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Um, well, for me, uh, what got me interested in, in science is uh, I, I think it was kind of just being a certain kind of child and then getting the right push at the right time. Um, you know, as a kid, I loved Legos. I would collect bugs in the backyard and look at them, and people would be like, ah, don't, don't bring that praying mantis near me. I'm like, look at this thing. It's crazy looking. And... Um, my parents would buy me, you know, dinosaur CD-ROMs and things like that. And you'd, you'd explore the Precambrian and you know the Cambrian explosion. Look at this is what a Nautilus looks like, and this is how eyes evolved, and all these really um, wonderful, interesting things. And I think I maybe I just had that kind of of mindset. And then I think as we all did through high school and then eventually college, I started, you know having this sort of existential crisis of what kind of way am I going to look at the world? What worldview is going to work out for me? And for me, um, when I had you know my teenage angst and I was watching Fight Club a lot, um, <laughs> I, I kind of just, what, what makes sense to me? What, how can we discover the world? And to me, looking at science, looking at the things that I was already interested in, this was... 
uh, a lot of people don't like to call it a worldview, but I mean, for all intents and purposes, it usually is. Um, Science, as a way of looking at the world, answered more questions. It gave me a way to explain, um, at least good enough to myself, explain the things that I was seeing, explain the things that I was interested in, explain why other people might think other things are happening when it's, when it's something else. Um, it, had, it had power behind it. That's that's what really interested me in science is that there's a lot of there's a lot of views out there, but this one has the power to back it up. I can point you to this or that evidence and say this is how we think the world is working, and I have a reason. So for me, maybe it was kind of an, an ego based teenage thing, but for me it was I think that there's answers here that we can see. And for me, that just um, propelled me straight into engineering. And, you know, let's discover how we can build things in the world and how forces work and, and the dynamics of moving objects and thermodynamics. How do you build a sewer pipe? What, there's, a, there's people who spent their whole lives just calculating how water flows through a pipe? That's incredible. And now I get to learn that kind of thing? And then from, from then, I... Um, I, in undergraduate school, I started a little free blog, and then I started submitting free pieces to Scientific American, and from there, um, it's been a short but kind of crazy ride into just doing it for a living, and um, it's all been one unbroken chain of nerdiness, really, for me. So, so what's your favorite example of how the heck did they ever figure that out? Like, like for me, I don't know how they got the idea to take a block of paraffin wax and put it in front of the thing they knew was giving off some sort of particle so that this is how neutrons were discovered. Someone got the idea to put a block of paraffin wax in and the paraffin was having protons knocked out of it and mm. they figured that whatever it was that was getting created was completely neutral and roughly the mass of a proton and, and the whole putting the paraffin block. I don't know how they came up with that idea. What, what, what's your favorite example of how on earth did anyone ever come up with that discovery? Right, well, because I'm no longer, I'm no longer in academia, I'm kind of bereft of, of like really amazing examples. Like I could say, you know, how do we figure out how to detect a Higgs boson with the most complicated machine ever made, ever? That's a lot pretty of fiber optics. It's a whole lot of fiber optics. <laughs> But, you know, that, that could be one of those lofty examples of how did we ever get here. But for me, um, being somewhat uh, still a layperson, uh, I, I, what really gets me are really those examples of, quote-unquote, the low-hanging fruit. Like, how, how did we discover that the Earth was round? Just the, the, the kinds of old examples of people calculating distances based on, um, you know, curvatures of the Earth and, you know, sails going down on the horizon, things like that. Just the little, the little insights that one person had a long time ago, and all of a sudden, you learn something amazing about the world, right? And the last episode of Cosmos, I think, was pretty, pretty, pretty great for that. You had these uh, ways of um, dating ancient objects like rocks, and then you have meteorites. And just from that, for splits, for 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 a second, until he published that paper. One person in the world knew what the age of the Earth was, and only him. And then he shared it. And those kinds of moments, really like, there is power here. This is how we discover things about our universe. That's what really gets me. The, the somewhat easy, quote they're not easy, but this, the somewhat easy to understand, like, oh, this, this connected to this, and we learn something fundamental about the world. And I love those examples. Uh, on right, that note, on that example, there. there's a wonderful book um, that is edited by Edge, and it's called um, This Explains Everything. They do an annual thing where they ask a bunch of people questions, and they have these brilliant minds kind of come in and write their answer to it. One of them was, this will change everything, and it was what invention or discovery in the near future do you think will alter our world perspective? Um, what, you know, scientific discovery. And um, one of them that I'm reading now on that note, um, Kyle, is the simplest, most elegant kind of discovery and scientific theory 
that we have that is so fundamental, it's intrinsic to everything. Of course, you have a lot of Darwin and evolution in there. You uh, have really good theories, but I would just recommend for anyone interested in that topic to check it out. All right, I'm going to jump in real quick and say goodbye. I've got to run to get to something. But um, thank you guys so much, and best of luck with all the fundraising. We'll support you guys in however way we can. Thank you. Thank I'm now following you guys you. on Tumblr, so yay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Yay. All right, we're, we're really, really glad that you would fight the Wi-Fi for us. We deeply appreciate <laughs> it. I'm sorry. Next time it'll be better. All right, take care. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> so we're currently up to 6766 in donations as a reminder in the last hour the um, crazy notion because apparently I will do anything for the internet um, was put forward that if we hit fifty thousand dollars by the end of the weekend so fifty thousand dollars by 10 p.m. oh god <laughs> um, thank you who you Hugo Burnham for photoshopping. We'll we will share this in a moment. If we hit $50,000 by 10 p.m. Central tomorrow, 8 p.m. Pacific, I'm going to dye my hair blonde until Memorial Day weekend. You know that girl? <laughs> She's right there. Oh, there she is. <laughs> right there. So, so Squirrels. If, if we hit $50,000, my beloved hair that for the first time since I moved to Edwardsville, Illinois, looks the way I wanted it to look because I actually went to my old hairdresser in Boston. I'm going to dye it blonde for you because You look kind of like Daenerys Targaryen. In that that is show. rather terrifying. Yeah, we're going to all need sure that? Dragon Egg. Can we please see the Photoshop image? Nicole, screen, yeah, screen share that. I'm, I'm actually considering writing a check for the difference of whatever you guys don't have. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll send. We'll 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 get it. Hold on. So so we will display this in a moment. So Phil, what's the craziest thing you've ever done for science? Um, I stuck some paraffin in front of a particle beam. To, <laughs> you know, you know, you don't know. You don't know how many things they stuck in front of that particle beam first. That could have been like the four thousandth thing. It I could know, have been, but still. You know, a, a swarm of honeybees, a vole, some belly button lint. And eventually they're like, well, we've got this candle. Let's try that and see if that worked. Um, <laughs> what's, the, what's the weirdest thing I've ever done for science? Yeah, yes. Uh, besides, you know, dedicate my life to it? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I know you have not rappelled down the side of a large telescope. That kicked that with you. You have a chat message from Flex Monkey Patches. <laughs> <laughs> you have oh a my chat God. message from Phoenix Torres. Okay, okay. Maybe let's call for every time that happened. Sorry, we, um, we had a moment of Skype fail. In the 70s, so pre-Phil's time, we did have some grad students who rappelled down the side of a uh, four-story telescope. Building. What, the uh, the 40-inch observatory at, uh, at Fan Mountain, Mountion, in Virginia? It's evidence. I sexed um, a bee once. <laughs> you you, you sexed a bee? Yes. Oh, um... Sexed. So, I think he sexed. Yeah, yeah, I, I sexed, um... There's this, there's this cool show that I work on in Al Jazeera America. It's called Techno, and it's a new network, but it's just a bunch of scientists and science writers and communicators, and all we do is we go around the country interviewing scientists and inventors and engineers about their work, and that's all it is. It's a great show. Um, uh, six out of the nine people on it are women, and it's fantastic. I, I recommend it. Um, but I, I went to this bee farm where they're artificially inseminating queen bees to help promote genetic diversity to try to get around this colony collapse disorder uh, phenomenon. And what you do is you take a male drone, which uh, you'd be happy to know don't, can't sting. Male bees don't sting. Male honeybees. Um, so you can grab it in, in between your fingers and then at the thorax, right by its butt, you grab it and then you roll your thumb up and what it has is an endophallus, which is saying inside penis. And when you squeeze closer to the end, it, it erupts like a flower out the back of the thing. And then there's a tiny little droplet of sperm, which you take with a microscopic, um, <laughs> not microscopic, but a very small uh, pipette. You suck it up. You do that with about 20 male honeybees. And then you take clasps and open up the opening on a, on a queen bee 
and you insert that sperm in, in her. But um, if you do it wrong, um, when, you, when you sex a male honeybee, you squeeze it a little bit too hard, and all of that stuff gets in your uh, face mouth region. So oh we appreciate the hole and how happy she is while you're explaining this. <laughs> yeah, I had a I had a male bee ejaculate on my face by accident. I, last, last week I I was at the um, Olimat Film Festival in the Czech Republic, and we watched this whole collection of different science documentaries. And I I was on the international film jury, which meant I was required to watch all of these documentaries because. I agreed to be on the jury. Now, I agreed to be on the jury before I realized one of the films was entirely about urine hmm. and included far too many infrared videos of people peeing. <laughs> I never see an infrared video of a penis peeing again. I will be happy. There's certain things I didn't read in my head. This fascinates me. And uh, one of the, at uh, Convergence uh, last year, there was a panel specifically on penises in the animal kingdom. And that stuff just amazes Karen me. Karen Bondar. Karen Bondar, it, go look does, at yeah. everything she's done. But so one of the other movies that we had to watch was on honeybees and um, the problems with hive collapse and everything else. And it, it was the movie that ended up winning. And, and I watched it twice because we were having a very detailed conversation. And I have to admit, I, watch, I walked away from my first viewing of this movie never wanting to eat honey again because the video included lots of close-ups of honey being created. Yeah. I'm a physical scientist. She can't handle this stuff. I think it's fascinating. I, I can give injections. I can do basic uh, vet tech work because I've, I've helped at humane societies and barns and stuff. But when it comes to watching the creation of honey and apparently the production of urine in infrared, <laughs> I'm very jealous of Kyle, personally. Well, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Awesome thing to do. And yeah. Pamela, the honeybee documentary one? Yes. Oh, because I would have thought the urine documentary would have been number one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Waiting on that one. It was better than my masturbation joke, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> the whole addict just lost it. <laughs> this, is, this isn't being recorded, right? Oh. So, so, so Christina, what's your famous, favorite moment of science? Blah. Um, I mean, I guess the craziest, maybe not... I don't know if it's crazy, but um, I've definitely taken a lot more risks than were necessary scuba diving um, for, you know, science and stuff. When I was in Australia, uh, night dives with one shared tank for three people holding their breath, uh, you know, going down over 50 meters, things like that, but nothing too crazy and exciting. I'm excited about Sunday because uh, Kyle and I will actually be eating bugs. A friend of ours who's an entomologist is cooking a variety of different bugs for us, um, yeah. including pan uh, cricket pancakes, or was it grasshopper pancakes? Uh, there's cricket flour, mm -hmm. and then I think there also be some sort of covered grasshopper, which uh, uh, you can note, you can also use their legs to pick the pieces of their legs out of your teeth. <laughs> that is so meta. <laughs> you do not like that at all, do you, Pamela? I can see her face. <laughs> That's very well. Yeah, no. we have a friend, uh, Bug Girl, who also cooks with me and bakes with bugs. So, so, so to change topics, I'm going to showcase the video of if we hit, not video, the image of if we hit fifty thousand dollars, I have pledged to dye my hair blonde for the month of May. I will do this for science, <laughs> and and Hugo. Did this? Ah! <laughs> kind of green. I'm telling you, mother of dragons, right here. <laughs> I, I. Oh gosh. Over the past decade, I've seen your hair every different color of the rainbow except blonde. So it's probably yeah. time. So I have never gone blonde. <laughs> I will, for the name of science. Throw it on Twitter. Um, okay, I will throw this on Twitter. I, I can do that. Okay, Nicole will throw it on Twitter. <laughs> uh, so I, in the name of science, should we hit $50,000 in donations by 8 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Central, 11 p.m. Eastern, uh, 4 a.m. London, 
on Monday. Um, should we, by the end of this hangout thon hit $50,000, I will dye my hair blonde. Hey, Pamela, Nicole, what is the craziest thing that you guys have done in the name of science? Oh, well, apparently dye her hair blonde. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> kind of kind of right. Okay, for now, what is the craziest thing you've done? Um, I would say, uh, oh, man, there are a lot of experiences in Greenback, West Virginia that would probably count as dumb things I've done. Oh, I got one. Uh, I was out in, so we, uh, I spent a lot of time in Greenback, West Virginia, which is a, a radio observatory, and we were building prototype antennas for the array I was working on. And we were looking at data around 2 a.m. and decided, realized, since this is the first time we were doing it, we put out these dipoles, and they go this, one goes this way, one goes this way. And some of them were 90 degrees off from each other, and we can tell that because we can see the signal of the galaxy rising differently in different antennas. Anyway, we figured this out at 2 o'clock in the morning and decided, Let's go fix it. So we drive out in these old busted 60s diesels out to the site where we have our things, and we go out complete pitch black. We're stumbling around in the weeds trying to find these antennas and rotate them. We have this dinky little flashlight. It's very hilarious. And, and at the time, I, I, I remember threatening Don and saying, you know, if, if I die, you have to deal with my mother, and she's from New York. The next day, the next morning, uh, some of the site workers said, hey, just so you know, you really don't want to go out. They didn't know what we had done the night before, and they said, oh, just so you know, be careful at night because there have been an, a, a large number of bears seen on site prowling around at night. And I look at Don. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to kill you. So running around in a dark field with bears is probably the stupidest thing I've ever done, um, and, along with stupid dangerous. But I uh, also rather enjoy climbing on radio telescopes in windy conditions or not always when you're supposed to be doing that <laughs> as well. So, so I have to say the craziest thing I've done is also the craziest, mostly because I have, as, as everyone on my staff knows, I have difficulties with physical reality. Um, specifically, I'll do things like forget to look both ways before crossing the street because of the anyway, internet. <laughs> looking down at her phone. Um, yeah, and, and my difficulties with physical reality tend to focus around being distracted by science. And when I was teaching physics, I was having a lot of trouble getting my students to understand how parallel and series circuits work. And so I realized that um, because of the differences in power output through a resistor that's in parallel versus a resistor that's in serial, um, I could cook hot dogs at different rates by putting them in circuits. <laughs> so I built, out of PVC pipe, wire, and nails, a, a frame that I could put two uh, hot dogs in series with a light bulb or in parallel with a light bulb. And the light bulb was there to remind me the electricity was turned on. Do not touch the hot dogs. And it was also there so that my students knew that there was electricity so they could yell at me when I went to grab the hot dogs. And I got hot dogs filled with cheese because then, of course, the cheese would explode out at different rates depending on if the hot dogs were in series or in parallel. And there was more than one instance where my students had to yell at me before I electrocuted myself in the name of science. See, I electrocuted myself on purpose because we had a, a bad ground loop. And so we were contesting the copper screen. And the way we tested it was it touched it. And if I went, ow, then it wasn't fixed yet. <laughs> it was I, I think a really uh, good thing to point out with these stories as well is that doing crazy things, doing fun, interesting things is kind of the bread and butter of most science when you, when you kind of just uh, jury rig something together that kind of works. My, one of my favorite examples is sending a ping pong ball uh, through a particle accelerator to clean it out. It's like, yeah, this is about the right size. This will work. Yeah, let's do that. Or, you know, uh, you read uh, David Quammen's book, Spillover, and he describes a scene where to learn about different viruses and um, bacteria, you have to go into India at 2 a.m. and climb up 50 feet of trees and set a net and grab these uh, bats that are the size of foxes and hold them down and take blood samples and all of these crazy, crazy things. The guys who have to dive into the water of, nu of nuclear reactors to check to see if everything's okay. The we do crazy things for science because science is crazy. It's fun. It's problem solving. It's it's not just sitting in a lab all the time. You, you get to experiment. It's a lot 
more dirty than I think a lot of people may assume it would be. It's not creating microchips in a suit. It's, you know, you know, maybe I think this ping pong ball will fit in this billion dollar machine. Let's just send that through there. Yeah, that's that's the really fun part of science too. That's where these stories come out of and we hear about them because it happens all the time. Like well, there's a self-selection effect going on here as well. Uh, you know, you, when you ask somebody, what's the craziest thing you've ever done, you're asking a living person what the craziest thing is they've ever done. <laughs> so the, the one person who said, well, I stuck my head in a vat of molten lead, you know, they're, they're not around anymore to tell you that story. So yeah. these stories are going to be interesting, but probably not fatal. That's my guess. And, and, and this brings up, I, I guess, we, we've all had accidents. I, I've been lucky. My, my science accident was mostly stupid and embarrassing. Um, when, when I worked at, at Harvard, we were moving around the magnet from a nuclear magnetic resonance machine, and it's a giant magnet, and, and as one might imagine at a university like Harvard, everything is locked behind keys and swipe cards, and we had some nuclear sources that we were using in some of our labs, so I had a lanyard with, because I wasn't very senior, I had a wad of keys instead of a single master key, so I had wad of keys on a lanyard, and I lean forward, pushing the giant magnet with a colleague, and my keys went straight into the magnet, and this was a magnet that was powerful enough that had a do not put your head inside the magnet warning on it, that I did not want to challenge, <laughs> and I got stuck, and this was why you have to have breakaway keys, <laughs> and so the person I was working with had to release the, the keys from the back of my neck so that I could stand up and then we could both yank the keys out of Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. That was my I, uh, moment of fail. <laughs> when, when I was, uh, I want to say it was second year at university, I was, um, not that it was an, it was an accident, but it was really just reckless behavior. We were, um, at the tide pools and we were just, you know, trying to uh, collect some nudibranchs and some stuff for samples for class and I didn't wear my booties. Um, I was like, oh, I don't need it, I'm fine, you know, there, it's a little slippery here so I'm just gonna go without it. And all of a sudden I slipped and my foot fell between the crevice of two rocks mm -hmm. and I felt something as if it you know, like stung me or, or bit me, and I pull out my ankle, and there's this glowing. Uh, sorry, I wanted to curse there. Um, there's this glowing ping pong sized ball of blue and yellow, and it was a uh, blue ringed octopus. Wow! And I, it and I threw it out, and I immediately had to. Thank God I was in a group, and it was a very controlled setting, and we were really close to the hospital. I went blind after what? you know what seemed like seconds to me. It was probably wow. closer to four minutes or five minutes. Um, the neurotoxins had me on like artificial respirators and stuff at the wow. hospital for, until it, you know, and, and they have no way of, or at least back then, I don't know if they do now, but they had no way of flushing out that toxin except just letting it go. Um, and There's letting no it, blue ringed octopus antivenom yet, yeah? Exactly, no antivenom. So. And uh, so that was probably the last time I, after that you wear those really ugly stinger suits in Australia every time you go in the water and you know the booties and the masks and the gloves and everything after that now I'm more of a security freak but uh, that was probably my most stupid reckless behavior fail. You win that scariest science yeah. <laughs> experience. I, I, you were hospitalized. I have a yeah. deep fear of, of the ocean because it is filled with things that want to kill you, many of which are transparent. <laughs> and all of them tend to go to Australia for some reason. Right, right. right. But jellyfish, they're kind of everywhere and there, there's two things I have a deep irrational amount of fear for. Scorpions and jellyfish. And It's not irrational. They're not, yeah, I was say, they're not that irrational. You didn't say I'm you know, afraid of ants and teddy bears. Okay, so the, so the, we... the second one is much worse than scorpions. I would I would say. Okay, so so you guys weren't around in the morning, and and we are about to have to transition to a new segment. But one of the things going on today is tiny intern, our awesome intern. Today is her prom, and she she was here volunteering in the morning, which means that she did all of her prom prep here, and and. <laughs> 
she just came up and she looks like a little tiny fairy tale princess, which is really funny because she rewrote the lyrics to one of the Frozen songs, which you're all going to get to experience tomorrow. And and if you can share the first couple of lines, oh my God, we want to get no food on you. Yeah. So yeah. come around to my chair. Okay. Just put it around that way. No, well, it's going to get eaten. <laughs> okay, so now we have the debut of Tiny Intern in her prom dress. Tiny Intern looks so awesome. Woo! <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I have to share that our programmer, Joe Moore, made all of the jewelry that she's wearing. Here, and then I don't think I can lift my leg high enough. No, to please don't. Anklet, but <laughs> 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 so, Nothing so, made out of duct tape? Huh? <laughs> Not out of duct tape, yeah. No. Nothing made out of duct tape? So, so, Tiny Intern is now going to go to prom, and she will be back tomorrow. And what was what is the Frozen song that you rewrote? Uh, I wrote, Do You Want to Build a Snowman? And it's, Do You Want to Watch a Hangout? And you're going <laughs> to email that to me before you leave. I will email it to you. I will. And, and she has a shockingly beautiful voice, and will be sharing that with us tomorrow, after oh, I'm done embarrassing her. Uh, Joe told you and you said yes. I don't listen to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not my supervisor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so you're a journalism art person. I've yeah. been asking these great people what got them interested in science. What got you interested in science? Um, I was, I've been interested. In, you know what the simple answer to that is? Stargate SG One got me into science. Oh. Um, because I started watching Stargate with my parents when I was five or six, Ooh. and um, Samantha Carter's character, Amanda Tapping has been like my life hero since I was five years old. I was like, she's awesome. She's she's a scientist and she's tough and she's smart and she's beautiful. And I want to be everything she is. And I ended up going and learning all of the science and throwing myself headlong into humanities at the same time. So I do all of it. <laughs> and and this is a sign that we need people in sticking my head in the corner. No, I'm not gonna do that. Um, <laughs> So, so we really need all kinds of people involved in doing science. We need the journalism, art people. We need uh, people who are professional communicators. It's all of us working together, partnering together, that allow us to advance science and communicate science. And I have to thank the group of you for coming in. You can go run away and get ready okay. for prom. I'm going to go finish setting up the little picture here right now. She has, like, the most... I, I'm, I'm having total shoe jealousy. Here. I will... <laughs> So I'm I'm being allowed to share the shoe. <laughs> this wow. is an awesome shoe. <laughs> oh man! I, I want to point out this comment uh, that has been flushed many many times in the Q and A out from Tom Nathy. Imagine a world where group scientific efforts are treated the same as team sporting events are yeah. now. Yeah. So so in our next segment, and you guys can hang out if you want, or you can go off and have One adventures. Thing, since we did, yes. we did uh, say we would do this in the, at the end of the last hour, but let's do it at the end of this hour and ask these guys first, what's your favorite good science moment from yes. sci-fi? Oh, I uh, tweeted that earlier when you guys mentioned it. Um, in 1998, there were two movies that came out. Uh, roughly at the same time, about impacts on Earth wiping out everybody. And one was Armageddon. Um, yeah, one of the worst movies ever made in the history of Everness. Um, and the other one was Deep Impact. What's that? Really fun to find drunk astronomers. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, like I, people ask me, was there anything accurate in Armageddon? And I say, well, it's about asteroids, and asteroids exist. Um, other than that, no. But the other movie was Deep Impact, about a comet impact. And um, although it had it, it, its, its share of mistakes, a, a handful, um, in one scene they go to the comet, and even though the comet's about five miles across, its gravity is too weak to land on and hold them there. So instead of landing on it using rockets, they actually sort of, sort of heave to, they come next to it and shoot uh, pitons into it and then winch themselves with cables onto the surface and anchor themselves that way. And I, they almost threw me out of the theater because I was like, woo, dancing around, and I was so happy because that's that's exactly what you would do if you were to visit a comet. And and that's what the sample return mission to one of the asteroids is going to be doing. Oh, is it? Okay. Uh, well, um, uh, uh, you mean um, Rosetta? 
Oh, sorry, you're right, not an asteroid, comet, the samplers. That's a, yeah, the lander, the, I'm not sure exactly how the lander is going to work, but on that case, you know, it's just going to land and stop. Yeah, and if they're you have people coming around and doing all that on a comet, the gravity is too weak to hold you. Yeah. So, so, yeah. That's mine. Um, yeah, we, have a, we had a commenter earlier who gave us their favorite moment, and now Evernote's going to like uh, Oh, from Adam Synergy, it's so difficult to pick a favorite sci-fi clip, uh, but I'm going to say Enterprise dropping out of warp over Titan in Star Trek 2009. That's one of his favorite scenes, science-y type scenes. Uh, I'm going to break the mold, and I'm going to go with uh, a video game. Um, the best video game that I've ever played in terms of its writing, its acting, um, its storytelling, is called The Last of Us, and it's a zombie game. Um, it's, it's just for the PlayStation. But what they did is, okay, we need a zombie that could take over the human race. What should we look at? You could go with anything. You could go with Supernatural if you wanted to, but that's not what they did. I, uh, I interviewed some of these guys, and what they actually did is they looked to nature. So there's a, there's a fungus that control, uh, mind controls ants. It infests their body. It makes them go to the underside of a leaf instead of doing what they would be doing, and then it sprouts out the back of their head and releases spores. We call it, you know, ant zombification. Um, but what they did is they took this fungus and extrapolated, what if this made a couple evolutionary jumps and instead infected humans? And they even used the, the proper name of the fungus. And this is what they used to base their entire video game on, and they said themselves, science was very important, and it dictated certain story elements of the game. It's, it, it dictated how the, how the enemies looked, how they moved. Um, it was a really great science win for a video game that sold millions and millions of copies, and it's a teaching moment, and I thought it was great. I'm going to go with... Uh... I was going to go with Jules Verne, uh, but now I'm, I, there's a book called The Swarm, and it was a, a wonderful book. Maybe 10 years ago it came out from a Swedish author. And the entire first half is so scientifically accurate. It's about the um, hydrothermal vents uh, in the deep ocean, and you know it has giant tube worms, and the science is great. It then turns into a big summer blockbuster with aliens and weird stuff. But the first half of the book, and it's like a 700-page book, um, is incredibly scientifically accurate, wonderful storytelling, and it's one of those very gripping uh, stories that you just get enthralled with and, and you want to follow and you learn so much from. And for that matter, anything by Scott Sigler to, to riff off of what Christina just said, because all of his horror novels are based on science, including and his effective trilogy, which is horrifying. And he'll Can be on I later. Have head out, but thank you so much, and this was a pleasure, and again, yes, count on us for any kind of support, and uh, we'll be staying tuned these two days to see the Hangout. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. This, this Bye. Bye, Christina. Follow Bye. Sirens on Twitter and all the social medias. S yeah, I love that name. R-E-N-S. I can spell. And, and I'm going to swap out my seat with Georgia Bracey yet again. And uh, she and two of our teachers are going to talk with Nicole about our Terra Luna curriculum. And uh, I'm that, heading out too. I, that's, yeah, that's probably a good uh, time for us to go. Thank you so much for uh, having me, and it was, it was awesome. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure. And just as a heads up, we are going to have to switch from this Hangout uh, to a new one, if you are on the CosmoQuest event page, I will swap out the YouTube there, and you just need to refresh your screen. Um, otherwise, you need to find part two. And while Georgia talks, I'm stealing the keyboard of my soup, and I'm going to sit on camera. Uh, this is not what this. What segment are we on? We're about to do Tara Luna. Okay. It's it's. Oh, I see 3:45. And yeah. oh, okay, I see what you mean. All yeah. right, and then we'll do the science of four. Yes. So we have. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> I'm just like, I can't right. make Bye, yeah. thanks. Bye, Bill. Hearts. See you guys tomorrow. See you. Bye. Comes oh. Georgia back. Wow. Hello. Back and there's more food. <laughs> yes, you guys have been feeding us well. Oh, lovely. Very lovely. well. So, oh, uh, who do we have on with us now? We have Vicki. Hi. Hey, there yeah. they are. Hey, Vicki. Good to Long see. time no see. No kidding. Hello. And with you is... Robin, my co-teacher. 
Hi, Robin. I haven't met Robin, but I yes. Yeah, so heard Robin and Vicky yeah. were with us last. So I uh, with us last summer for the Terra Luna workshop. Now, Terra Luna is a uh, unit that we we the general the big education team me you have the Ellen yeah, Costello Ellen Riley right two um, good teachers. It to uh, go along with the Moon Mapper Citizen Science Project on CosmoQuest, and it teaches uh, things about the, the moon's geology and uh, ties it in with Earth geology as well. It all ties in with the Next Generation Science Standards, the Project 2061 um, benchmarks, all of these different science standards that teachers need to hit, but can also bring citizen science into the classroom. So we did a week-long workshop last year, which you guys came to, which was awesome. Um, so, and I know you guys have been doing Terra Luna in the classroom this spring, so really recently. Yeah, um, we do a, a geology semester in the fall, and then we switch to astronomy in the spring for the spring semester, and so it's kind of a nice lead-in. And um, Robin takes the lead in the astronomy class, so I'm going to let her speak to this first, <laughs> and then I'll just butt in. <laughs> okay, so... Um, how long have we been working on it? About well, a couple of weeks. Um, maybe yeah. about three weeks so far. We're, mm -hmm. we're using this with high school students, and it's kind of set up for middle school. Um, one of the things I think would be nice is if we had that kind of middle school component where we had we're able time. to pull on the language arts teacher to help with some of the, the reading things while we were doing more of the activities. But the students really seem to be enjoying the activities. So there are more things coming up. We're getting ready to start uh, the volcanism, and uh, they'll be doing the lava layering activity. And so. the touchdown, the one with the little, got to drop the, the marble and hit the target. So they're going to really enjoy that. They like the lunar lander with the marshmallows. <laughs> but they're astronauts, and then they wanted to cannibalize and you yeah, know eat, eat the astronauts the too. And we said, you you know, the astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe talk a little bit more about that activity. Then explain um, what you guys, how you approach it with your kids, and what they do, and then why it's so much fun for them. Well, let, we gave them some background first. Um, we are using Discovery Ed for our, our platform now with uh, astronomy and our life science and geology too. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, um, we give them a little, gave them a little bit of background first and then went into the Cosmo Quest. And just we kind of started at the beginning with the pretest like you guys used with us last summer, and they're like, we don't know this stuff, and we said, that's okay. <laughs> because when you finish, you should know it. You know, that's why it's a pre-test and not a post-test. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I think there's such a good balance of, let's do this little activity and then find out more information about it. Um, they had to do some mapping of the moon, of the different craters, and where the Apollo missions landed and explored and the um, seas and uh, Maria and all that kind of stuff. So that's about as far as we've gotten. But we have um, one class that's really kind of big and then the other classes are a little smaller so it's a little bit easier to do the labs with them. The bigger classes it takes a little bit longer um, they don't like graphing and charting <laughs> things very well, and they're not crazy about writing the reflections, but they're really grooving on the hands-on. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I think the impact craters has been their favorite activity. They like the idea of, of dropping these objects and, you know, what are we going to get? And they took really good data, I think. Um, some of them struggled with measuring the rays that were formed. Um, but I think it turned out really well. This and they wanted to make hot chocolate out of it. <laughs> yeah, with the cocoa. Can we make hot chocolate now? No, it's dirty. <laughs> We've been dropping marbles in it. We don't know where those marbles have been. <laughs> That's exactly. right. Well, some of the kids brought the golf balls for us. And so, yeah, we really didn't know where that stuff had been. But <laughs> if you bring your own hot chocolate, that'll be different. <laughs> but, um, even with the lunar lander activity, 
we had gone on to the craters and we had kids still working on their design, reworking their designs and saying, look, I can stand up here and drop it from here and they stay in. And so that was kind of fun to see that, you know, it had engaged them to the point that they were willing to go back and revisit it and, and work on the design even though we'd already moved on from that particular activity. Yeah, didn't want to stop. Yeah. Again, that kind of reminds me of you guys in the workshop. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, this is great because we got to pass that on to you, and now you guys are passing it on to your students. That's, that's yeah, so cool. we, we told them, yeah, we were still working on ours when everybody else had gone in the other room yeah. for lunch, so <laughs> we understand what you're going through. <laughs> yeah, you guys are so hard to let it go. Um, We don't have the colored overlays to do. Um, remember the activity where we laid out the pieces of the moon, the pictures oh. of the moon? Um, so that's one we would like to do, but we've got to figure out how to find that the color. Her sections have that kind of cellophane. Right, the cellophane. Yeah, yeah. Look at wrapping paper sections in like the department stores. I'm sorry, I couldn't understand that. Look in the wrapping paper section of, of like oh, wrapping paper, paper section. Oh, okay, like for Easter yeah, baskets like and things. Yeah. Got it. Good idea. Thanks. Good idea. Mm -hmm. We think they would like that as well. You know, anytime they can get down on the floor and, and be real physical. And um, Robin's also found a lot of little video clips to kind of enhance what they were studying and things about the Apollo landings. And you know, there was only one person in the room that had been alive long enough to remember the uh, actual <laughs> first lunar landing. I think I was like <laughs> nine months old. So. <laughs> Well, I was wondering, yeah, how your kids are—they're making any connections at all with the the Apollo era and looking for those sites and things. We had them do a timeline also of oh, so lunar exploration. Yeah, they they could choose what parts to do because I mean we had one kid that it just went on forever. I forget how many events that they had added. There's a an, a website called Dipity, D-I-P-I-T-Y, where you can make timelines, okay. and so they, they use that, and you can add an image, and then it orders it for them, and it also will make it as a list, or it will make it like a flip book, which is oh. kind of cool. So you can just kind of click, 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 and the slides go by, and when you point to the slides, are the images, it shows whatever, um, explanation that they had added to it and they, most of them did pretty well on on that activity as well they they uh, saw that correlation between what we were doing and and uh, creating the timeline gave them a better sense of when this all took place instead of just in the olden days right <laughs> so so the disembodied voice that belongs to the hand on the floor. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> sorry, I was, I'm working to get the next hangout going. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out to everyone who's listening, we provide stipends for the teachers who come for teacher professional development. And um, I've been extraordinarily cagey about what stipends we're going to be providing for upcoming teacher workshops just because I've been waiting to find out how successful this hangout-a-thon is going to be. So when you help CosmoQuest by donating to this Hangout-a-thon, you allow us to reach more teachers just like these two, and we try and provide them with as much as we can in terms of resources, content, supplies, childcare during the Hangout-a-thon. Um, and if we hit $50,000 in donations by the end of tomorrow, my hair goes blonde. <laughs> <laughs> And then Vicki and Robin, you will be joining us for the investigate workshop right. as well. I know you guys both applied and were like, does that mean we're in? It's like, I can't imagine you not being here. As soon as that email came in from Georgia, we looked at each other and we're like, got to email it right yep. now. <laughs> <laughs> we want to do it. Oh. And then we're like, we don't want to tell anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are looking through the applications, so cool. but uh, yeah. we are uh, working yeah, on Yeah, we've that. already emailed those in. and. Um, but we're the only ones who teach astronomy in the high school. So um, I'm actually a special education teacher, and Robin's the content specialist, the science background. But um, we, we've worked together for a long time. 14 years we go back 
to when her room was next to my room in our old high school building. So we've got a really good working relationship and and you know coming to things like the Cosmo Quest just kind of uh, reinvigorates us. You know, we because we come back, you know, when when this is our second year doing the astronomy. Yeah, yeah, the second second year, year doing two. the astronomy. Mm -hmm. And last year um, we just really struggled because there wasn't enough that we could find that really um, got the kids engaged. And some of it was kind of over their head, the physics part of it and that kind of thing. But this year they seem to have a lot more fun with it due to that Cosmo Quest. So if we can yes. have more stuff next year. Well, <laughs> you guys are having fun, we can tell. So. I guess in a way is to kind of have our astronomy class be a lot of Cosmo Quest content. We cut off when we hit four o'clock. I'm putting the other one oh, on. Okay. Are we so, still live on this one? No. It says we're still live. We're not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>